Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. First up, we have uh, Jack to welcome us for the GP for Science Day, and we have an exciting agenda lined up after that. Thank you for coming. Uh, so uh, yeah, so my job is to generally welcome everybody here. Um, I'm really excited that we're actually able to do this in person. Um, I think the last uh, couple of these events that we did were, were virtual, and I think while uh, you know they, I think there was a lot of exciting like progress uh, presented. I think there's always a a different energy, I think, when you can do do these events in in person. Um, the, my first job today is actually, I think, to talk a little bit about some of the safety uh, uh, details um, regarding this building. Um, there are a couple things to note um, in the event of, hopefully not, but in the event of a fire. Um, there are uh, a few things to note. So um, the most pressing, I think I have a diagram here, is the evacuation route. So in particular, um, our closest evacuation route is probably straight out those doors, uh, but there are exits on either side of the building at the, at the ends of the hall. Um, you are in California, so the... Uh, the chance of an earthquake is non-trivial. <laughs> um, so if you're not from California, uh, the advice here is to, you know, duck, cover, hold on to something solid. I'm uh, just looking around the room and this is <laughs> maybe not the greatest, uh, the greatest setup for that. But um, I think in this room, I would kind of advise just like ducking and putting <laughs> your hands over your head. Um, and uh, once the shaking has stopped, kind of evacuate as we just described in terms of the, the, the fire. Um, and yeah, once again, these are the evacuation routes. In case you don't know, the restrooms are just down the, uh, just down the hall right here. So you just exit this door, go just slightly to the, to the, to the right as you're facing outward and you'll find the, the restrooms. Um, and again, you're in California, so we you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. So um, we have three different bins. Uh, the black is for just general waste, the blue is recycling, and the green is compost. So this is sort of relevant for, for lunchtime, and you can see the three bins outside as well. Okay, so I think that's it for the, for the safety moment. So um, I want to again welcome everybody and kind of set a little bit of the stage for what's going to be presented today. Um, and the first question is basically, what is GP for Science Day? So I think first and foremost, this is really like a celebration. I think I want to set kind of like a celebratory tone for the day because uh, what we're really about is, is celebrating the impact that GPUs have had and I think will continue to have on scientific computing and science discovery uh, in general. Um, and then beyond that, I think it's like a sharing of experiences and expertise from a diverse set of different domains um, and both computer scientists and domain scientists from industry and academia. And uh, it's not always true that you get like a, this group from different domains together in the same room. And I think that this is an opportunity to kind of learn from what everybody else is doing. And I think one of the things that excites me the most about nurse for science, uh, GPUs for Science Day is that this is really organized by nurse postdocs and early career staff. So these folks that you're seeing at the front here, Druva, Wele, and McCool, um, and their energy and the excitement that they kind of put into this is, I think, what makes GPU Science Day what it is. Um, the perspective that we kind of have at NERSC around GPUs is partly based on our roadmap here and this transition from what you might call traditional many uh, uh, like MPP, massively parallel uh, systems to exascale class systems over the course of a little over a decade where uh, Perlmutter is our first GPU accelerated system and you know, I think that as we continue towards Nurse 10, we're looking at exascale class uh, systems. And I think what we noted is that um, accelerators, GPUs in particular, 
um, really kind of change the game in terms of the capabilities that can be provided in these in these systems. Um, and this is true across the DOE at large, um, not just at NERSC where we've deployed this Perlmutter GPU system, but uh, recently both at uh, Argonne's ALCF and Oak Ridge's OLCF. Um, the Aurora and Frontier systems are powered by GPUs and reaching that exascale barrier through uh, GPU performance advantages. Um, and so the common challenge, I think, to everybody in this room is how do we enable this diverse community of scientific users and codes to run efficiently on advanced architectures like Perlmutter, Aurora, Frontier, and this next generation uh, that will be coming down the line. And while there are a lot of great opportunities, there are also some challenges. I think one of the challenges here is just the sheer scale of parallelism that's provided by GPUs. So here's a here's kind of a quick and dirty comparison between uh, the, our previous system at NERSC and our new uh, and our current system, Perlmutter, in terms of the parallelism that you have just on an individual node. Um, if you looked at those Haswell Intel, kind of classic Intel Xeon processors, you actually have quite a bit of parallelism still because you have 64 cores. Each one can support up to two hyper threads. And then each of those cores is, is uh, becoming more and more of a vector processor. Uh, so you end up with 2000 way uh, parallelism, even per node. But if you compare this to a GPU where you have sort of the equivalent of 100 at, you know, over 100 SMs, up to 64 warps per SM, and then 32 SIMT kind of threads per warp, you end up with essentially 100x more parallelism per, uh, per node or even per GPU than what you had on the previous system. So that's a big challenge um, when, uh, when, when moving over. Uh, but the potential payoffs can be, can be really, really big. Uh, so here's one example that was run at NERSC as well as some other um, systems at, uh, at Oak Ridge and uh, internal to NVIDIA, which is some of the largest ever, or I guess not some of, I think the largest ever uh, molecular dynamics simulation with sort of near ab initio quality fidelity is a 20 billion atom simulation using LAPS. Um, and uh, they were able to simulate these sort of shock compressions of carbon at extreme pressures and temperatures that are relevant in kind of astrophysics uh, domains. And this was uh, nominated for a Gordon Bell Prize back in 2021. Um, and it's just kind of one example of several of these kind of really large scale calculations that uh, we've been able to be a part of because of GPUs uh, here um, at, at NERSC. And in particular, uh, the 2022 winner is um, a code that uh, NERSC and ECP and uh, folks at the lab have collaborated on called WarpX that you're gonna hear a little bit about later from the developers themselves. And um, I wanted to close here with two, two things. So one is my own pro tip about how to get the most out of GPUs if you're a GPU user. And that is to attend hackathons. And you don't need to be um, you know, part of uh, one of the early science programs at, at a facility, or you don't even need to be part of like the Exascale Computing Project, for example, to take advantage of these. These are totally open and so, um, the, uh, the, the suggestion I have is in particular to look at this bullet two, these public GPU hackathons. You can go to gpuhackathons.org and you can sign up for these events all around the country, actually all around the world, and work with experts uh, um, from different facilities, from the vendors, um, on optimizing your, your application for, for GPU. So that was my own personal pro tip, and then I'll close with just some of the highlights from today. So I think uh, what you can expect from today is some of the updates on the design and deployment of the large scale HPC systems, uh, not just at NERSC, but at different facilities around the country. 
Uh, I think we're going to hear about, about a whole bunch of different exciting scientific uh, case studies using GPUs, and that goes to, to kind of the heart of the day, which is the celebration of what GPUs have enabled in, the, in science. Um, I think you'll also hear some programming techniques for productivity, performance, and portability uh, across GPU systems. Uh, I think you'll find a lot of tips and tricks, and I hope that, uh, you know, even if you're listening to a talk from a different science domain, uh, you may find some really interesting and valuable um, uh, kind of tips for your own applications. And then I think you'll hear about future directions with, uh, with GPUs for science that includes AI, new architectures, programming techniques, and, and more. So I think with that, I will close and I hope that uh, everybody's excited for the day as, as much as I am. <laughs> Jack, uh, is there any questions for Jack? Sneak up. <laughs>it's a, that's a good that's a good question um, so of course this one uh, <laughs> but I think I mean back to my tip I would definitely check out the GPU hackathons um, up until this point I think that a great resource has actually been the ECP annual meeting as well but I think that's done <laughs> um, and uh, the if you're if you're kind of new to the field I think another really good uh, Kind of overall training program would be at PESC. Uh, there's a there's a program that Argonne National Lab runs, and I forget exactly what the acronym stands for, but uh, do you know it? That's uh, <laughs> Argonne training program for extreme yeah, this, extreme okay. skill. Okay, great. Yes, I don't know if everybody could hear that. I th I, I could try to translate. Uh, Argonne training program. For extreme scale. scale computing. Okay, Argon training for extreme, ex extreme scale computing. Yeah, okay. Where, where's the P though? Program. <laughs> oh, program, okay. <laughs> um, so that, that's a really good one. That's like a two week program where you can kind of learn about everything with a pretty big emphasis on GPUs. Um, and uh, of course, there's like the SC, SC conference. In particular, I, I would emphasize the workshops and tutorials that are part of that program. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Anybody else have any? Yeah, for early career, I would certainly like I and Vile uh, attended the Argon training program just this year. So if you want to know more about it, come talk to us. And uh, I would certainly recommend, especially for early career folks. A question that Nurse 10, do you know how will they decide between CPU and GPU ratio? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think what we've done in the past was looked at the like fraction of our workload that we thought was GPU ready. And what we found for Perlmutter is that actually as we started working with co-teams and, you know, was collaborating with projects at other facilities and also through the Exascale Computing Project that more and more of the workload was moving towards GPUs. So we ended up with a slightly bigger GPU partition or fraction than we initially anticipated. And so I think we're gonna do a similar uh, process for, uh, for NERSC 10. Of course, we don't know what the architecture will look like exactly for NERSC 10 yet, but I think what we'll do is decide um, at, a, at a slightly, um, a kind of like a decision point date at, a, at exactly what fraction optimizes the performance. And that's probably a good segue, I think, into our next presentation, yes. um, which will be from uh, Hannah Ross and Debbie, two staff members at NURSE. We'll talk about Perlmutter and then what's coming, some of what's coming next for NURSE 10. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Uh, hello, 
everyone. Um, Debbie and I are going to be giving a quick overview of Palmata and um, NERSC 10 and just generally the NERSC facility. So this is a slide showing just the overall layout of the of the center. So we have Palmata, that's where the GPUs and CPU nodes are located. And then there's the Scratch, which has a very fast connection going to it. So that's where most people will run their simulations and write to. Um, we also have the, so the data trust and it's, uh, everything else is connected to the Ethernet and Ethernet um, IB fabric network. Um, and this is, so this is the home, home directory where everyone will store their, is supposed to store their codes, which is backed up, has a slightly slower write speed, so it's generally less efficient to run there. Um, and then the community file system is like the project directory where people will keep, have shared directories to keep all of their, um, their like, I don't know, like data sets or something they'll be running simulations from. And then this is the field tapes, which is really cool. I don't know how, if you go downstairs, it's got like, you know, the cabinets with tapes inside and a robot going back and forth. I tried to find a video, I couldn't. Um, which is where, like, long for long-term storage. So it takes a little longer to access it. So you can see it has a lower write speed, but it's got a lot, a lot, a lot of space. Now, if we look inside, um, inside the Palmatter itself, so these are photographs of the actual mm -hmm. nodes. Um, and I'll use the mouse. So this one here is uh, the GPU node. So there are over 2,000 of them. And if you look closely, you can see, like, on the, the little black, that so that each um, node has, like, two cores. So these little black bits here are the GPUs, and then this is the CPU part of the node. And on the other side, we have a photograph of the, um, of the CPU node. So there's just over 3,000 of them. And to Palmetto, I think Jack already mentioned, it's a, Palmetto was one of the first machines to have a, such a large GPU partition. And there's been a lot of success putting all of the, um, all of the codes onto GPU, but there's still a, a significant CPU section so that people can still run who have not managed to port the codes or the codes are inappropriate for GPUs in some way. Uh, one of the big things about Palmetto compared to its predecessors is that instead of using air, it uses liquid cooling. So liquid cooling makes enables it to be much, much more efficient than its, its predecessors. And also it allows it to, um, to take up like less space and it's much less quieter now. If you go down to look at the machines, it used to be super loud when Corey was down there because it had these big blowers blowing air through. So yeah, it's just generally a much better, better system. Um, and this other picture here is some of the Rosetta switches. Um, so this Slingshot network, so it was Slingshot 11, uh, Slingshot 10, and it's been upgraded to Slingshot 11 now, which took quite a lot of time, but the GPU bandwidth has been quadrupled. Now, um, some recent upgrades that have happened to the to NERSC have been that the, um, the, the network for going in and out of NERSC has been upgraded to 400 gigabyte, gigabytes per second. And this was important because it's expected that the amount of traffic coming in and out of the center is, in, is increasing. So this was done to in, in preparation for that. And the SPIN platform has recently been upgraded to Kubernetes from popular demand from the scientific community. And this has been, um, oh, has reached over um, 550 production services and is hopefully going to guide what will um, happen with NERSC 10. So now what, what do we do with all this amazing hard, hardware? So one of the big chunks of the work done at NERSC is simulations. So simulations, there have been simulations in all different types of er different areas of research. And this is one of the things I really love about computer science is it really just touches every area of science you can imagine. So these are just some examples of the work happening at NERSC. So everything from climate to astrophysics to material science to geology. Um, and now I'll go on to some more detailed, some, some highlight examples. So an example of some of the work done on Palmetto GPUs that's been very successful, I think it was mentioned in Jack's previous talk, was um, is WarpX, the work done with WarpX. So this is done, um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, is um, to, done to develop better radiotherapy treatments um, because we, to do that we, there needs to be a different type of particle accelerator and uh, WARPEX was uh, won, uh, won the 2022 Gordon Bell Award um, and NERSC contribution included porting to GPUs, asynchronous input and output and the communications performance and they're continuing to do great work 
on this code um, with load balancing and uh, building their own AM Extreme class. And this, this work has actually continued very recently in the NERSC GPU hackathon. Another example of great work done at NERSC is um, WMB app. And <laughs> so this is important because it's, um, they are trying to model fusion plasmas, which inside the ITER reactor. And as, as you all know, um, finding clean energy is one of the most important things for the, the human race at this point. And this would be an excellent solution. So um, they've managed to get some pretty huge speed ups and, when in, and done some good work with iterative sparse solvers. Another big chunk of the work done at NERSC is AI, and this is a growing field. So there's more and more. Um, it's becoming a larger and larger part of the applications. So again, there are, it touches many different areas of, um, of science. And so there's just some of the, a few images of the examples of work done at NERSC. And so one of, I'm just gonna highlight quickly the um, forecast net. So this is a earth emulator which has managed to um, predict the wind um, temperature, precipitation, and water vapor for 10 days at a 30 kilometer resolution, which is pretty amazing. And this has been done faster, 44,000 times faster than uh, conventional methods. And now we're gonna move on to talk about the third big chunk of the work that I've done with Debbie. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh... The sort of third um, aspects of work on Perlmutter that we want to highlight is work that's being done in the super facility model. So for those unfamiliar with this term, super facility is kind of the idea of connecting facilities. So connecting at a most simple level, an experiment facility with a networking facility with an HPC facility you can consider that a super facility, but uh, simply sort of making the physical connection isn't enough for, for productive science. So it also involves um, creating the right uh, software frameworks, the right technologies, the right tools, the right policies to make it all work together. And so we've been working um, on the super facility concept in Berkeley Lab for something like seven, eight years now. Um, and we've really now, uh, with Palmata, found ourselves in a situation where many experiment science teams can use Palmata for uh, real-time data analysis in a way that just wasn't possible before. So, uh, we work very closely with um, specific science teams uh, to develop the super facility model. We had eight science teams that we were working with closely ranging from fusion science. You just heard about some of the simulation work done in fusion science. We also work with experimental scientists who are trying to understand how to best use NERSC for data analysis in, in combination with simulations. We also work with uh, light sources, with uh, the Joint Genome Institute, um, with some astronomy and dark matter direct detection experiments. So one of the things we really wanted to do with the super facility work was make sure we were drawing use cases from a broad range of different experiments because they will challenge us and the infrastructure we build in slightly different ways. So some of the technology and the services that we developed as part of the super facility work that have been deployed on Palmata include uh, Jupyter notebooks. I'm pretty sure a lot of people in this room use Jupyter notebooks every day for their analysis. This is now a very popular tool at NERSC. Uh, we offer real-time computing capabilities for the teams that need it. Um, you already heard about some of the updates um, being made to SPIN in response to the needs largely from this community. Um, we've uh, developed new tools around software-defined networking, data movement, including Globus upgrades. Uh, we've developed an API interface to almost all functionality at NERSC, and this is really a pioneering work. It's one of the first fully featured API interfaces to an HPC center in the world, and it's something that we've, we've, we're very excited about the possibilities for that for the future. And um, we've also been deploying uh, federated identity solutions to make it easier for users to handle access and authorization control across multiple sites. So one of the things that is um, that I've been really happy to see about the, 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 the outcomes of the super facility work is that we designed these capabilities to support a specific user community, but they are broadly adopted now at NERSC. This has had um, an, an impact much more, much more widely than the eight teams that we initially started working with, which was our intention. So we recognize that um, 
a lot of these kinds of ways of interactive use of uh, supercomputers, automated use of supercomputers, this is something that uh, the field is heading towards in general in the future. And I'll come back to that in a minute when I talk about Nurse 10. So just a couple of examples uh, of science teams that are using, using Palmetter. The LINAC coherent light source uh, is an X-ray light source um, over the bay. Uh, it's the Slack National Accelerator Lab. And they've been using NERSC for a number of years now uh, in a real-time collaborative data analysis. So they have uh, they are a facility and they have users come uh, for a shift, a uh, very valuable data taking time at LCLS. Uh, they take data from a very high data rate instrument. That data is transferred to NERSC uh, where um, analysis jobs are launched uh, and we have a, they've developed an API based application that's running on spin and it monitors all the data movement in the compute uh, in an automated way without a user in the loop. So the scientist, the user of the facility, who is a material scientist, perhaps not a computing scientist, they get to uh, have the advantage of HPC scale data analysis without having to be expert in HPC. And so they're able to get uh, large scale data analysis um, within a few minutes of the data being taken. This is a lot of work being done by the XFL team, um, both at Berkeley Lab and at Slack. Now, another science team who is working in a very similar model, but for very diff different science cases, is the National Center for Electron Microscopy, NSEM. This is part of the molecular foundry here uh, at Berkeley Lab. And they have very high data rates, uh, microscopy experiments that they run. And again, they're a national user facility. And so they have um, what is a very different science case, but which looks from an infrastructure perspective, very similar to LCLS. And that's a pattern that we've seen for a lot of the science teams that we work with. They have an app running on spin using API control to uh, uh, monitor the data movement, the compute and offer the end user at the, the microscope site interactive data manipulation through Jupyter Notebooks. So again, they need a fast turnaround large scale data analysis, which they're able to do now on Palmet, and this is not something they're able to do before. So we've been thinking a lot about all the different ways that scientists are using Palmetter, all the different uh, use cases and the way that we see people's workflows evolving. Uh, as we think about what we are, need to do for our next system, the NURSE 10 system. Uh, so you'll notice that 2026 um, feels like it's very far away, but it's, it's really coming up soon. So we've, been, we've spent the last two years um, sort of developing the requirements, understanding the vendor landscape and the technology landscape uh, to design our next system. Uh, and a lot of the work that we've done um, from deploying and supporting Palmetto is fed into our requirements and our plans for Nurse 10. So I just want to talk a little bit about that, give you a sort of hint of where we're heading with this. And one of the main points uh, is that we recognize that our workload is evolving. So we've been talking today, this morning, about uh, simulation apps, about uh, AI work, about work analyzing experiment data. These uh, perhaps in the past used to be quite separate. You know, you do some AI training or you'd run a simulation, it'd be standalone. But we recognize that that is uh, no longer the case. Uh, we have a lot of simulations that have AI components. We have a lot of experimental data analysis workflows that have components of AI in there. We're starting to see also demand for workflows that combine all three elements. So uh, data analysis with simulation, with AI training and inference all at the same time. We want to uh, think about that and the implications for how we design a system for the future. And so that fed into our uh, mission need statement for Nurse 10, which we actually uh, got two years ago now. Uh, the aim of the, the purpose of N10 will be to accelerate end-to-end -end DOE workflows uh, and enable new modes of scientific discovery through the integration of experiment data analysis and simulation. Of course, AI is part of that. So this is very much top of mind when we're thinking about how we're going to architect N10. Now, back in April, we released our first draft of the technical requirements. Um, if you just Google NERSC RFP, you'll find this. Um, the latest draft came out uh, uh, last month. Uh, and this kind of gives the vendors the, the um, heads up of what we're looking for uh, in the next system. So if you want any, if you want to go into this in detail, you're, you're welcome to. A couple key points, uh, we are anticipating a combination of CPU and GPU nodes, uh, 
uh, we don't see the technology sort of evolving in, in any more productive direction for us in the nurse 10 timeframe. So all the work that people are doing on Perlmutter to optimize your codes for the CPU and GPU nodes on Perlmutter should be an easy transition to nurse 10 is what we are anticipating. Uh, we also, we are a missions supercomputing center. We do not uh, give a peak flops requirement in our RFP. Instead, what we're looking for, rather than saying we want to build an exascale system, we're looking for a 10x improvement on our benchmarks, which are workflow component benchmarks, a 10x improvement compared to Perlmutter. Uh, and so that's a slightly different way of emphasizing what we're looking for from the system, which is scientific productivity, rather than simply having uh, the capability to run very large simulations. Although we expect to be able to do that as well, but we, there's a broader church that we're, um, we're trying to accommodate now. Uh, if you want to go into some more details, you can look in the requirements document about the kinds of storage uh, that we're, we're looking for. Um, we have a lot of requirements for the full workflow programming environment, and that involves API interfaces. Um, you know, we're asking for things from the vendors that we haven't asked for before in recognition that automated workflows and complex workflows are very much uh, what our users are trying to run on our systems. And of course, uh, we have been thinking very carefully about how we manage the system. So from the nurse perspective, what are the system level software and management requirements that can again support, um, support all this? Um, we anticipate having a NESAP program for Nurse 10 as well. A lot of people here have been involved in the Nurse 9 NESAP program. Um, NESAP, for those unfamiliar with it, is a collaboration between NERSC, our science teams and technology vendors to prepare scientific workflows for the system for our new systems at, uh, here. So it involves co-design, early access, and very collaborative code development, analysis, and optimization. Um, NERSC was very, uh, NESAP was very impactful for Perlmutter. You can kind of uh, glance over the, the speed ups today as is compared to the uh, ba baseline um, uh, on, on Edison. You can see that the speed ups are really huge. And a lot of that sort of comes from the technology uh, in combination with the work that we've done collaboratively with uh, NERSC staff and our vendors in things like the hackathons to, to really get the, the codes um, up and running successfully on Perlmutter. And we anticipate continuing this for NERSC 10. Um, we had a, a short-term call for proposals last week, uh, but look out in about a year's time when we know a bit more about what our system is gonna look like, we'll be having a call for the full uh, N10 NESAP program coming up. Okay, and so there I'll conclude. Uh, Perlmutter is a hugely productive system for DOE science, as you've heard, and our experience with Perlmutter is really informing our plans for uh, how we want to architect the N10 system. All right, thank you. Thank you, Anna, for a nice overview of Perlmutter and then for the upcoming N10 system. Are there any questions from the audience? I know there's one online. So let me just read it out. For a Perlmutter allocation in the future, would you be able to consider GPU-based research projects that are in line with DOE objectives, but not necessarily supported by DOE agencies? I think that is, uh, can be a challenging uh, way. We do offer, um, so most of the time at NERSC is allocated by DOE program managers. I think something like 80% uh, of our time is goes through that way. But we do have director's discretionary uh, reserve uh, time that can be allocated depending on the, at the, at the discretion of the nurse director, basically. So if there is a compelling, uh, exciting science project that, uh, uh, you think could take advantage of Perlmutter, uh, you can apply for time through the DDR route and it will be evaluated. So maybe this is going too far, but is there current work or, or thoughts about connecting the super facilities into some more super facility? Gosh, uh, it's almost as if you know the kind of thing that I spend all my days working on. So the question was about whether we're thinking about extending the super facility model or perhaps to a super duper facility. Uh, and the, te the term for that is the integrated research infrastructure. It's a new initiative uh, within DOE that is very nascent, but we've been putting the groundwork in for that for the last uh, two or three years, kind of building requirements, connecting the um, computing uh, capabilities within the DOE complex in a way that's more coherent. 
um, that does is a little easier for scientists to use. And so, for example, API interfaces across multiple facilities is part of the work we're doing. So if you want to read more about that, then you can Google uh, integrated research infrastructure and you'll see a few documents and slide decks that kind of describe what that, that looks like. Thank you for that question. <laughs> We have time for one last question. I saw. There's one question. Here's one question. Can you explain? That's, yeah. That's. Do you have code ready to run on a computer, on a quantum computer? Oh, okay. So we do have uh, people at NERSC who are exploring quantum computing and where that's heading. We do not currently anticipate NERSC uh, buying quantum computer. Sure, yes, uh, uh, we don't see that as uh, in our immediate roadmap, um, but we do have users who are interested in, for example, running, um, you know, accessing quantum computers and running certainly simulations for quantum computers on on Palmer. so we have that use case already so it's very much something that we're keeping a close eye on uh, and we 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 want to uh, make sure that we understand all the use cases so if you've got a use case where you want to run something on a quantum computer get in touch we'd really like to understand what you're trying to do and maybe we can help you get there thank you speaker Move on to uh, from Palmer to Aurora, and we have Jay Hukwak from Argon. Hey, yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jay Hukwak. I'm working at performance engineering team from uh, AACF. Uh, I'm going to talk about the overview of Aurora system and some early success story from uh, with Aurora system. Okay, so before we move on, uh, let me talk about a little bit about the AACF. Uh, AACF is uh, one of the two research computing facility funded by DOE to provide large scale resource to scientific community. Uh, so researchers from around the world uh, can apply uh, time on our system uh, for their open science. So in addition to hardware, we also provide, uh, we also have a staff of HPC experts to work together with our users to get the best research. So over the last decade, uh, as Debbie mentioned, uh, uh, we, uh, we see a big shift uh, from the original workload. So originally we have, we provided, uh, we supported the simulation solving partial differential equations. But we see uh, a lot of new approach uh, required, uh, I mean, uh, needed. So there is, uh, for example, using a large data set or machine learning. So with Aurora, we aim to uh, provide large scale resource uh, to support these three types of the problem. Uh, ALCF have been in existence since uh, 2004. We have deployed a lot, uh, number of uh, systems. That is nearly top of top 500 list, including Intrafit, Mira, and Polaris. Uh, you'll notice a little bit gap between the Mira and Polaris. Uh, so KNL, uh, the theta is the Intel KNL CPU-based system, which, which was precursor to CPU-based uh, uh, the Aurora system that was to come after. But around that that time, uh, HPC landscape have uh, uh, get more complicated to promote some changes in the plan. So we uh, adapt uh, those uh, changes, and then we have Aurora system. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, based on the X GPU accelerator based system, uh, based on the Intel uh, the data center GPU, GPUs. So system-wide, uh, it has more than 10,000 compute nodes and more than 20,000 CPU and 60,000 GPUs. All resources are, uh, resources are connected through Swingshot 11 fabric. Uh, so, as a result, the system will have more than 2x flop in double precision peak performance. The memory size is around 20 petabytes, uh, split to HBM and DDR on CPU and GPU. And the peak memory injection band, a uh, peak network injection bandwidth is more than 2 petabytes per second, and the bisection bandwidth is around 0.7 uh, petabytes per second. And the primary uh, file system is a DAU system, uh, which capacity is around 230 petabyte uh, with 31 terabyte per second in reading and read, read and write um, bandwidth. 
So looking into the node, uh, the node is node has a fairly standard design of uh, six uh, Intel uh, data center GPUs. Uh, so each GPU has 128 uh, HPM memory, and the GPUs are connected through XE link in old-to-old fashion. And each node has two sockets of Intel uh, Geo CPU Max uh, processors. And each CPU has a sub CPU has a 64 gigabyte HPM memory and 512 gigabyte DDR memory. And they are connected to GPU through a PCIe Gen 5 link. And each node has eight uh, slingshot leaks, uh, and uh, that makes uh, uh, to move the data directly from and to the GPUs. Uh, Intel Sapphire Rapid Processor is the latest uh, generation of Intel Geom processor and is the first uh, to have uh, HPM memory to help to improve the performance of application, which is uh, memory uh, bound applications. And the big shift in the Aurora plan was the shift to uh, the uh, GPU accelerator system. Uh, I won't talk about too much about the, the details about Contabeco GPU. Instead, I bring some uh, slide technical presentation from Intel. Uh, so overall, Contabeco GPU has more than 100 billion transistors and 47 chiplets and five processors to provide uh, high performance of, uh, on the GPUs. So this is a brief uh, uh, the structure of the Contabeco GPU. So. The Vector GPU is uh, based on the XC core, which consists of eight vector engines and eight matrix engine with a 512 uh, kilobyte, uh, uh, the L1 cache that can be configured to uh, cache or SLM. And the 16 XC core is grouped to form the slice and the four slices connected uh, along with a large L2 data cache and uh, for HPM2E memory controller to form a, a stack, and we also call it tile. And one over multiple tile is grouped to form a socket of GPUs. Uh, HP Slingshot network is pretty popular at the moment. So Perlmutter, Polaris, and Frontier has a Slingshot Lab network. Uh, in Aurora, we have uh, 175 total groups uh, in, the, the, in the Dragonfly topology. 166 compute groups are connected to each other with two optical global link, and eight I.O. groups are connected to each other with uh, 24 uh, global link, so we provide more bandwidth, and we have one service group. And the uh, primary file system is Intel's uh, Deus file system. So all storage is NVMe, and the obtained PMAM is worked as the, the metadata uh, process. Uh, the capacity is again 230 petabyte, and uh, its uh, read and write uh, bandwidth is 31 terabyte. So in addition, we also have uh, the roster, traditional roster file system called Eagle and Grand system for Aurora. And this is the status of Aurora. So we have all the hardware on our machine room, and this is photo from our machine room. And uh, we are testing the system and uh, uh, we are stabilizing the system. So we still have several items to complete. So we have to complete the initial uh, bring up and stabilization. And also we have to get our system ready for passing all the acceptance tests and the running ESP early science pro program and the ECP program uh, applications at scale. And we need to make uh, uh, we need to put the system in production. But the good thing is uh, we could resolve a lot of the many uh, major risks. So for example, first of all, we have all the hardware on our machine room, which is great. And uh, we are looking at the uh, application performance on GPU, and those are also looks, uh, looks pretty good. So I have a couple of slides to share, some successful cases. And uh, also we see the software stack uh, have been uh, matured uh, in, in and reasonable pace, so so everything looks pretty good. Um, yeah, but as you know, uh, we have uh, several risks. Right? So the, one of the risk for our program is uh, also about Intel's stability to deliver GPU to us, high performance GPU to us, and the another is our ability to adapt our application to run on the, the GPU, right? But the 
good thing was, unfortunately, Intel, the GPU was not really new thing to Intel, since Intel have been shipping a lot of um, millions of GPUs uh, uh, through their integrated uh, with their CPUs. So on the right hand side, you can see uh, the Intel Tiger Lake CPU layout, and then you can see the red box, uh, which is just de de uh, dedicated to GPU part. So it, even in the Intel CPU, around 40, 30 to 40% 40 of area is used by GPUs, right? So at the beginning, uh, Intel has uh, leveraged and, and evolved their existing GPUs to a range of new product of GPU including uh, new integrated GPU and the gaming GPU and data center GPUs. So through this process, uh, we can uh, minimize the, uh, the, the risk. But still, uh, uh, there was no pre-existing discrete high-performance GPU from Intel at the beginning. So we uh, realized uh, this could be the challenge for software stack, software development, and also application. So. We needed to deploy a series of uh, the Aurora test bed. Uh, so in 2019, we started with the Intel Iris Integrated GPU, which is a low power, small GPU, but still very useful to identify what is the software issues and some bottlenecks. And 2020, uh, we had the Arcticus uh, system, which is the first generation of the Intel Discrete GPU, uh, which is uh, Intel XE HP GPUs. And early 2020, we had a Florencia system, which has the early version of the Pontapeco GPU. So each system has four uh, uh, early PVC card. And recently we had, uh, we got the Sunspot system, which is as exactly the same hardware as Aurora. And it, it actually is the two racks of Aurora system and we are using for the development. And then more recently uh, we have uh, Aurora system. So our internal users, uh, try to run the application at Aurora scale. Um, yeah. So, the, uh, with the uh, new hardware, uh, the another challenge is uh, it requires new software, right? So, Intel solution uh, is uh, one API, which is open standard, open standard, which is good, which is not, uh, this is not uh, proprietary. And it has uh, several components, for example, uh, SQL, uh, I mean, DPC plus compiler, or uh, some libraries like one MKL or one DAO, or some hardware abstraction layers, for example, level zero as the runtime layers. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, a very nice talk uh, from John Panico from Intel this afternoon. So he will talk about one API and UXL and the SQL open standard compiler. So I will quickly touch the items and we will get more details from John's talk later. So this is a uh, Aurora One API component. We have uh, traditional C, C++ Fortran compiler, Python, uh, MPI library, and all performance tools like v and Advisor, and the method libraries and framework libraries. And we know uh, the programming heterogeneous system is not really easy because the one of the challenge is we have a uh, very diverse uh, programming model, uh, which are not all portable across the system, right? So uh, we, want, we want to make uh, things easy so on Aurora. So we provide uh, several programming model, which is portable across the different system. So we provide uh, the, the DPC++ compiler for SQL, OpenMP compiler, and OpenCL compiler from one API. And we also support uh, Cocos and Raja. Uh, we unfortunately don't support uh, CUDA, which is proprietary, but the alternative CUDA is uh, HIP, which is originally developed for AMD GPU, but uh, we made an initial, uh, initial effort to make enable on our Intel GPU. So we have uh, a couple of early successes with application with uh, that case, and we could run some games application and CP2K application and libc library uh, on our Intel GPU using the HIP. We still, have, uh, we still have some features to implement, but uh, we could see some early success with that. Uh, SQL and DPC++ application. So SQL is a new way uh, to, for programming in heterogeneous system. And uh, it is a C++ way for uploading uh, application to GPU. And DPC++ is Intel's implementation of SQL with some usable extension. And again, uh, I believe John will give us more details later. 
OpenMP is uh, uh, also one of the important uh, portable, portable uh, models across the different systems. Uh, it is available with the C, C++, Fortran. So especially for Fortran, Fortran community, OpenMP could be a good solution to port uh, their application to GPU. And Intel has uh, planned for strong support for Fortran. Uh, Intel's new compiler uh, implements OpenMP offloading model for GPUs, and we see their features uh, are, are matured very quickly. So we expect uh, this uh, compiler uh, will be as robust as uh, Intel CPU compiler uh, in the near future. Okay. Now, uh, yeah, so we have worked with uh, many different teams uh, from uh, Argon Early Science Program and the DOE ECP uh, Exascale Computing Project. Uh, some project has multiple code in it, so uh, in total we are working with the team to enable around 44 application code uh, ready for Aurora system. And around uh, more than 60 Argon and Intel staff are working with uh, the teams. Uh, I mean, more than 100 outside collaborators at various uh, lab laboratory and university. Uh, this is pretty intensive work, and uh, we see, see uh, uh, pretty good uh, successful stories here. Uh, applications have gone through several steps to be ready for Aurora. For example, implementation of a science and algorithm and the porting to Aurora programming model, and testing on testbed, and tuning for performance, and then the scale across the system. So on the bottom, you see uh, two chart for the first two items. So in terms of the science implementation, you can see the steady increase over time from uh, Q1 21 to Q3 23. And at the moment, we can say around uh, 41 applications are done for the implementation and around four applications are still working in progress. For the porting to Aurora programming model, uh, you can also see steady uh, increase over time. And uh, this quarter, we can say more than 90% of application report uh, to be po fully ported to Aurora programming model, so which is pretty successful. And this chart shows an uh, uh, overview of uh, program, uh, application status. Uh, it's a simplified, without some complexity, but still good to see what's going on uh, in the big picture. So application with uh, dark green uh, color means uh, their performance is, is at least more than 80% uh, compared to A100 uh, GPU. And uh, medium green means around 20 to 80%, so they have some bug in the performance, they're working on it. And light green shows uh, less than 20% or they didn't provide the performance data yet. And the yellow means uh, partially, uh, application is partially working, and the orange means they are still working in progress to port the application. So I have uh, several good cases uh, on the Pontificate GPU. I will quickly move on. I don't have enough time, I think. So OpenMC is uh, uh, from ECP XSML project. It's written in C++ with OpenMP offloading model. Uh, so using this OpenMP offloading model, they tested uh, uh, some a, a case on Intel uh, PVC GPU, A100 GPU, and MI250X GPU. So in this application, it turned out the PVC performance uh, looks much better than the other uh, GPUs. And XDC is uh, another ESP code written in C++. And it, this application used uh, Cocos as the portability layers, and they tested the same uh, case across the different GPUs. And the single PVC performance is around uh, the 10% better than uh, uh, Frontier GPUs and around 40% uh, better than Polaris GPU. And HEC is a cosmology code with C++. C++. Uh, they have their own backend uh, with, uh, with CUDA for A100 and HIP for uh, AMD GPU and uh, SQL for uh, PVC GPU. So SQL part is around 20% better and, uh, than the, the uh, AMD GPU, and compared to A100 GPU, it's, it's much better uh, on PVC. And the NWKMEX is a general purpose electronic structure code written in C++, and they also have their own backend for different GPUs. And uh, PVC performance is pretty similar to mi 2 ppx performance, and compared to A100, uh, it is 40% uh, faster. Uh, than A100. And QMC PET is uh, 
the Monte Carlo code written in C++ with OpenMP offloading model. And uh, they compared uh, A100 and, and new, new generation of H100 around 20% uh, better performance you could get on the PBC, uh, PBC GPU. And last but not least, uh, MDMD is a molecular dynamics code. And uh, in this case, uh, they got pretty similar performance across on A A100, MI250X, and PVC GPU. So it's pretty good uh, stage now. So yeah, this is a quick overview of uh, application performance. And I think we have a time for a couple of questions. Uh, that is a question to Intel, I believe. But uh, we see, uh, I mean, we see some diversity in the GPU, uh, the architecture here, right? And then you also see some chance to get a better performance because of this diversity. So Intel traditionally has very strong vendor for CPU side, and also they also inherited some nice concept from CPU side, right? And we see the those concepts are uh, pretty um, uh, valuable. So. That's what I can say. And then again, John will talk about the, the model in this afternoon, so you can ask again the question. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious, the ProMonitor and Frontier have one CPU per node, and Aurora has two, kind of talking the trend. What's the motivation behind that? Two CPUs per node? So that's a good question. So the, at the initial stage, uh, I mean, the <laughs> The summit has a similar passion, right? Two CPU and uh, uh, the six GPUs, but the GPU connection is uh, slightly different because we have all two passion and summit has some somewhat different passion, right? So this is kind of a, a choice of the design, right? So if you have uh, more CPU and more GPU in a node, that means the single uh, super node has more capability to figure out. So depending on the application, you may want to have uh, bigger node, super node, which has more memory and more close connectivity between GPU and CPU, right? So, yeah, that's the choice in design, I think. <laughs> yep. Yeah, okay, so um, over the summer, after like everyone was knows that the, the octane was kind of dropped by Intel, and my understanding is that was, um, like a big financial motivation for them to support the Deos uh, infrastructure. And since Aurora loves Deos a lot, I was wondering uh, from you have any issues you whatsoever have the Intel developers been like pretty helpful in keeping things running smoothly? Yeah, so the over several years, so yeah, as you as you, as you said, Intel just dropped the obtain the process. But uh, we have uh, Pretty really good relation with the uh, Deus team, and and also the Deus uh, interface is open source uh, interface, so we still have chance to get uh, support from open uh, the the science domain. So, uh, but we need to see, right? But <laughs> there are no more questions. We can thank our speaker once again. Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Valentio Thio and I, I work at uh, Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility. It's a pleasure as always to be here at Desk, so I very much accept, uh, uh, appreciate the invitation. And I see these slides are already moving very quickly. So uh, I was just going to say, you know, a few words about Oak Ridge. We're sort of the biggest US uh, sort of DOE national laboratory. The, the origins of Oak Ridge are in the Manhattan Project and we're located in the uh, Knoxville metropolitan area, and uh, our, our basically our mission is to uh, um, provide world-leading computational performance and an advanced data infrastructure. Um, and we've had a variety of very very large systems in the past. Uh, I started uh, my kind of career in the U.S. on on the sort of Jaguar system and the Jaguar PF system, and since then, uh, of course, 
CF has had Titan and Summit, and of course now we have uh, Frontier. Just for I didn't know you know uh, what the audience was going to be, how what the mixture was going to be. So uh, I thought I'd just say roughly where where Oak Ridge is, and so you can you can kind of see on the map here uh, that uh, we're very near Knoxville, uh, and uh, this is our site uh, with a plot. And if you ever come to a user meeting, you have probably parked up here in the parking lot, and our machines live in here. So we have uh, we have Summit underneath here and Frontier over there. We see here a young uh, scientist who came to uh, bring your kids to work day, and he was very honest and described my job as very cool but a little bit boring. <laughs> so, so hopefully um, um, when he grows, he will he will be more excited. Okay, so let's say a few words about uh, uh, Frontier. Uh, so Frontier actually came to us uh, back in sort of latish 2022. So, uh, but we only ended up getting it into production, I think, around about this May, uh, for for uh, users outside of Oak Ridge. And so, as such, it made the top uh, 500 list back in November last year. And uh, it's it's been on the top of the 100 list, uh, to, sorry, the top 500 list ever since. But of course, uh, supercomputing is coming up in November. The new list will be coming out in November, so we're all anxious. Uh, and I just want to say a few things. You know, we always talk about computing and applications, but one of the, again, one of the more sort of interesting pieces of trivia I found out is the amount of site preparation that went into Frontier. And so, uh, what we've I found online that we had something like we provisioned the data center for something like 40 megawatts, although really we, we don't use that much. I think the HPL run reported says, you know, 22.7 megawatts. But what was very interesting is that they actually had to put in two and a half miles of cabling, uh, uh, which, in, you know, uh, you, you don't think of it, but they had to sink these power poles into the ground uh, on, on the way to, 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 the, to the lab. So just a few words you know the uh, sort of semi-obligatory node architecture diagram um, and uh, so the the one below is the schematic which you will see uh, if you come to our, our web pages and so the interesting feature is we have four amd gpus but each gpu is made up of essentially two gcds which are called uh, graphic compute dies um, and they are connected with this uh, infinity fabric uh, linkage the CPU itself has uh, 64 uh, processors, and they're, uh, they're grouped into uh, these uh, I think L3 groups uh, and, and slices. So uh, it's interesting, you know, each of the GCDs is connected to one of these concrete slices, and, uh, and it's not always a trivial mapping uh, when, you're, when you're using code. You can see that, uh, again, our, our blades are also liquid cooled, so on this blade you have something like two, two nodes. Uh, you can see, I guess, the four, these are the four GPUs, and then there's memory, the CPUs underneath this part of the board, and you have the, the slingshot mix coming out. We also have a burst buffer. If you need to dump data very quickly, there are just some high-speed NVMEs that are, that are attached to the node. And of course, uh, we have slingshot, and I think it seems like all the HP machines have, have the slingshot, so uh, that's where we are. Now, uh, one of the standing puns um, in Oak Ridge is that car is our vehicle for porting applications uh, to our, our current machine, but it stands for the Center for Accelerated Application Readiness. Um, and so one of the big jobs, and you've heard about NISAP, car is kind of like the NISAP program at Oak Ridge, uh, but also uh, this in, for, for this machine, we have had a lot of support from ECP, the Exascale Computing Project, and so this comes in various ways. One side is uh, through the application development teams, IREC, uh, and uh, the other way is uh, through what's called application integration. And the application integration liaisons, uh, basically, and the car liaisons, we, we work with the code teams. Uh, we can do anything from you know, really low level optimization uh, all the way up to high level structuring, but we also do a lot of, of bug hunting. And uh, if they have a problem and, you know, it looks like it might be a problem with a software stack or the system or anything like that, then uh, we can get in contact with our vendor teams. So one thing, I don't know if it's been mentioned, but all of these big machines 
uh, like at, at, at Argonne and at Oak Ridge, and I think here at NERSC as well, come with what's called a center of excellence, which is a, which is a, a, a group of, uh, of staff from, from the vendors. And so the CAR liaisons and the ECP liaisons are the primary ways for users to get in touch directly with the vendors, get advanced support. Uh, we also have these office hours that the members of the center of excellence kind of join in on. So you can schedule an office hour. I think it's it's Monday, sometimes Wednesday, uh, and uh, you can sign up in advance, and that will get ears of the vendor, eyes and ears of the vendors, both from HP and AMD, uh, onto your your problem. And then, of course, uh, so I have here some applications. Uh, some of them are from ECP. Uh, some of them are from CAR. And uh, the usual uh, gamut, you have seen a lot of these. You have seen Lattice QCD in previous talks. You have seen, of course, Warpex. Uh, and and uh, so this is just our, our, our way of working. So one thing that I have heard mentioned, and again, it's because I didn't know what level of audience to, uh, to expect. I wanted to say, you know, we've heard from Jack that these machines have a large degree of parallelism. And so uh, you can actually have lots of different kinds of parallelism that you can exploit. Uh, the, the easiest one, uh, which used to be called uh, trivial parallelism, but then I heard it renamed comfortable parallelism, <laughs> is, is when you have completely non-interacting uh, tasks and you can just run them separately. But then you can have parallelism that comes in at the algorithm level. You know, you can have independent calculations for each atom, say. Uh, and then you might need some communication. And the communications could be long range, nearest neighbor, and so on. Uh, then you can have parallelism, of course, at the code implementation level. And then the, there's specific parallelism forms on the hardware level. I think a good way to start thinking about it is to think in terms of patterns. So I have a couple of patterns here. You know, you have the sort of standard for all kind of data pa parallelism. You can have something that it has a several names, but it's a very similar thing. You can either call it uh, a gather because you're bringing things from other processes to you. You might call it a stencil if it's if it's that kind, or sometimes you can call it a convolution. And then the the other kind of parallel patterns are things like reductions and scans and and so on. And so I think a good way, in a sense, uh, to think about parallelism is to try and think in terms of, of the patterns. And then, uh, as Bronson Messer once said, the rest of it is mostly typing. Uh, and so uh, I guess that brings us on to how we program these machines. So you have already heard uh, today about, uh, about these, uh, these models. Uh, we have the vendor programming models. So AMD provides Rockham and HIP. Uh, and, and of course, there's uh, OpenMP, which is based on directives. And then we also have these third party uh, type uh, portability uh, models like Cocos, Raja. And, you know, we also even have Sickle. We have, a, we have a work going on with the Coldplay company, and they have produced a sort of version of Data Parallel C compiler for uh, Frontier as well. Um, just in case uh, people want to see bits of code, I have here a decoder ring, uh, which, uh, which kind of describes the sort of thing you might want to do, uh, like uh, you know, allocate memory of a device, copy from the host of the device, launch a kernel, and so on, and how you'd express it in, in a variety of these, uh, of these programming models. But you can basically uh, uh, do it all. And then it's kind of your choice of, what you feel you're comfortable with, what you feel will be the most stable, what you feel will be the most efficiently implemented on, on your platform. Okay, so then uh, I have a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, uh, these uh, case studies that you'll have seen uh, uh, in many places. So I think this, this particular one is from GE. Uh, they were uh, simulating a, a new kind of turbine. At one point, they had a whole host of essentially full frontier uh, runs. And uh, the results, I know this is their new kind of open engine concept. And then the results of this, I think, were presented at the Paris Air Show uh, in the summer. So this was a kind of a big, big splash uh, for us. Um, and then, uh, of course, we're also very interested in, in climate models. Uh, I got this slide again. I got all of these nice case study slides from, from Bronson. He's our director of science. So um, uh, this is a, a very nice uh, uh, movie of the Earth Systems model. Uh, 
uh, the E3SM application of a particular interest to locals might be the atmospheric rivers uh, making landfall in this area, which I think happened a couple of times recently in, in California. And of course, uh, you know, uh, we all love Warpex because it got the Gordon Bell Prize. So this is probably the third time you see uh, it, uh, IRX. Uh, and uh, this, this is, of course, uh, one of our, our biggest uh, simulations. Uh, I don't know that much more about it, so I just let the movie play out. Um, and let's see how we're doing for time. Uh, and another of our applications, the EQSIM project actually comes to us through, uh, through ECP. Uh, and I love this little animation if it eventually starts uh, working. Uh, yeah, there it goes. Uh, because I remember, uh, I think it was even before Perlmutter when, when, when Corey came, I saw talks about how the seismically isolated floor machine room here was tested on a shake table. And we saw these cool videos uh, of, 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 sort of the, the shake table. And this is kind of like a virtual uh, shake table right here uh, in, this, in this area. And then, of course, uh, there's a strong interest in nuclear reactors and, and energy. This is a, a slide from the XISMR project. Uh, I think these small modular reactors, uh, you know, they were historically developed in Oak Ridge. Um, and, and so uh, we have uh, ongoing work with this. And uh, the last one is something that's very close to my heart recently. It's not so much DOE sphere, but it's this idea of, uh, of using uh, computers uh, for uh, simulations of health. In this case, this is a blood flow simulation uh, software that we were looking at with colleagues from University College London called HemLB. Um, and the goal, sorry, there's a bit of echo there. Uh, the, ultimately, the, the goals were to, we're trying to get to a situation where we can imagine creating um, a digital twin of a, of a full human in 3D at a sufficiently high resolution to be able to do predictive science. And uh, we also have a, a, another project of, of this nature uh, at uh, Oak Ridge uh, from the group at Duke uh, uh, by the team of Amanda Randalls using their own different code. But this was very nice. We could get to, as you can see, a, a fairly high uh, number of, of nodes of I think something. I think we even did a full 8,000 node run. And so these kind of graphs, we call them, I always call them strong weak scaling graphs because uh, what you'll do is you will have a strong scaling graph and then it will flatten out when your problem gets too small. So then you go to a bigger problem and you can do it. All, that's a weak scaling part and you can do it all again and again and again. So, so this is uh, very, very exciting. I think this sort of simulation can have a major impact in, in health outcomes. So I'm nearly done. So uh, I know I'm at NERSC and I know you have your user base, but I'm contractually obligated to show this slide. Uh, <laughs> But uh, so please don't hate on me. Uh, but uh, the important point, and this is a point that also got mentioned in the last talk, um, our allocations come in a slightly different way from how NERSC gets their allocations. So I'm like 60% of our allocations comes from uh, the Insight projects. Uh, and these are projects that anyone can apply to worldwide. So, it, and the, the point of this is to do the kind of science that you can't do anywhere else. So if you need a whole frontier for a really long period of time, uh, then by all means, please come and apply. And anyone who succeeds in Insight will get both at Argonne and at Oak Ridge, I'm sure. Sorry, Argonne, I'm sure. Uh, will get someone like me or someone from the science engagement team as a kind of liaison for their project. And, uh, you know, uh, and so the other sort of 25 ish percent of our uh, of our cycles go to the, uh, the ALCC, the Oscar Leadership Computing Challenge program uh, that tends to be that's wholly in the gift of Oscar. And I think uh, they, they use a lot of the program manager input uh, in order to make their decisions, but you can also get significant resources uh, in, in that program as well. OK, so. Just uh, I wanted to just summarize. So Frontier has been in this early production phase since May 2023. Um, it's already running these very large scale high impact simulations in, in a diverse areas of science. You know, we're looking at fundamental physics. We're looking at chemistry and material science, engineering, uh, climate and human health. And so 
the, the main thing I wanted to emphasize is that the key to the success of this has been the application readiness programs, both through ECP and through CAR. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, I really want to think, you know, if you're, if you're new, you're starting out, I want you to think if you, well, I don't want is a strong word, I would suggest that you think in terms of your parallelism, in terms of patterns, and keep in your mind um, the ways you can implement those patterns in a way that is portable and performance portable. Because it's almost a certainty that within a few years, you'll have to go to a different architecture somewhere, either because of opportunity or because there'll be a new architecture here. And so uh, a lot of these very big codes, uh, they, they take a, a, a lot of investment. And I'm happy to take questions, but before I do that, I wanted to just mention uh, in answer to one of the previous questions online, that there is a quantum user facility, I think now at Oak Ridge, and that is a way if someone's interested in quantum computing that they could imagine uh, getting an allocation. I'm not deeply part of that, but because that question came up, I thought I'd mention it. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to happy to take questions. So I have to say, I'm not someone who's involved in, okay. in LIMPAC, uh, so I haven't run that, but uh, I mean, it, it's LIMPAC, one of the nice things about it is that it's a fairly well-defined benchmark, but I couldn't tell you offhand whether it combines CPUs and GPUs or whether it's just the GPUs or, or not. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> it's almost so much, it's much easier to run. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> so 99% of the plots are the I don't think they did the trouble. So Frontier, I think, is more or less a homogeneous system in the sense it has GPUs and CPUs, but uh, they're each node on the system is essentially identical with the same number of CPUs and GPUs. On on Perlmutter, I think what Eric is saying is like so we have a we have a separate CPU partition, CPU only partition, and then a CPU plus GPU. And our lin pack, Paul is the, the person sitting next to you is actually the person who runs it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I believe it's uh, just basically the GPU partition number. Is that correct, Paul? Essentially, we're just ignoring the CPU partition. For okay. And how people use it in, in practice, too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the other aspect is if, if you take the, you know, the compute power of the four GPUs and you compare it with the compute power of the one CPU, uh, you know, it, it's the majority of the fractions come from the G, the majority fraction comes from the GPUs. Yeah. Thank you. Right, Alex. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I also had a trend question about host device. Um, in particular, what I noticed for Frontier was that the evolution of memory on the host side is a bit different than other systems in the sense that it's currently one to one. But as an application developer, I usually saw host memory as a cache level that I can do in situ analysis or accumulate data for draining its lower to disk. And I was wondering if there's a reason for that, if that's a trend that we continue to see because I have to rethink my workflows. Yeah. Uh, so I, you know, other than the fact that these graphs kind of go up and to the right, I can't comment on the specific design choices made, but I do know that it can be helpful to be able to actually dump all of your GPU memory. You have one of the things, like you say, we all used to do various things. We used to either just ignore the host completely and use it as an IO device uh, and, a, and a kind of a kernel launch sequencer, uh, or we'd have to, uh, you know, we were faced with the opposite problem of there not being enough uh, memory on the GPU side, and we'd have to do all this kind of careful scheduling of how we move data from the host into the GPU and out to make room for the next one, overlap those communications and streams and so on. Um, I think it, it is nice to have a different issue to worry about, which is not really answering your question, but it's, it's more along the lines of, uh, it's, it's, it's good to know that uh, I won't have so much host memory 
that I'm going to run out of GPU memory in some sense. Uh, you can, uh, it, it's, in some sense, it can maybe make your life simpler. But I don't know if I would count on it necessarily going from the forward to the future. Uh, I think our, our, our colleagues who make the hardware, they're always trying to grow the amount of memory on, on both sides. And, uh, when it comes to configuring a system, I think a lot of it also has to do with cost. Uh, the, the memory cost fluctuates a lot. And that's what's basically triggering my question, because I mean, host memory is significantly cheaper than GPU memory. So I was wondering why not put a 2x in there, or 2.5x, but yeah. So my question is kind of a curiosity too, but I was I kind of interested by that last example you showed of like the biomedical digital twin. And my, my, my question out of curiosity is what do I have to do to kind of sign out? So, or like what, what do patients undergo in terms of like full body scans to like well, I think, create I, the data for that? I, I, I don't think you want to go there because the current patient we're looking at is dead. Uh, so the, I think the, 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 the current digital twin model is actually from, I think, a Korean lady who, who donated her body to science and they had some fairly high res, I think, CT scans done. Uh, and then, so the, you know, the, the, the process is, um, is to basically take CT scans and from CT scans try and extract the, the vasculature. And then once you have a vasculature, this particular model uh, is based on the lattice Boltzmann method. And so I think, you know, once these techniques become more advanced and, 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 and you have the relevant power, the idea could be that you would have this kind of digital twin and it would be a less terminal process to, to, to get one. Uh, yeah. More questions from the audience? All right. Okay, let's thank Valent and all the speakers. Uh, now have a break for 10 minutes. Uh, let's reconvene at 10.20.
Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today, uh, the next section will be about amplification track. Our first speaker is uh, Eric Drinker from uh, Livermore uh, Lab. Yeah. Great. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, today, I'm here as a representative of the DOE Exascale Computing Project, many members of which are in this room. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the lessons we've seen over the course of this project as they relate to GPUs and applications. So I want to start by setting some context of just showing essentially the, the roadmap that took us to Exascale in terms of the hardware architectures. We started out, with, in, we lived in a CPU only world for several decades, we quite liked it, we wrote all our codes to it, but it started to become clear that, that we weren't going to be able to live in that way, that world forever. Um, and it, that started back in 2012, um, and, but for a while, only the only GPUs we got were NVIDIA GPUs. So if a person was to write code for it, they would just write it in CUDA. That would be pretty simple. But as we looked forward to Exascale, it became clear that hardware diversity was going to continue, and it's probably going to continue after this. So we had to imagine how to adapt our application workloads, not just to a GPU, but to many different types of GPUs, and to, to deal with a lot more hardware uncertainty than we really had to deal with up until then. So. To deal with this, the DOE did something somewhat unprecedented, which was launch a massive software engineering project, the Exascale Computing Project. This is a $1.8 billion research and development effort. This does not include any hardware. This is all for software and development, which was the unprecedented part. Normally, we spend lots of money on hardware, and then just everyone has to figure out in their free time how to use it. It became clear that was not going to be a tractable, tractable model. So really, really nice sort of significant substantial effort for application teams and more importantly it was an integrated effort it was not just individual scientists trying to figure out how to, to make a path but quite a lot of underlying software support i'm going to talk about that in a minute as well as expertise from the hardware side and so people at places like NERSC at oak ridge at argon who could work with our application teams and our software teams to really make sure that what they were doing what was well aligned with the hardware itself all right, so from the application perspective, we chose a portfolio of 24 applications. Um, and I don't want you to read this whole slide. The idea here is to capture the diversity of workloads. It is not just molecular dynamics. It's not just fusion modeling. It ranges from climate from down to lattice quantum, quantum chromodynamics. Um, and the idea here is that even though, I mean, these are all very important applications for DOE, but more importantly for the broader community, you have enough different types of exemplars that hopefully if you're coming along with something that's not in this portfolio, you could look at those applications and how they got onto the Exascale machines and that would provide useful intel for you. Um, so really trying to, trying to have, cover a broad, broad diversity. <clears throat> we also had um, what we call software co-design projects. I'm not gonna speak to that, but that was a sort of, an, and actually there will be a talk later on the AMRX co-design center. So you'll, you'll hear more about that. But the overall portfolio um, started with quite a few separate codes. These are not new projects where they're writing everything from scratch, so you can just design it for the machine. In fact, these are established codes that were written for CPU machines. Many of them had already large user communities. They had capabilities that needed to be maintained. But most, the most important thing I want to call out here is the fact that these were MPI, or maybe MPI plus CPU OpenMP. They had to really reevaluate how these codes were going to run large parallel GPU machine. Um, and then one of the things I want to call out, because uh, Debbie called this out in the, in the Nurse 10 talk, which is we didn't just want to talk about how many flops you're going to use. That's no longer really a super useful metric. We wanted to talk about how you could do science at a scale that was a significant leap forward in either performance or capability. And so all of these applications were designed and measured against their ability to exercise the the codes at on a real science problem at scale at the at the end of the day. Okay, so here is sort of a one of the key things we've we've taken away from Exascale. From our experience, many of us have been doing this for a lot longer than than GPUs have been around, and the way that we would approach this twenty years ago is very different. So this is not just a porting exercise. This is not a a notion from the software side where they would just make libraries and, and toss them over the fence that we would then pick up and, and use and not really ever talk to them. And this is really not a do everything yourself so you don't have a lot of dependencies to deal with when you, when you work on new hardware. That used to be best practice. But quite oppositely, we really need to 
not just port our code, but really rethink our codes and really reimagine the best way to solve the problem we're trying to solve on this hardware. Um, we found that the app, the software and application integration had to be much more tightly designed. You couldn't just expect to look at the API or the library's web page and then just call functions and everything worked great. You really had to be kind of honestly talking to those teams to understand the best way to, to put those things together. And then honestly, we really are, are seeing the opposite of standalone, you know, work in isolation, but in fact, integration and, and working with others is really honestly not optional anymore. It's just the complexity is so high that to do things well, you really have to work in, in kind of large federations of, of activity. Okay, so this is sort of another picture of saying that, that um, as we stepped through the application uh, development process, it really was to find that science goal, reimagine the algorithms, do porting, but also integrate. Okay, so this is, uh, we've talked about this a bit already. S GPUs are just fundamentally different beasts than CPUs. Um, the things that they do well at, they do very well at, but they don't do well at everything. And so you have to really make sure that you're targeting your work in such a way that the GPU can do it well. Massive parallelism, minimal branching, um, try not to move. You, you, want to, you don't want to be constantly moving data, you want to you know, have minimal um, uh, ratios of your, of your flops to bytes. And of course, it, whenever you can use the specialized instructions of the hardware, you're gonna, you're gonna do well. So this is something that Belint called out that I really wanted to emphasize. Um, I didn't know he was gonna call it out, so he kind of stole my thunder, but um, <laughs> just kidding. But the idea is, it's really time to rethink. So a lot of codes are following best practices that were established back when hardware had a very different sort of sweet spot um, in terms of you didn't, I mean, when I started doing parallel, Thing, one of the real lessons was don't compute anything more times than you have to like break up all the work so that each one does a little bit of it and then move all the stuff around as you need because that's not that's not so bad now we're in the opposite FOPs are basically free I mean not really but kind of certainly compared to moving data around and so a lot of the the best practices baked into codes are not going to really apply anymore or they're not going to be optimal so there's a lot of opportunities now for innovation, but it really does take sort of re-examining things with, with fresh eyes. And we saw this throughout ECP. Um, people, you know, taking advantage of this fine-grained parallelism to really beef up their, um, their sort of localized physics models, you know, better sub-cycling, better sub-grid models, um, exploring different ways of solving things like sparse linear systems. Um, our Monte Carlo code that was already called out, um, found that the branching that was in their original code was kind of a disaster. And so they, they re-architected the entire thing so that they could parallelize it in a way that didn't cause this uh, red divergence. And so it's just one of these things that every application team needs to sort of step back and think through before they start the process of rewriting a code. Don't just dive in and start typing CUDA instructions. You'll do a lot better if you look at how it's going to be run through the hardware in different configurations and different input decks and then that you can maybe do it differently and, and talk to other people. I mean, see, see what sort of innovations other fields have had um, in moving to the GPU. So one of the questions, this has already come up, what programming model should I use? Um, and I've sort of put the four blocks that ECP tended to fall into. Um, the most obvious is the GPU-specific kernels. These are just basically taking your kernels and writing them in the native programming language of the, of the GPU, whether it's CUDA or Sickle. This is the easiest and most performant way. It's the least portable. So if you plan to only ever run on NVIDIA, you're going to be great. But then you get a bunch of time on at, at ALCF, and you're like, well, I can't even make use of it. That sucks. So people have been looking for portability, and loop pragma models is a very natural one people went to. It's, it feels very portable. I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. Um, C++ abstractions have gotten very popular, and that doesn't just mean Raja and Cocos, that also means people writing their own C++ abstractions, and there, we have good examples of that in this room. And within ECP, a co-design framework is kind of a hybrid model where a software team would design sort of the underlying foundations, you know, like adaptive mesh refinement that manage both execution and, and data motion and, and memory, but you had to build your on top of it very tightly coupled, very enmeshed. So it was not so much a library as a as sort of, you know, a symbiotic relationship. And so that was something that worked very well for, for certain applications. Oops, wrong one. All right, so I want to talk a bit more about OpenMP because 
It is, a, it is a very viable model for GPUs. We've seen great success with it in a couple applications already. What I think people need to go and eyes open is realizing that it is not the sort of thing that is easy to implement from either the vendor side or the application side and have it just run beautifully out of the box. And so the example I want to give is, is our QMC pack code. This is uh, Jack to Slip is uh, our L3 for this chemistry materials area. And so he's been watching this very closely. But this is a quantum Monte Carlo code, C++ that could have gone with code. They're like, we want to use this community standard open source, you know, or sorry, community standard uh, way of doing portability, this is how we're going for it. And so they signed a, they, they signed up kind of knowingly that this is going to be a little bit harder path, but they thought it was worthwhile. And so the graphs I'm showing here is their experience on NVIDIA. So this was the uh, Summit Supercomputer at OLCF. And the top right graph, each one of those sets is a different input problem size of atoms. So we have a 16 atom system, 32 uh, up, up by powers of two. Bottom graph is the same thing, um, and basically one is uh, what is what they see into. So actually, let's just focus on the top one. So each of those bars is a different version of the compiler and runtime. So when they started, all of this is relative to a CUDA code that they had as sort of a reference. They were over ten times slower than CUDA using OpenMP. That's very grim. A lot of people would just said, "Forget it. I'm done with OpenMP. I'm out." <laughs> but they worked with NVIDIA. They worked with OLCF. And they, they analyze what was going on. They sent that information back. They would update the runtime, improve things. And by the end, you can see the red bars, which is the sort of final state, they are as fast or faster than CUDA in many places. So it's, it's very possible. I mean, OpenMP can be a fantastic option, but you have to realize that you may have to live that experience depending on what, what you're doing and, and what system you're on. So it's just a caution that, you know, these things sound great if you just read the headline, but when you have to, when you dig deep, you have to realize there can be a lot more to it. And that's going to be true of almost anything involving GPUs. Just don't get discouraged if your results are terrible. Sometimes that's just the first step of a longer process. So. All right, so just to give us an overall sense, uh, like I said, we're sort of, as you know, this, this large portfolio of applications, no one just settled on a single, single approach. We're distributed across a variety of programming models. One thing we like to point out, though, is the trend we've seen is, is sort of damning, which is everyone who was in Fortran would rewrite their code did. Fortran is looking a little grim for the future for HPC. Intel is, I would say, our exception, that they are really supporting Fortran with some purpose. So we're hoping Aurora will be kind of the savior for a lot of these applications. But if you have a choice right now, don't write your code in Fortran. If you have a Fortran code, it might be time to jump ship. Um, Fortran people get really mad when I say that, but it's true. So, but that said, we've seen a lot of success with all the programming models described here. You know, it really is dependent on your application and your user community and, you know, what you, what you value in terms of how you want to maintain your code. And then the last thing I want to call out is the software. Um, a big, so I've been talking about the applications, a, an, an equally sized thrust of ECP was our software technology focus area, and it was chosen so that we could deliver something to the community outside of these exemplar applications, but something enduring, ideally. And so as ECP went through, not only were they trying to make capabilities, software capabilities that would be usable by our applications at Exascale, they were also trying to force those applications, those software communities to come together on common standards wherever possible. So common APIs, they have uh, software development kits that were designed essentially. So if you want to use a linear solver, you, want to, you don't have to decide from the get-go if it's going to be Hyper or Trilinos, and then you're sort of stuck with one or the other for the rest of your life. If you can standardize these, these APIs, it makes it much easier to try things out and honestly do direct head-to-head -head comparisons that improves both, both sides almost every time. Um, so yeah, so this has been also standardized using SPAC in the uh, E4S software stack. So this is sort of an, one of the enduring legacies of ECP. They are now scrambling with uh, the end of ECP coming. They have to figure out how to keep this going. They have you know, things in flight. There are new, these new sustainability efforts. But the thing to keep an eye on is this E4S software stack. I think that's going to be the, the, the way you can keep an eye on, on what's going on, because it is sort of the, uh, the, the, the benchmark banner headline of, uh, of these software um, packages, where they've taken a lot of different um, types of capability, 
bundled them together and made sure that they're all interoperable and that they work together. And that's one of the challenges of software. Is here. If you have to manage your dependencies yourself, you're going to quickly find, oh, I upgraded this library, and now these three don't work. So one of the things that the software teams really felt responsible for is trying to make sure that this stuff is usable, not just on a, on a product by product basis. All right, and um, Lent talked about it. I just wanted to give one more example. And there's going to be several other ECP application talks after this one. But this one I, I really love, and not just because it makes me really stressed that my house is going to fall down pretty soon. Um, <laughs> but it's this EQSIM project. So at the start, they had a really nice code. They've been doing this for a while. Um, and so it was not that they lacked an idea how to write a really good earthquake modeling code. The problem is it was written by physicists, and they wrote it as if you were going to take out the equations and put them into code. So it was a beautiful code. It was this fourth order finite difference code out of those deep nested loops, very clever, very, very elegantly constructed. And the performance was terrible because compilers could not figure out where to put anything resembling SIMD. And that's, you know, that's where CPUs are now is you, you don't get very good performance unless you can find a way to pull out vectors everywhere throughout the, the calculation. So they rewrote this thing in C++ using a C++ abstraction. They built in some of the new software technologies to compress data where they needed to. They, they put in new algorithmic improvements. And what they ultimately got on taking a baseline on full Cori, which was a 30 petaflop machine, and running on Frontier, which is a two exaflop machine, yep, you would expect a 50-ish performance increase if you just look at flops. They saw a 3,500x capability improvement. And it's not just because they're running so perfectly on Frontier, although they're running really well on Frontier, it's because they now have undone the inefficiencies they were seeing on the earlier CPUs by the fact that they couldn't get performance, as well as all this algorithmic you know, improvement and, and ways of doing less work where they need to. So it really shows that the thoughtfulness is not just about using faster hardware, it's also about using hardware better. And I think this is really one of our, our really exemplar applications of how to really make a, a major step forward through how you attack this, this problem. It really does allow them to do things they couldn't have done otherwise. All right, so just to close, um, it's an exciting and terrifying time to be doing computational science. Amazing performance is possible, but the gulf is growing between the people who do it well and the people who don't. So, and this is only gonna get worse as we continue down this path of hardware uncertainty. So I <laughs> encourage everyone to, to learn from the lessons of those of us who've gone, or those of them who've gone before. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways we can work together to, to mitigate some of this pain and, and do really great science. So thank you very much. Any questions, audience? One thing that really surprised me is when you were showing the distribution of Python over time for languages, that Python didn't grow at all, despite the fact that Data science, AI, Jupyter, all of this stuff. Is that just the project that we were looking, you were looking for? Did have Python initially, and so it wasn't real, or do you have a sense of why there's not been a transition to that? That's a really great question. It's, the question is about Python and why we saw such static change in our use of Python. It's entirely because the portfolio was established from sort of well existing DOE codes. And those sort of have already been sort of cooked in Fortran, C++, C. I would say that if you look at new codes, Fortran, uh, Python is exploding. Um, also, if you look at computational scientists coming out of grad school, try and find one and write, write you a line of Fortran without using ChatGPT. Um, it's, all, it's all Python and Julia. So as a community, we are definitely mm -hmm. shifting heavily toward Python. And honestly, the vendors that realize this and are supporting it, I would say, pretty well. But DOE is still kind of, we're, we're a little lagging in that, in that respect. We have a one question from online. Uh, a user asked which tools were used to solve the inefficiencies in the code. I think it's referring to the last slide. Yep. So in terms of like performance analysis tools, um, yeah, I would say there's a, there's a host. And, and honestly, just check out the ECP website for our performance analysis uh, portfolio. But HPC Toolkit, um, Livermore has a, has a suite of tools built on the Caliper library that have been very helpful in identifying where bottlenecks are and, and where performance could be improved. Um, but that is a hard problem that a lot of people are working on. Yeah, one, one last question. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so going off of this question, uh, you mentioned Julia. Yeah, I know it's really trendy and everyone's kind of like, ooh, this is so exciting. 
saying that C++ is a whole with Python, kind of, you know? No, I, I'm a huge fan of Julia. Um, honestly, my, I'd say the biggest challenge for HPC is there needs to be sort of a critical mass that prompts vendors to support it. Like you can have the most beautiful languages that just don't get picked up by vendors. And this is honestly, I mean, Fortran is not a beautiful language, but this is why Fortran is suffering. It's not because of anything wrong with Fortran. It's because the vendors have been shown reluctance to support it because they don't see as big a market for it. So if all the ML startups start using Julia, you'll be, you'll be in great shape. But if it becomes sort of a flash in the pan, then you'll be wishing you hadn't, hadn't used it. But as a, as a language, I think it's fantastic. So I support it. Is academia supporting you? Are, are undergraduates learning uh, GPU computing methods? Um, it's, it's really hit or miss. And honestly, that's kind of one of my new jobs at Livermore is to try and figure out how we can build our pipeline because we want to have a much broader pool of people contributing to our computational science and figure out where they are and what they're learning and what they're not learning is, is really a big deal for us. But I don't have the answer. Thanks, Eric. Yep, thank you. Our next speaker is Axel Huber from uh, Berkeley Lab. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you today about the projects and the results we have achieved over the last year in the Exascale Computing Project with the application Warp X in accelerator modeling. And some of the directions we are going to, someone asked already for Python, um, there will be Python in this talk. Um, so I'm presenting here uh, for the team, Blast team, it's, a, uh, it's the Beam Plasma Accelerator Simulation Toolkit team led by Jean-Luc Vey here at Berkeley Lab. In this talk, I want to go in two directions. First of all, I want to give you an overview about the exascale efforts we had, what was the goal, what was the research that we are going to study, and how we achieved this by implementing WebEx. And then as the second part, I want to speak a little bit about the uh, current topic that we're looking into is bridging and using exascale simulation data uh, to bridge time and length scales with data-driven models, uh, potentially with fast surrogates and integration with machine learning. So first of all, let me talk about modeling of party accelerators. We're here at Berkeley Lab, and Berkeley Lab was founded on the idea of building big team science. What you see here is the, already a cyclotron, there's already an iteration of the first invention of it by Lawrence. It, 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 at the first part, just fit in the palm of your hand. But pretty quickly, we realized that if you want to get to high energies and use them for applications, we really need to scale them up and go to team science. And that's the science I want to, want to work in, work with close to experiments, work with computational scientists, work with applied mathematicians to achieve these big goals. And that's the tradition that we see ourselves in. If you recently have seen the movies, there's of course the Oppenheimer movie as well. So all of these people are surprisingly close by at, this, at the time when this was started. Well, since this invention, actually party accelerators really took off in multiple fields of our daily life, uh, both in medicine, for example, for diagnostics and treatment, Industry actually has the largest parts of party accelerators. There are more than 20,000 industrial users from anything from semiconductor producting, production to welding to sterilization of food. Cargo scanning and national security is a big part. Um, and the stock by stewardship, we saw a presentation from Livermore just before. And the last part that you might associate directly with party accelerators is actually a smaller part, but a very important one, a very prominent one, which is discovery science. And specifically in high energy physics, but also in light sources. Um, this is very essential. Now, I want to give you a small example of a close by party accelerator that's two miles long. It's the LCLS2 accelerator at Stanford. And what's a really big part of this accelerator, why it's so long, is because you have to have an acceleration component in here that is the uh, yeah, superconducting accelerator. The accelerator elements, just to give you a size, it's roughly like a yard or something in diameter, depending <laughs> on the exact designs that you use for the accelerator. But they generally create an electric field and following Lorentz force, the electric field times how long you can be in this field is the energy that you would get out. The electric field in these accelerators is 20 megavolts per meter. And just by material limitations, you can scale this technology roughly to 100, 200 megavolts per meter before it just will shortcut, simply because the fields get too high and you pull electrons out of your walls and it will not be useful as an accelerator anymore. So one of the research questions that we tackle and that we tackled in in ECP and continue to address also with experiments at Berkeley Lab is can we shrink accelerators generally down with a revolutionary technology and in physics revolutionary means something that changes something by, an order, by orders of magnitude. And the technology we base this on is using lasers or accelerated power beams, but at some point 
intense high power lasers that are based on a technology that was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2018 to create super short, very intense, multiple mode of joules of energy in like 30 femtoseconds of time. And we use those specifically for the acceleration here of electrons at Berkeley Lab by focusing this down a capillary of gas and creating a plasma. And in this plasma, if you zoom into and go on a scale of tens of micrometers, you can create an accelerating field that is actually similar structure as what you saw on the previous slide, but goes up from 20 megavolts per meter to hundreds of thousands of megavolts per meter. Or if we go down the size, this clearly is harder to handle than something that's microscopic, and that's exactly the research challenge. Can we replace multiple of these stages in conventional accelerators with multiple of these stages of these very small, super intense accelerators? And that's what we're researching. For that, we wrote a code called WarpX. But let me go first into why we need a code for this modeling and why this is challenging. So, so far we saw how this looks and what an experimental setup would look like um, if you go to the accelerating element itself. But modeling these parts, we go into a technique is called particle and cell, and I'll show you the algorithm in the next slide. What makes it complicated here is that we have to track relativistic particles, so beams, plasmas, halos, and stray electrons, electromagnetic fields with relativistic effects, and structures of the accelerators themselves. For our modeling, we have these particles, fields, and then surface structures to represent them. And a the simulation can be, depending on what you have to resolve, somewhere from millions and hundreds of millions of particles for small simulations that can run on your laptop, to up to 10 to the 11, 12, 13 particles of a plasma simulation occupying all of Frontier. And the real challenge here, if you look at the whole picture for particle accelerator modeling, is, is that we have to bridge time and, and length scales or quite some structure from micrometers in the plasma structures to kilometers of a full accelerator. So we clearly need to develop models that can bridge this and that can do go hand in hand exchanges with each other. So for that, we need the best algorithms to conserve all the properties that we're physically interested, momentum, energy over long time steps, uh, many time steps, and the largest supercomputers to just have the resolution to be even to be able to model the whole system at once. Here are a couple of examples that about them. I mentioned the advanced accelerators. There's an important experiment at Berkeley Lab, and here are a couple of conventional accelerators that um, are central to these efforts. But let me go a little bit into the detail of the algorithm that we implemented in the WarpX code. WarpX is a GPU accelerated particle and cell code, and I mentioned already that we have particles and fields. In particular, it's a bit of a mix, the particle and cell method, between, you could say, FEM modeling, uh, uh, with an Eulerian grid of electromagnetic fields. But on top of that, also it's somewhere between Eulerian modeling and MD modeling by having these Lagrangian microparticle markers in between. And in order to make this scalable, our particles are not usually directly interacting with each other, but interact through this grid, this Eulerian grid with each other. And with that, if we do small time steps, specifically in this particle and cell loop that's explicit in time, we can actually model all relativistic effects of part uh, particles by going in small time steps through the fields, let the particles that are charged create currents again, which then change the fields and work, work back on them over time. So with that, you can, for example, have the effect that you have retardation effects in physics, where you have particles that create an effect and that actually can just travel with the speed of light at max, properly modeled with reasonable resource requirements. So this is exactly what we implement. Of course, there are variations of that depending on the problem, but this is the most common one that we use for plasma modeling uh, at its core and that we accelerated. What is the team? The team that, uh, uh, that, that worked on this is a mix really from computational physicists and applied mathematicians. In the second row, you see the MREX team where you will have a talk later on on the co-design center that we worked very closely with, collaborators a little more Slack. And by now also we attracted, since we developed in ECP openly in, uh, on GitHub, we attracted international contributors that use our code and contribute really essential physics components that we can also reuse for our science again. Another interesting part of this is since we model plasma physics, it's actually very, very general. So it goes further than accelerator physics. And so we have by now, for example, private, from the private sector companies that adopt and contribute to WarpX that use this for fusion devices and fusion startups, for example. Now, let me show you a little bit how we implement it on MREX. So we use the MREX library to implement for scalability and productivity. And the challenge that we really have if we go through the generations of computers that we just saw in the previous presentations is that we have now really to distribute our plasma problem with tens of thousands of computers. MREX provides us with the possibility to think like a physicist about an electric field and then just say distribute it and load balance it over these tens of thousands of computers. Inside each computer then we have to sub and over structure. So what we actually do, we over decompose our problems for load balancing and other things that we implement on MREX. 
Um, and then we have a performance portability layer in C++ that we reuse from MREX to express our physics. And then depending at compile time where we target to run on, we either have on CPUs an additional tiling layer that is executed or on GPUs use the typical CUDA-like stock structured execution model. This also, we think and hope, will keep us flexible for a potential future. For example, FPGA development was already teased in the last years and is part of one API descriptions. So we hope that this keeps us open to adopt to new technologies in the future mm -hmm. instead of rewriting for every architecture. Now, what I want to show you now is the scalability that we measured as of April and then the iteration in summer last year as we submitted a paper for Gordon Bell at Supercomputing 22. And what we did is we were started, of course, with benchmarks on the large supercomputers. And just to give an idea, the, uh, we started re going to as many top five machines as we could get our hands on. So we had a collaboration uh, that we specifically tuned for Fugaku, which was at the time the largest, or just before Frontier came on, it was the top one supercomputer um, implemented on ARM CPUs, a target we did not have in CPUs. And there's really millions of cores that you have to feed into. Of course, you know, um, uh, Frontier, which, has, uh, which we went up to 68,600 GPUs at a time, has a bit more, but that's how far uh, as we got. What we see here is the weak scaling where you try to be as close as possible to this efficiency on the 100%. And as we can see, this is actually pretty close to, so we don't lose efficiency as we increase resolution and increase problem size, which is exactly why we created these codes. Um, some of these numbers are though pre-acceptance numbers. So for example, slingshot configurations have changed a lot since then. So please uh, take them as pre-acceptance numbers from, from the time. At the same time, you can go instead of just relative performance, you can also look at the absolute performance. And what we do in ECP is we have this figure of merit, which calculates absolute performance for us in terms of updates on these cells and particles we have measured before. And what we can see is that we really got a huge update from rewriting our initial code warp, which was written in Fortran to warp X, which already gave us a boost by just rewriting completely once. And then additional software improvements, additional introduction of caching, of shared memory, and so on, over time then significantly improved us systematically more and more so that for a science problem we're really 500 times more useful now than we were before for the community. The concrete science case that we then studied with the scalability numbers used actually a couple of innovations. It did not only scale up to these large machines, but we also made use of mesh refinement, which is an experimental and new algorithm that we developed is quite unique to WarpX for electromagnetic particle cell to refine a very dense plasma region that you see here in brown in the middle, and then take particles and electrons from this surface plasma, which is very dense, and include it and accelerate this in this plasma structure. And what we could do with that is we first had to scale up with weak scaling to cover this whole system with enough resolution to actually model it. And then as we move out this laser post that goes to the top right, we could actually move out the refined plasma section and use the, uh, the strong scaling of our code to be faster in the total simulation. And also the science case we started, we saw also a video in an earlier talk about this. Now with these capabilities in exascale, I want to talk about uh, recent developments we added in parallel to the exascale effort in the last two years, uh, specifically supported uh, by an LDR. And that was a lot about Python. <laughs> Um, in particular, one of the things that we really liked from ECP was this focus on working together and making yourself also understood. So it means on the left-hand side, documentation was essential for us to transport our knowledge beyond papers. Now, the other part that we added and that we already knew from early implementations from Fortran that we covered with Python and Warp is that it's extremely productive for us to describe our codes and couple our codes together from scripting languages because you're very, very expressive and you can exchange a lot of things. So we go, for example, for a last simulation, I explained with a list of things that we want to travel our particle beam through. Now, this all has to be coupled together, and I will not show you the whole software stack, but we integrate severely against the SNT stack and ACP for I.O., for visualization, for math libraries, and all of this has to be developed together. And one last step that's really important to make ourselves useful for the community is to get this, quite, uh, this style software stuff quickly deployed. And so with that, we integrated, of course, with the ECP stack, but also for the desktop side, go to PIP, go to Conda, and make sure people can start at a small scale, because only then they will be interested to run at large scale if you can run at all. Now let's go to the Python ecosystem a little bit, and I want to advertise open standards that were developed in parallel by the community. So what we know by now is that PIC simulations, we showed this in ECP, can run really, really fast in GPUs. What's also in parallel industry-wise happening is that machine learning is, of course, benefiting dramatically from GPU acceleration. 
So one of the questions that we wanted to start answering and want to explore is can we augment and accelerate on GPU pick simulations by using also on GPU machine learning models with them. And that's one thing that we added now on the top of the MREX layer, which we call PyMREX, and that can be used directly in every application code of, of MREX. It's we implemented these community standards from dataapis.org that allow you to expose on GPU and on CPU memory without copies between a lot of libraries. So everything you can think of, all your favorites, NumPy, QPy, PyTorch, all of these can then be coupled with your application code, in our case, Blast. Blast. And then you can do things like on the right-hand side, you can go, give me every local box I know from MREX and give me a representation in PyTorch without copying it. And the next thing you can do is read this data or write back into it. So technically what you can do with that is you can go into a running simulation and say, and this part, replace please a part of my solver or replace maybe hundreds of steps. And so the two things that we're interested in is of course training. Training is slow, we all know this. And we use standardized IO for this. Uh, and HGA5. But one thing that's really interesting is, is can we with persistent GPU data also do inference to replace parts? And one of the things that's interesting to replace is parts of party accelerated chains that we usually model from one step to the other. So the concept that we explored was like, can we instead of using multiple codes, one for beam transport, one for the plasma element that's really big and then going up, down in scale, transport small, plasma stage big, can we make the costly red parts here maybe as efficient as the transport part? So from hours of simulations, then seconds for another code, then hours in the other code, two minutes in the next part, could we make this if we just specialize enough with surrogate models fast enough to be roughly on the same time scale and be used maybe as a real-time feedback to our experiments? So if you want to think this out on a, more, on a more philosophical level, you basically this triangle here that we think is something like this, where it could be analytical modeling is super fast and accurate, accurate, at least for the assumptions you did in the analytical model. Simulations are accurate and have a high level of detail, but we wouldn't be here if they were fast, right? And uh, speed and level of detail can actually be given by data-driven models, but they are maybe not very accurate. So what we're looking for is fast uh, uh, surrogates that can bridge this ground and be somewhere in the middle ground between these fast analytical and full fidelity simulations. So, so what we did then is experiment by taking this LWFA stage, that was the laser wake feed example that I showed earlier with the plasma, and replacing it with neural nets as a first step. So this is a poor man's approach, this is not the greatest thing in the world, but it demonstrates that the bindings of all this from GPU to GPU over ecosystems from accelerator modeling to ML frameworks actually works. So we trained the neural net, uh, we assume that the particles are not interacting for this part, but are in the plasma stage that pushes them. We analyze the quality. The quality is okay for the things we care about, but could be better. So we have like percent, sub percent level errors. That's okay to model 100 stages. It's not okay to model 100,000 stages of this because they accumulate. And then we tune hyperparameters, and it turns out even really small neural nets are pretty efficient in modeling the dynamics of particles through that if you do these assumptions. Now, we validated this then by putting the large bottleneck simulation specialized down into a surrogate into these transport codes and could compare analytical expressions and data model tests and have really, really fast predictions from that. Of course, under assumptions, and that's where I invite you to collaborate. If you have great ideas how to conserve B moments better, or if you have great ideas how to get microscopic and collective effects modeled together, reach out of us, the infrastructure is there, and we look for computational scientists and applied mathematicians that have great ideas about this. With that, let me summarize and, and open for questions. I presented WarpX as our x application in accelerator modeling and beam and plasma modeling. I showed you that we have new applications coming up. Uh, I showed you the modeling to ML frameworks on the MREX level. Um, and how we hope to leverage this in the future and bridge these two worlds. And I invite you to contribute to our open source ecosystem, use it, um, and get inspiration for your own projects. Thank you. Uh, we have time for two questions. Two questions from audience. Jack. Thank you for the question. So the you made it sound like you could take a data structure from AMRX and pass it to PyTorch without any copies whatsoever. And I think you mentioned that you're using some sort of community toolkit for that. Can you describe like what are the pieces? Are you uh, what the underlying pieces are for, for that? Yeah, we are very happy to. 
So the, the way how this works is there's rooted in early developments of NumPy and the, the underlying thing that happens is you exchange a pointer, right? Because in a Python process, you're in the same process, you have access to the same memory space. And what you do is you take a pointer in these community standards and then you adjust the metadata. This is the data type. This is maybe a 3D data structure has strides and sizes. There's really a lim what we learn in ECP also with many efforts is there's a limited amount of things how you can lay out your data. It's not infinite. Um, and so that works pretty well. So, and the cool thing that happened is these standards are implemented now in different libraries. So they basically have, you could think of a constructor that can get a view by the data. And this can be a writable view. It doesn't have to be read only. And the data is, is living on the GPU the entire time. Exactly. It lives on the GPU the entire time. You can copy it if you need to. And we have still one part in the particle layer. We sometimes have to copy it because it's a struct. But we change this as well to be all GPU. Yeah. Um, so when, when you talk about using um, adding in machine learning parts to your workflow where they can grab the data right off the GPU, does that, do you have to put anything else in there into your traditional simulation workflow to enable that, or is it kind of a buyer beware, grab the data while it's there and it's going, it's going too bad? Yeah, the, uh, that's a good question. So we mostly look into inference workflows currently where the additional input would be your pre-trained model uh, that you put in there. Uh, you have to say the same challenges that you also have actually which are already going to the Python world. They have a lot of shared li libraries dangling around. So yeah, you have to distribute this machine learning model and a lot of important things also like normalizations that you use for that because machine learning is very sensitive to be, uh, no be trained on normalized data and not of what we usually do. Um, but yeah, I think this generally the same way as we go in Python workflows just needs more workflow infrastructure around it now to be, uh, uh, yeah, to, be to grow more. Otherwise it will get complex at some point. It's not fun anymore. Yeah. But the, yeah, it's not a, it's a, it's, I would say it's also on the trivial parallelism model because you will load your model in that sense on every node at the same time. And it will not be a distributed ML model. Yeah. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great talk. Uh, yeah, the next. <laughs> the next speaker is Mark Taylor from San Diego National Lab. Or did this one is uh, currently up? Okay. Yeah. Does the pointer work? Okay. So I'm going to talk about our work um, developing a global cloud resolving atmosphere model. Um, it's a lot, a large team working on this project. I tried to uh, acknowledge a lot of the people who do the computational work that I'll be focusing on today. That includes folks at Sandia, Lawrence Livermore, uh, Oak Ridge. And here at Lawrence Berkeley, uh, Noel Keane. Um, this is for the DOE Exascale Energy Earth System model. It's a large coupled system, which includes an atmosphere component. I'm going to be talking about SCREAM, which stands for Simple Cloud Resolving E3SM Atmosphere Model, a component in E3SM. The simple in the name refers to the fact that if you can run at resolutions that are considered cloud resolving, I'll say what that means, you can drop the deep convection parameterization, making the model simpler than a traditional climate model. Um, I'm going to focus uh, to just describe our work, uh, rewriting the code in C++, compare Fortran versus C++, and so much of climate modeling is done in Fortran, and then compare CPU results and GPU results. Um, in terms of funding, this the uh, E3SM Model development is funded by a, a BER, the large E3SM project that's about 50 FTEs. And this work is done in close collaboration with the E3SM ECP project, representing about 10 FTEs, spread over multiple components in, in addition to just the atmosphere. Um, the E3SM Earth system model and, and uh, most modern Earth system models have this structure coupling together four or five components in their own right, uh, atmosphere model, land model, and ice, land ice, sea ice, and ocean model. And as I said, I'll be talking about the atmosphere component. The existing E3SM atmosphere model is called EAM, um, which is a, uh, entirely written for trend and only runs on CPUs um, to be replaced by SCREAM uh, in the future. The, Cloud resolving in the name refers to this goal of running at resolutions often considered around three kilometers at least, maybe even finer, uh, where you can resolve 
not individual clouds, but the convective motions responsible for cloud formation. It's been a longstanding goal of both the climate modeling and uh, weather prediction community to get to this resolution because you can then drop the parameterization of convection, which has been identified as one of the key problems. It's just a very complicated thing to approximate. Um, and it's a large source of uncertainty in most climate predictions. The resolving that gives you substantial, substantially improved precipitation results, which we know from, for example, running regional models um, because of its you know, explicit treatment of convective storms. Um, the goal for cloud resolving is not a new, new thing. It's been around for a while. This figure actually comes from a Lawrence Berkeley project from 2009, Green Flash, to develop a co-design. I think at the time as an ARM-based machine to run cloud resolving models. And I use this figure because it has shows a, a resolution, um, different resolutions, uh, uh, showing the topography over California. Um, so this from this figure, they have 200 kilometer resolution, which is a typical resolution at the time, 25 kilometer, you can start to see the cells and resolve the mountain ranges in this region. And then one kilometer, um, kind of a long, uh, ultimate goal for cloud resolving models. Within E3SM, um, we, our traditional model runs at 100 kilometers between these two, you know, does, the mouse shows up, between these two resolutions. Um, and I'll be talking about our cloud resolving model, which is 3.25 kilometers, so not quite at one kilometer. In terms of cost, the traditional model at 100 kilometers runs at 64 simulated years per day um, on 85 CPU nodes, for example, Perlmutter CPU. So you can easily run you know, ensembles of 100 year simulations. But our cloud resolving model at 3.25 kilometers runs around one simulated year per day, requiring 32,000 GPUs. So uh, curse of resolution far more expensive. Um, another motivation for cloud resolving is that I think it's the, the resolution at which you really get this digital twin like capability in the model. So the simulations at cloud resolving resolutions can be directly compared with satellite observations. This is a picture. The center is an actual uh, visualization of this of screen data at, at 3.25 kilometers. Then the two insets are comparison with satellite data. So model, so model in the center and then zoomed in one model at the top satellite uh, at the bottom. And this is a, from a two day forecast. Um, so you, you get to this resolution that's uh, really quite realistic. Um, in terms of global atmosphere models around the community, there's been a, a variety of approaches. I've tried to uh, summarize them here. Uh, E3SM, um, what I'm going to be talking about in blue, that's we decided to run on GPUs. We're going to rewrite the entire code in C++. We use Cocos with a little bit of Yakl uh, mixed in for some parameterizations for our performance portable strategy. Um, to put that in perspective with other global atmosphere models, either for climate modeling or, or numerical weather prediction, the MPI group in Germany, the ICON model, they're sticking with Fortran OpenACC. For now, they have really good results on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, but I'll be curious to see how, how long it takes them to get running on AMD GPUs. Um, two things that came up just in the previous couple of talks. There's a, a work initially initiated by the Allen Institute to rewrite the GFDL model, the FE3 dynamical core in Python, a Python-based DSL. So they're not running Python, but they they compile the Python code into CUDA and then run that on the GPUs. And then there's the Klima project is rewriting an entire atmosphere model, maybe a, a full Earth system model in Julia, um, also to, and we'll have a GPU backend. The UK Met Office has, is developing their own DSL called Cyclone, which is, a, I think, a little unique in that it's a Fortran, you write Fortran code that they then compile, they pre-process into GPU code. And then there's a NECAM model. They're actually one of the first global cloud resolving models. And as far as I know, they don't have a GPU strategy, but the, they, the Fugaku machine was designed in part to run NECAM simulations. Um, so they can stick with Fortran for a while. 
Um, I'm often asked, especially by other modeling centers, how long it took to rewrite the code, which is why I include this timeline here. We had a, uh, 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 we developed the, developed the cloud resolving model in Fortran and in parallel started porting it to C++. Um, we had, starting in 2017, two or three years of what I call prototyping. We were working with a, a hydrostatic dynamical core um, at the time, experimenting with different approaches how to use COCOS, how to use hierarchical parallelism, um, how to get good CPU performance. In 2020, uh, we ported the non-hydrostatic dynamical core. That's the thing that the key component needed to be cloud resolving. And once with the prototyping work, that took us about a year. Then it took the team another year to port all the physical parameterizations to C++. Another year after that to do what's called the driver that couples them all together and the IO and the various kind of infrastructure. And it's only in the beginning of 2023 this year that we could finally run the full atmosphere model end to end on the GPU. And we were fortunate this year because 2023 was the first year the Gordon Bell Prize Committee created a special category for climate modeling. Climate modeling usually isn't competitive with the other applications of Gordon Bell, but there's a special category in climate modeling for the, starting this year for the next 10 years, and we're one of the finalists. Uh, for that. Um, so I'll start with a comparison of C++ versus Fortran. This is very important to us because there's so much Fortran code in E3SM and almost all the developers are really dyed in the wool Fortran. <coughs> and so we really wanted uh, our C++ code um, to be as fast as our Fortran code. We thought it would be a non-starter if we came in with this new model and it was actually slower on, on CPUs, C++ on CPUs. Um, and this work, I'd say, in retrospect, was actually harder than getting good GPU performance because, the, at least for our code, the key to good CPU performance is vectorization. And the Fortran compilers are great at auto vectorization. And for C++, uh, to be competitive, we basically had to hand vectorize every, every loop in the code, which is, took a lot of time. Um, and the team, came up with something they call PAX, a C++ data structure where all every loop is broken into loops over PAX and the PAX then automatically vectorize. And this plot shows uh, a GPU results in red, but ignore those for now, we'll focus on CPU, CPU results comparing the Fortran code and the C++ code. And on this aging IBM P9 processor, that's the curve down here on, in the black and and blue, the two curves are on top of each other. The C++ code is identical performance to the Fortran code. On the EPICS, and this is Perlmutter CPU partition, the C++ code is slightly faster, C++ code in blue is slightly faster than the uh, Fortran code in black. And probably because we've paid a little bit more attention to vectorization in, um, in the C++ code. This is a strong scaling plot at one degree or 100 kilometer resolution, not cloud resolving resolution. So at this resolution, you can strong scale uh, into the regime where you start to lose scalability and all these curves roll off. Um, and I'll come back, the, the GPUs, are, different GPUs are in red, I'll come back to that uh, it, and I, when I talk about GPUs versus CPUs. So another thing we go back and forth with internally in the project is how do we how, do, how should we compare CPU performance with GPU performance? Um, and I think the probably the best way, which is too difficult for us, is you know, performance per total cost of ownership of a, buying a GPU machine versus buying a CPU machine. Um, I was surprised to learn this, but, I, but I've been told several times that the performance, it's not the power purchase price, it's actually most of the cost of the machine, not the power budget, so better a comparison might be, you know, the cost of a GPU node versus the cost of a CPU node. Um, that's hard for us to get because uh, those numbers aren't generally publicly available. Um, but I'm actually hoping the centers can provide a ratio, like a GPU node costs four times as much as a CPU node. Um, and then there's performance per watt, which we've all tried to do that, compare performance per watt, and we use TDP, which turns out to be very... Uh, unfair against the GPUs. Um, just this year, uh, thanks to Perlmutter and Noel Keen, we actually got true power consumption results. So we can do a direct comparison of when the model 
was running Perlmutter GPU versus Perlmutter uh, CPU. Uh, and the kind of TDP estimate is like five times more power, but the, this actual runtime estimate um, shows that the GPU nodes are only about 1.7 times, using 1.7 times more power. And this is the kind of information we can get from Perlmutter comparing the, the power, even the power breakdown of the different components in the node. But we now use that number, 1.7 uh, comparison. Um, and I'll, uh, so this is going back to this one degree data where we can actually run out to the limit of scaling. But there is a region down here, low number of nodes, where the GPUs are actually quite fast. And they're, I think I wrote here, uh, four to 10 times faster in this region. And they only use 1.7 times more power. So that's a nice win. If you need to get, if you need to run out here, of course, where the CPUs and GPUs are all kind of converging, um, the fastest GPU, which for us is the A100 for this problem, is a little bit faster than the CPU, but probably not 1.7 times faster in that regime. So then turning to the, the uh, cloud resolving resolution. So this is the same strong scaling data, um, but now we're in a regime where there's so many grid points, even on a machine like Frontier, we can't scale all the way to the, to the limit of scaling. Although the scaling is, the uh, black curve is, is perfect weak, perfect strong scaling, and we are rolling off from that. So this is the CPU C++ code now only running on a variety of GPU and N1 and Perlmutter CPU machines on a variety of node counts for this our goal of this 3.25 kilometer cloud resolving model. So this is the, we have one point which gives us a direct comparison between GPU and CPU that's uh, 2000 nodes our 2000 node, sorry, our 1500 nodes, because we have 1500 Perlmutter GPU nodes, and we can run a 1500 Perlmutter CPU nodes and get this direct comparison 5.8 times faster. And so that's a 3.5 times faster per watt. So uh, I think for our application, really solid data that GPUs are more efficient and are faster and um, uh, uh, worth the investment because you're not going to get a 3.5. It's going to take many years of CPU improvements to get a 3.5 x speed up on a per watt basis. Um, another, uh, I'll just mention the comparison here. This is a summit, so six V100s, and then Pearl Mutter. That's four A100s. Um, so we get a nice improvement there going to the A100s, and then this is uh, the Frontier, so the AMD GPUs. Um, so we also use this plot to make the point that our C++ Cocos approach is, has allowed us to run on both NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. Um, it took a little more work to get the AMD performance to be what we expected, but it wasn't nearly as bad as the five years it took us to convert to Cocos and C++ in the first place. And this last dotted line is, uh, is uh, optimizations done by uh, Trey White at HPE, so really uh, somewhat portable, um, but not, uh, they break, for example, our CPU performance, so kind of, in, in, I don't know how to explain it, but uh, de -cocos, not quite the Coco spirit of performance portability, and we got a, a nice 10% speed up there, but we use that to say that the base Cocos implementation is actually pretty good. And if you go in, if you really need that extra 10%, you can go in and do the uh, uh, more uh, intrusive optimizations. Um, so just to summarize, uh, we we quite happy in retrospect with our choice to, to switch to C++ and Cocos for performance portability. And we have rewritten our atmosphere model. And the E3SM project is now in the process of rewriting the ocean model in C++. Uh, they'll be using uh, Yakko, it's a similar flavor to Cocos for the performance portability. Um, competitive performance on with the Fortran code on CPUs and running on NVIDIA and AMD GPUs and we hope Intel uh, very soon. I didn't mention this, but we achieved this long, that was a yellow line in the plot. 
uh, we achieved this long-standing goal of getting a cloud resolving model to run faster than one simulated year per day. I'll stop here. Thanks. interesting talk. So we compare the per watt performance, right? So when you measure the GPU watt, did you also include the CPU and consumption? Even though it's idle, but I, I guess it's yeah, it's the full. So this plot, the, the, this is this is really nice information you can get from NERF or Perlmutter, and it's the breakdown. The I think the, the this line is the full node, including everything. So we, all the numbers I showed you, the full cost of the node. And there's no data and then the full run. And then you can multiply the node data by the number of nodes you're using that actually matches the fullness. So the numbers seem quite, uh, quite reliable. So I have kind of maybe like a big picture question, which is like when you're thinking about the type of runs that would go into say like the next UN climate report or something like that, do those represent like do the diamond benchmarks here kind of represent the type of runs that would go into there or are there additional complexities that? Yeah, so the, the runs, for example, that make the, that contribute to the IPCC reports are something called the DEC. It's a suite of runs, it's about uh, 1200 years spread across several different simulations. So it's not possible to run that at cloud resolving. So the, the cloud resolving model can't do that right now. I mean, it could, but you'd need all of Frontier dedicated probably for a year and a half or something like that. So the DEC runs or the IPCC runs will still be at lower resolution. Could you imagine uh, could you imagine using the cloud resolving model Cost? Yeah. So, or, or is there so much complexity that it wouldn't be reliable at all? So there's probably a, there's quite a that's a hot topic right now. And there's quite a few projects doing that using cloud resolving models to train. You can train replace the entire model. Um, an approach I like is you you train on the difference between a cloud resolving model and a low risk model. So you're only machine learning the nudging. I like it because you have machine learning and you keep the PDE part in your effort, in your project as well. But yeah, that's, a, I would say the weather forecast has the nicest results right now. The climate results are still, uh, we're still waiting for some really convincing results in climate modeling. All right, thanks very much. I'm Sam, I'm part of the Exa AM team. I'll be talking about uh, almost exclusively Exa CA today, which is our tool for doing microstructure prediction uh, at the component level uh, for additive manufacturing processes. I'll note that Matt Rolshigo is the, uh, the thrust lead in the Exa AM project. John, Jerry, and Alex have been instrumental in helping us on the uh, thermal processing side that feeds into Exa CA, and Jim Bielak um, is both the deputy lead for XAM as well as my former postdoc and Matt's former postdoc mentor at Lawrence Livermore. Um, so I'll jump straight into XAM, right? So I'm talking about one component, but it's uh, like all the ECP projects we're hearing about, a very wide uh, uh, group of people. It's led at Oak Ridge uh, by Matt Beamant, uh, formerly John Turner, uh, together with Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos, as well as NIST, where NIST really uh, formed the basis uh, and really spearheaded all the experimental work that was really crucial for us to be able to do direct uh, comparisons to. Uh, so I'll, I'll go into more detail on that, um, but I'll also note we had a lot of collaborations, uh, a lot of subcontracts with universities, as well as uh, uh, informal collaborations uh, with other labs. Um, so I'm talking about additive manufacturing. I think everyone is generally familiar with, um, with 3D printing, and I'm, I'm talking specifically about metal additive manufacturing, and even more specifically about laser powder bed fusion. 
Um, so here's a nice video from an ACTA paper a few years ago. And so uh, we're doing a uh, very focused laser, uh, nothing like the, the laser powers that uh, Axel was talking about, but a focused laser where we selectively melt and resolidify our material. Here we're making a relatively boring uh, square of material, um, but you'll see we're at about a tenth of a second in total elapsed experimental time here. And then what we would do is we'd wreck a new layer of metallic powder of whatever composition we want on top of this. We would do another process where we selectively melt again, and so we can do very complicated parts. Um, and potentially, and say best case scenario in the future, we're doing uh, uh, topological optimization at the same time uh, that we're doing material optimization, uh, local composition changes, a lot of really cool things in the future, but we need to be able to understand what's happening before we, we push hard in that direction. And again, I'll note the NIST uh, collaboration here, the AM Bench series, so benchmark series of experiments was performed um, that, that gives us that direct uh, uh, data to compare to. And so the 2018 benchmark is what we chose since that was near the beginning of, of ECP. So the workflow that I'll talk about, the, the XAM workflow is a classic material science uh, process structures properties. Right, so if you're inside of material science, you know that we really always have to focus on all three of these things. Uh, if, if you're outside, what I'll say is uh, uh, just that I'm going to focus entirely on the microstructure today. Right, so we have local texture um, that is directly controlled by how the the part was made. And as I showed before, that can be very complicated. Um, and how that structure forms locally, right? What is the orientation of the atoms that are that are uh, at this, this moving solidification front? Um, very tightly couples to what the ultimate local properties are uh, of this part, right? So I've noted the component leads on these three pieces down here. This is the primary X, XAM uh, workflow here. We also have some optional pieces. Um, so I'm also leading the development on uh, Picasso MPM, which is a material point method. That's a, an offshoot of the particle and cell method that Axel gives a, a, gave a very nice introduction to so that I don't have to. Um, that's a higher fidelity method where we're, we're looking not only at uh, the thermal processing, but also free surface deformation. So if you turn your laser up high enough, you're going to punch a hole down into your material. Um, so that's a much more expensive method and, and something as kind of an optional piece of our loop. We also have a lot of work in phase field. I'm noting Chris uh, Newman and Steve DeWitt as the leads on one of the phase field codes we have. We have a few different phase field codes and that's looking, um, I'll talk more about this, but uh, another higher fidelity uh, optional piece of our, our total workflow loop here. So it looks like I've uh, uh, missed one piece in my animation series here. So I'll, I'll, I'll jump through this a bit, but the real question comes down to why did we decide to do uh, uh, XSCA? Why is that the primary piece of our workflow? So we look at phase field, that's way off into the top right. If I could make it a bigger slide, I would do it. I would push it as far out as I possibly could in computational cost uh, and, and a bit higher in detail. In that, we see the dendritic structure we're looking at here. This is truly what is happening, uh, getting very close to the atomic level uh, and what is happening in the compositional field um, as you're, you're solidifying your, your, your metal here. The CA is a much more reasonable uh, in between. I will note that there is such a thing as, uh, I'm, I'm splitting this dendrite scale and grain scale. There is grain scale uh, phase field, there is dendrite scale cellular automata, but um, for the most part, when people are talking about these two methods, we're talking about uh, phase field dendrites and CA uh, for grains. Um, there's some other options, kinetic Monte Carlo uh, gives some things, but that starts to lose not only the dendritic scale, but also loses the uh, orientation information, the texture of what's happening inside of your part, or at least there's a much looser connection between the rates that you input in KMC and what you actually get out of that. And so we decided, uh, we tried to stay right in the middle here uh, for CA um, and, and move forward with that. And one more quick note, I showed Steve and, and Chris's name on the previous slide, just to show the gulf uh, in between these two things. Here's a really nice uh, video that they put together from an inside allocation on Summit. So this is 100, and 30,000 uh, GPU hours uh, for this individual simulation. This is a stationary spot melt, right? So we're not doing the raster that I was showing in the previous video. We're looking at turn the laser on, turn the laser right back off. And, and we see a lot of detail uh, in this slide here as we uh, look at the very end of the solidification, right? We see some interesting uh, physics in terms of the uh, switch from planar to dendritic solidification. I'm not gonna talk at all about this because again, XCC it does not model this. But just to note that if this is as, if we need the full machine uh, to do one of these simulations, we're not going to be able to do the full process. Um, so that really, I think, puts into focus why we developed XCA. So I'll show this video on the right hand side. This is just a simple uh, fixed 
uh, uh, directional certification problem. Um, so nowhere near additive manufacturing, but just an example of what XCA can do. Um, again, we skip all the dendritic physics here, but we can do epitaxial and nucleated grain growth. Um, Matt usually likes to say we're mimicking alloy solidification, so we're tracking grain orientations. I can go ahead and play this one again. Um, but it's it's really fundamentally as a CA method, right? It's about tracking states and uh, deciding when one grain overtakes another one and changes its state, um, say potentially from liquid to solid. So we chose the option here um, to use Cocos plus MPI. Um, as you've heard a lot about before, but I'll note at the very end of the presentation that as a project, we didn't uh, uh, go wholesale into one, right? XCA is cocos based, but we have other codes that have, have made other decisions. Um, going into the next piece here, so, so what's one example of the science we're doing here? So this goes back to, again to our collaboration with NIST. We're directly comparing to the experiment, um, trying to point to the, uh, on the L8 leg or the thin leg, and this part is a very narrow section, less than a millimeter, um, but five millimeters tall, five millimeters wide. Um, so this was three billion cells, and when we published this uh, very early 2022, to our knowledge, it was the largest CA simulation uh, that had been done here. Um, and we saw a really nice comparison, not only with the grain morphologies, and I'm comparing on the top right here, so you have a lot of really small grains uh, with some relatively large grains uh, in between based on the, the scan strategy that we're using in this AM process. We also had pretty good uh, agreement with the texture. Um, but I will note that the 100 on the bottom uh, left here is a bit uh, a, a bit off here. But overall, we were very happy with the comparison of the of the textures here. And again, calling back to the phase field, why did we take the strategy here? Uh, we had uh, uh, five orders of magnitude fewer node hours necessary to do this, but also 100 times larger uh, simulation volume and a more complicated series of boundary conditions and, and, and a full scan strategy. Right, so. Um, this is this is fundamentally why we had to uh, choose the lower fidelity method uh, in order to, to get the science done that we needed to. Uh, jumping to performance, right? So this is uh, GPUs for, uh, for science uh, today. And so this started off as, again, as we've heard uh, a lot today, an MPI only code that we then uh, created a, a Cocos version of that, uh, Cocos plus MPI, I should say. And so what I'm, what's not shown in this uh, uh, figure from our paper was a very, very slow initial version, right? So the initial version was completely logged, uh, bogged down in transferring data back and forth. Uh, we were completely uh, hammered by the communication costs. And so the initial, uh, the 1.0 release of XSCA uh, was past that initial stage where everything had basically been, been rewritten uh, uh, wholesale and uh, algorith algorithmically. Uh, to make it tractable and we had an initial approximate uh, 10x speed up compared to the original MPI only code uh, looking at the uh, say node-to-node uh, -node comparison or sorry single GPU to a sixth of a node comparison uh, technically um, and by the end of that year that we tracked in the paper we had about a 20x speed up from from start uh, to end here and um, I'll note that the important changes that we really needed to make here was uh, a lot of things we've already heard today right uh, do exactly the opposite of what you used to do. Uh, Recompute everything uh, as much as possible. Uh, save as much memory um, because the biggest issue that we have with CA is it's exact opposite of phase field. We barely have any work to do. We're tracking an orientation. We're seeing did this cell capture the next cell? Do some vector math, and that's it. Um, so we need to fit as many cells as we possibly can on a single GPU to do anything uh, at all effective. We we barely have any flops in this code. So ultimately, it's not uh, a great uh, you know, GPU ready uh, method. And so we had to do a lot of work to, to make that happen, right? So uh, improving the vector math that we were doing was an important step. And then adding the concept of a, of a steering vector. So separating those cells that are doing a lot of work, those that are active or right at the solidification front from those that are either already solidified uh, or not currently participating in solidification. Um, since then, we did a lot of updates in the communication. So doing some mixed precision work, uh, as well as trying to reduce the total amount of communication um, primarily based again on the, the cell states. Are you active? Uh, are you doing anything inter interesting at this moment? Uh, or can we ignore you for now? Um, so this, I will note, uh, was not a plot I was happy to put in the paper. This was, uh, I would say, pretty poor weak scaling on the GPU side. We get a good speed up. We, we see the speed up that we, that we wanted to see from the CPU to the GPU for these different system sizes. Um, but this is, again, only 10 nodes of Summit, and we're already uh, losing uh, most of our uh, most of our performance there <clears throat> on the GPU. And so from there, there's two last details from the previous slide that I'll note, right? Uh, uh, using some mixed precision uh, and reducing our total amount of communication with a few different uh, uh, tricks there. 
Um, this is what we ran on Frontier uh, much more recently, um, comparing, uh, just replotting the original uh, data in green here and, and comparing to Frontier. So now we're happy, uh, certainly very happy up to 50 nodes, reasonably happy up to 1,000 nodes. Um, but I do want to pause here and note, um, this is for, again, the directional simplification. So this would be something, uh, if you have a large scale casting simulation, uh, nowhere near advanced manufacturing, um, then this would be great, right? We can fit uh, uh, whatever casting volume you need on 1000 or, or more nodes of Frontier. But for additive, because we're rastering this laser back and forth, we're always moving where the work is. And so we're always transferring data around too much. Um, and so we still have a lot of work to do in terms of um, fully scaling out uh, the additive manufacturing process for XSCA. Um, so back to what science can we do with this? What's the more recent results that we've done uh, with XSCA? Um, I'm showing a little bit more detail of what the scan strategy is here on the bottom here. It's an alternating, uh, say, perpendicular series of, of layers here as the, the, the laser is rastering here. And partially because of the uh, scaling issues with this raster approach, but also um, because we've we have realized that we don't truly need the full, uh, the full part scale geometry, right? We could simulate the full part if we wanted to, um, but we don't truly need that. We, we need to know what's happening locally. We need to be able to say, if I probe this region inside of my experiment, do I understand what's happening from the simulation side of things, right? We're not going to be able to um, uh, look at every single aspect of the microstructure across an entire part experimentally, so we should be focusing on what we can do uh, in terms of one-to-one -one comparisons. So um, I've thrown up the details of the thermal simulations here primarily to, to note that John and Matt put a huge amount of effort into that calibration. Um, there's a lot of different um, parameters that were varied at the XSCA level, all the uncertainties coming from our nucleation parameters, so that's what we varied. We also uh, varied our process parameters in terms of melt pool depth and, and width, and so ultimately our frontier uh, demonstration or challenge problem around the, the ECP world um, was 7,000 different simulations, varying different parameters, uh, and so total using about 80% of, of Frontier and the 67 GCDs. Uh, this was a, a, a very, very much a, a workflow simulation, which included the thermal processing simulations, the microstructure prediction simulations with XCA, and the property predictions uh, with XCONSTIT. Um, so here's a video of what we're doing, right? So we're showing just kind of the very general effect of what the, the laser is doing in blue here, melting and then creating the, the texture and, and building up uh, layer by layer. So I'll note one more time briefly that um, the higher fidelity code would actually be showing the free surface motion and, and resolving that physics. But for this, right, it's a finite volume approach uh, for the thermal. And so we, we have kind of approximated powder layers as we build this part up uh, uh, layer by layer. So next. Um, just to, to briefly finish the rest of this, so this is showing a movie of the, the texture as a function of build height, right, so you see very quickly, we see, uh, we get to, to a steady state microstructure, um, and the texture really stops moving uh, on the bottom side, uh, at the bottom here, and as we move up, um, that's an important thing to know in terms of, uh, for this particular alloy, for this particular build, uh, this is what you're getting, at the very end it kind of gets scrambled there. Um, but just to show the final comparisons, experiment to simulation, um, we're very happy with this texture comparison. It's a bit harder, it's a wider leg, so it's a, it's a more difficult prediction, but the grain morphology looks excellent, I think. Um, the small grains uh, with the wide grains because of this particular scan strategy. The texture, again, also looks pretty good, but a little, a little bit farther off, especially in the 100, uh, the strength of the texture, both for the large and, the, and a bit for the small grains. Um, but I'll finish up very quickly here just by saying, um, that's an, a very exciting result to have. We're still moving forward, we're still building new codes. Uh, the current simulation strategy does not have a GPU capable thermal uh, uh, or uh, low fidelity uh, GPU capable thermal code. So we're building a new one based on the Cabana library. Um, I talked about the scaling issues with, uh, with XSCA for the AM processes. So we're moving forward with a discrete event version of Sailor Automata, again, based on the Cabana library, where I'll admit that I'm biased because I also lead development on that. Um, but I'm a bit over, so I'll go ahead and just say thanks so much for your attention. I'm really happy with what we've been able to do uh, with the GPUs uh, in XAM. This is the first time hearing of the Cabana library. Can you speak more? Yeah, so Cabana is, uh, I would say, analogous to uh, MRX, which is uh, okay. uh, very popular here. So rather than the uh, adaptive mesh, we're focusing on, on particles as our motif, right? So since it, its inception as fundamentally a Cocos-based particle library, we've also grown to structured grids plus particles, right? So we have no plans to do adaptive grids. We have no plans to do um, anything like that. But sparse grids that support 
your, your particles, right? So we do hybrid particle mesh um, as well as pure particle uh, simulations. And I should probably note that it, another one of the co-design centers as a part of ECP uh, was uh, created uh, Cabana. Like oh yes. Uh, so we don't. Ha we have. I, I noted this one trillionist dependency there. Um, that's just the. That's a, a singular. So um, kind of code by code, and I'll go back to the actual current state, right? So each code has its own um, choice of both programming model as well as uh, uh, say physics library or or co-design library, so to speak. So um, you know. On the top, Cabana is kind of doing both. It's underneath Cabana is Cocos, right? But in some of the other ones, right, Raja and M were necessary in different parts uh, of the the crystal plasticity code. So, kind of a, a choice based on the previous codes that were were here before ECP, as, or or what looked tractable uh, moving forward. Uh, how's the compilation time look like? Do you want to use some of the trillions? I know Trinos is huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to be honest, I've never worked uh, on that piece of, of XAM, uh, and I would bet uh, it's not a, a great answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Uh, our attention to Our next speaker is Paul Fisher. Uh, Paul is affiliated with uh, University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. Yes, you can just, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I'll go to the National Lab. So I can just share. Yeah, you can just go ahead and share. You can stop sharing. Stop sharing. Okay. I'll try again. Screen right. It's hiding my. Yes. Now close that down. Oops. Shrink it down. There we go. Good. We will have lunch after this. Okay, um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. This is a great opportunity to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, exascale flow simulations for energy sciences. In fact, actually, it turns out most of my examples today are, are, are nuclear, um, but we, we have an open source code and it's used broadly in, in a wide range of applications. Um, uh, this, so the code I'm talking about is NEC-RS. It's our GPU variant of NEC-5000. Um, NEC 5000 was an F77 code. It still is an F77 code. Started when I was a grad student, before the craze started supporting C. Okay, <laughs> um, and uh, the ECP was a wonderful opportunity to make a transition, which we had been wanting to do for a while. It's uh, NEC RS is a C++ with uh, with Aka kernels for uh, for GPU portability. And let's see if I can. It's for some reason not advancing. Okay. So here, this is an example by um, Ilya Mirzari at, at uh, Penn State. Uh, this is a um, 37 um, rod bundle uh, with a blockage. Um, so they're, they're interested in, in um, the thermal, thermal hydraulics for reactors. Um, it's uh, four and a half million elements, polymer weight degree seven, so about uh, 1.5 billion grid points. It was run on Summit with 480 B100s. Um, so about 3.2 million grid points per um, GPU. That's an important number for us. Uh, the time per step is about a half second per step. Um, and it was so a 60 hour run on 10% on, uh, of um, Summit. You probably could have run, um, we could have probably run this around 2 million grid points per, um, uh, per GPU and the, the time would go down correspondingly. Um, so, um, the nature of our problem, it's the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, so it, it has a few complexities. It's highly nonlinear, but really the computational bottleneck is this divergence-free constraint, which gives rise to a Poisson equation that's ill-conditioned. It doesn't get better conditioned as delta t goes to zero, because with the incompressible model, the speed of sound is infinite. So if you push on one end of the pipe, the water comes out the other end at the other time step, and at the end of the time step. And so every processor has to know that that took place. So it implies global communication, um, no matter no matter what you do. Um, and of course, uh, for high Reynolds numbers, it means you have small amount of dissipation. It's a singular perturbed uh, PDE, so 
lots of um, uh, uh, a large range of scales, internal boundary layers, and so forth, which drives up the resolution requirements. Okay. So for us, the scalability uh, questions were, um, you know, how do we get performance? That's already been talked on, talked a bit by uh, Mark and some of the others. Um, when you actually do want to run faster, and most of our users do want to run faster. Um, so this, the performance is a very simple model. It's nothing other than the definition of parallel efficiency. It's basically take your saturated performance on a single uh, MPI rank, single GPU, if you will, uh, multiply it by P, and then eta is the, the difference between what you observe and what P times S1 should be. So the main things to do are to boost S1. In other words, make sure you have fast code on each node or each GPU. And then, of course, keep eta from falling as P is increased for fixed problem size. So the scalability of an application depends on the nature of the problem. In other words, in our case, it's, we have this global coupling. That's a key part of the application um, that's inescapable. Uh, the platform, the size of the problem, number of spatial grid points, and, and the code. Um, so what we're looking for is, is ultimately a p-fold speed up. Uh, several of us were at a recent ECP NASA meeting, and they got up in one example after another. They said they're running on thousands of CPUs. They have weeks to months of runtime. They have these highly um, uh, time critical applications. They want to do something different. And so they were asking, you know, um, could GPUs work for them? So that's, that's really what we've focused on is what, how can we drive P out? How can we make it scale? Uh, so a general rule of thumb for PDEs, if you double the um, local problems or the global problem size, you can double P. Uh, you'll retain the same efficiency. So the key parameter number of points per rank. And the bottom line is that at the strong scale limit, which is where the users run, they're not, they don't, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. They run it, it takes, you know, they get this many time steps in 12 hours, they double the number of processors, they get twice as many time steps. They keep doing it until it stop, stops happening. So they always naturally gravitate to some place where they can't stand the pain of the inefficiency. We've arbitrarily chosen 80% as, as our design metric. Um, so the key is you can't let, um, if, if you're reducing the time to solution, you cannot let the, uh, the local problem size where you achieve 80% efficiency over and uh, divided by S sub one increase. So in other words, if I come along and say, hey, I've got a new processor, it's twice as fast, but your local problem size will have to be five times larger, you've increased your time to solution by a factor of 2.5, okay? That's not a good scenario. Um, so going into the whole ECP project was, you know, first of all, how would we maximize uh, S1? So we took an all-in approach based on our experience with um, the OLCF Titan, um, which was you can't just dip your toe in and actually win because the CPUs were pretty fast on Titan, if you remember. Um, so we did not follow the Pragma approach. We said, okay, let's just go um, full bore. Um, we'll use Aka. Tim, Tim Warburton's kernels are, are very, very fast rewrite everything in C++. And then the open question was, well, what happens to N sub 0.8? Is it going to skyrocket and, and make us uh, make time to solution longer or not? So here are some strong scale. These are, I like the term weak scale, strong scale plots. Each one of these are strong scale plots of different problem sizes. If you change the x-axis to be number of points per rank, you essentially get data collapse. And we find we hit the 80% um, uh, parallel efficiency mark at about 2.7 here on uh, frontier and crusher. And this is out to, um, I mean, this is way out to 10 to the fourth ranks on crusher. Um, we're really here at a, at, at a thousand ranks. Okay. So this is where users will typically run. And this is our design point. So we do all our design optimization at the 80% parallel efficiency mark. Because if you do it way over here, that, that the users aren't going to run here. It's going to be too slow. And you might make some choices that are not relevant. And of course, there's no point in doing it out here. They're also not going to be running out there. Uh, here are strong scaling results on um, Polaris and Frontier and Crusher. Um, for these flop, th this, is, uh, this is flops per rank and number of um, points per rank here. Up and to the left is good. But that up and to the left doesn't tell the whole story. If you look at that, you'd say, well, A1, the A100 clearly crushing the MI250X, right, on every metric. However, you look at the 80% mark, uh, Frontier's actually faster. 
So somebody who's running on Frontier and feels this 80% pain, they're going to be running faster than they would be on, on Polaris, uh, because the N sub 0 0.8 is only 3 million per GCD on Frontier. OK, so uh, from a user's perspective, for most PDE solvers, the efficiency fall off for CPUs and GPUs is generally different. On CPUs, it's generally MPI latency effects. You've got the problem down small enough per CPU, the messages you're sending out are generally latency dominated. Um, on GPUs, it's the GPU scalability and then uh, MPI latency and, and potentially bandwidth effects. The reason bandwidth can be important on a GPU versus a CPU is the number of points per GPU is much, much larger. So on a CPU, it's you know, 10,000, 30,000. On a GPU, it's 10 million. The amount of data per message is large enough to be into the, um, uh, where, you, where you can sense the, uh, the bandwidth uh, limitations. OK, so in the seed project uh, that was supported under ECP, we adapted a series of benchmarks. This is BP1. We have six of them. Uh, we've had people from all over the world uh, uh, adapt these be benchmarks. It's a different kind of scaling plot. It's where you take an, a fixed number of processors and then you just change the size of the problem per processor. So here we have just one single V100 um, and we're changing the number of elements in this calculation for different polynomial orders. And we plot the number of grid points on the x-axis and the throughput in terms of gigadoffs per second on the y-axis. So again, up and to the left is good here. Higher polynomial orders get higher throughput um, for the same number of grid points. Right, that's that's critical, um, and uh, but you can see that even on a single GPU, you fall off uh, by the time you get to a million uh, degrees of freedom. Okay, so um, John Kemi at uh, Livermore uh, did a hero's work and and rewrote this entire benchmark. And it, there's no MPI here because it's just a single V100, but he wrote the entire benchmark as a single kernel. He established that indeed you can get a 10x gain in problem size reduction um, by eliminating the kernel launch overhead. Okay, so the penalty uh, over here is coming from the kernel launch overhead. So an order of magnitude is worth thinking about. Okay, other challenges for portability we've adopted to use uh, AUKA. Um, Tim Warburton is a key team member. I've been working with Tim for 15 years at least, and he's been in this business for 20. Um, he writes really high performance code, and he, had, he and his team had developed um, this uh, portability platform. Um, and people often say, will Aka be around? Well, Tim has it as his license plate on his car, which at least he's committed to it. <laughs> um, so the same code can run CUDA, HIP, OpenCL, DPC++. So that's our, our program portability model. Uh, CS grad students are able to write backends for this. Um, so here are some performance uh, results for A100 and the MI250X. Tim spent a weekend because the a, uh, MI250X had some funky behavior, so he got all the numbers boosted to you know five teraflops for this um, FP32 kernel. Um, and it, it, the same work that he did also boosted the A100 up to uh, in excess of eight um, uh, teraflops uh, for this kernel, which is one of our, our key kernels. When we run NEC, um, we have different versions of, of all the kernels, and it runs through a battery at runtime and selects which is the fastest. So you can see for the AX, um, it, 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 this shows what the, what the winner of each one was. Um, so we're um, two teraflops, four teraflops for this. So it also reports this is F32. This is um, FP64. Uh, we also print out the um, gigaflops per rank um, every 500 time steps. Um, the advection kernel, so Peng Wang at NVIDIA uh, got into this optimization game. So again, he optimized here. Peng is optimizing Aka code. Brought the um, uh, one of our key kernels. Um, this is an FP64 kernel from five teraflops up to 6.4 on the A100 and up to 12.6 on the uh, H100. Um, two, we also do the same thing with our communication options. There are many ways you could do nearest neighbor exchanges. You could go through the host. You could not go through the host. You could do blah blah blah. Pack on the host. Pack on the device. Um, so the code picks out. Um, 
the fastest. You can see when um, Pearl Butter was upgraded from SS10 to SS11 that the bandwidth went up by about a factor of 1.5 across the board. Life was good. Uh, I'll get to, there was a, a little glitch there um, in, in a, one slide. But uh, other optimizations, overlapping communication, computation yields about a 15% gain. Uh, and then FP32 also gives about a 10 to 15% gain. So we use FP32 in the preconditioners. So here's the little glitch with um, the SS11. We were, we were at a Polaris benchmark um, hackathon uh, uh, in that last summer when the switch was made and suddenly Polaris wasn't agreeing with, with uh, Perlmutter. So for example, at, at this processor count, um, our nine Stokes time went up by a factor of three. And it was highly repeatable. You can see weeks apart, the same timing plots. Uh, the SS10 line here is in magenta. Um, and Polaris and Perlmutter with SS10 both look the same. We're deathly afraid of making the switch from SS10 to SS11. We keep asking, are you going to up are you going to upgrade <laughs> Polaris? And, and then plus, we know SS11 is going to be used on these other architectures. Uh, but the really good news is um, uh, Brandon Cook, who is here. I don't know if he's here here, but he's in this bill. Or I assume he's in this institution. Oh, he sent us an email uh, last week. And he said, you might try to rerun it because there have been upgrades to the SS11. And we get the gold line, and now we're happy. OK. So it's just that you know, it really pays to have somebody, we have a student who's really good at this, visit and do these plots, right? If you just went to an isolated processor count, you'd say slow, right? It, you have to explore the parameter space. OK, so I'll wind up with a couple of um, calculations. These are full core calculations. These were done on Summit. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, using all of Summit, um, so 27,000 uh, GPUs, uh, 51 billion grid points, uh, 100 million elements. Uh, um, and we had to do a lot of fine tuning at, at this scale and for the problem of this complexity. Uh, initially, the coarse uh, salt um, time for the pressure salt for our, our, our P multi grid was consuming 45% of the runtime. That happens at large processor counts because course grid solve doesn't go down like 1 over p, it goes up like log p, right? Because it's communication intensive. Um, and so we, we did some, a number of tricks that are outlined in this paper. We got that down to 11% of the total, and at the end of the day to 0.2 seconds of time step. So that in six hours of wall clock time, we could do a single flow through the entire reactor, which was just, for us, really astounding based on, on where we were uh, before the start of the ECP. Uh, more recently, we've done um, 9,000 node runs on Frontier. Uh, this is a couple of physics with neutronics and thermal fluid transport. It's a billion elements. Um, that's also a new record <coughs> up in the billion element range. Um, this was a, a, a Gordon Bell 2023 finalist um, paper. And uh, here are the initial results on Frontier. So. Typical time step is 0.3 seconds of time step, but there were a lot, a large fraction of these were well above one second, some as high as, high as 10 seconds. And uh, we're talking, and I, this gap is really interesting. I'll discuss with people afterwards what I think this is, but um, it was, it, it, um, um, it, it's coming from a kind of a surprising spot, but it is a spot that could have message contention. So based on that, we said, OK, if that's, the, if that's the hypothesis, one way to avoid message contention is to um, go through the host, not do GPU direct. And that definitely helped quite a bit. So we're now at uh, 28 uh, petaflops for this um, uh, once we turn it off. We, turned off. we did other strategies too, but this was the best one. OK, so progress towards exascale, um, our users are seeing a three threefold increase in, at the strong scale limit. So typical 0.15 seconds per time step versus half second per time step for production runs with our old code. Um, we're just able to solve huge problems that were not possible. You know, 15 million elements was the upper bound on Mira, and now we do a billion elements. Um, we have portable performance. We're hitting almost a teraflop per A100. 
Um, as Elias says, once the students switch to the GPU variant, they never go back. And then um, bake-offs have been a really good mechanism across in, within seed and, and, and outside of seed for um, increasing productivity. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, any questions? I, I have two questions. Yeah. Earlier on, you showed a plot which had frontier pressure numbers, yeah. but they were different. Is there any reason why that should be? You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> similar question, right. similar vein, you know, you were saying that if you turn off GPO or MPI, what you're really doing is you're introducing latency. Yeah. Because the GPUs are the GPUs are tied to the NICs directly. Correct, correct. So if you turn it off, you have to probably bounce to the host and bounce back again. Yeah. So that but, should increase your latency. Yes, but, but the whole idea is if you think that the issue, so for me, the reason I see a gap, I've seen it on other machines. I have zero idea if it's true here, and I could not get an answer because I wasn't asking the right people. But I remember decades ago, I was told by somebody at Intel, Oh, you know, if the message doesn't make it, if there's contention, it takes about 10 times longer for it to get through. So I see this jump and I'm saying, ah, what I'm seeing is contention here. Um, so what I would like to do is turn off, one of the things that is, is to mess around with the um, contention mitigation strategies that are on the machine, right? Because, um, but so that, that, that told me a contention. So if I introduce some delay, then I won't have this crash and more messages will get through. That was the, that was the model in our head. It could be completely wrong. It just worked anyway, but I, I don't know. But that was the idea. So essentially the introduced latency is less than this. It, the you suffer from the contention. That's the hypothesis. <laughs> if you know of who we should be talking to, I'd love to find out, but. I bring that up to okay, that'd be great, thanks. I think I have one more question. Yes, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm always facing your back. <laughs> um, so one is uh, about that um, the the last uh, comment there with like the band and the uh, yeah the message performance. It's I think this is a little, seems to me a little bit similar to something that like the EQSM crew was facing. So I don't know. If I see Noel kind of nodding his head. You might wanna you might wanna chat with. With Noel and, the, and these guys on an issue they had with sling, the, the performance on Slingshot here at NERSC and Howard, uh, it sort of got it ended up, ended up getting resolved just recently. Uh, I love that part. And we can we can maybe tell you. And <laughs> the, the the strange thing about their experience was that they also had these bands of slow slower time that was sort of uh, puzzling all of us. Yeah, yeah. The, the other thing I would say is maybe a comment about, back at the beginning of your talk, you talked about the, we had uh, somebody did the kind of hero work, hero's work of fusing these kernels together in right. one big large kernel. Right. Um, one, we've, we've seen that issue in a number of applications that we've looked at, and one thing that, that can help is the use of CUDA graphs. So Correct, know, right. But what would you do for <laughs> what would you do for the other vendors? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So AMD, I think, is maybe we'll, we'll come up with a solution, and I'm not. But they, they always lag a little bit behind. Uh, yeah, Tim was able to reproduce those curves himself, at, like within three or four days after seeing the first slide. Goes yeah. so by Monday he had already recruit, and I think he did it with CUDA graphs. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. You both. Thanks. Quick uh, lunch like announcement. So, uh, uh, so our amazing nurse admins have prepared us three delicious Mexican style food. Um, so feel free to grab one. And there's an uh, outdoor uh, patio that you can uh, find a table and find a uh, seat. And then uh, also we have a lunch uh, room here. And so yeah, please, you can choose indoor and outdoor. And to do some icebreaker, if you find our table, you can uh, discuss these topics. Uh, Every and enjoy, and we will be back at 12:40. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I'm ready whenever you guys are. Um, yeah, I just make some general. Yeah, yeah, no, take your time. I, I wasn't sure if you were waiting on me. Yeah, um, I need the mic. Yes. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, we are starting with the next session. Uh, it turns out. 45 minutes or even one hour is really short when you get talking. Um, but it's great. That's what we are aiming. That's what we are aiming to do here um, to, you know, further collaboration among everyone. Uh, so the next se session is actually kind of a second part of the application stack that we have. Um, for all the speakers that I have here, I have a couple of short announcements uh, customary before every session. When you are here at the podium, face the mic. Um, uh, and it's OK to go away from the podium as far as you are as a reasonable volume, because the ceiling mics will grab your voice. But if you go back and forth really fast or like, speak at a weird angle like that, uh, then there might be some problems. Um, so that's one thing. And uh, that's pretty much it. So uh, next, we have Marius Millet from UC Davis. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thank you guys so much for the invite. Uh, so my talk is entirely a live demo on Perlmutter, uh, which is currently degraded. <laughs> but there are backups. So we're going to see if the original thing works. And then uh, if not, we'll switch to some of the backups. Um, so this is not working. So we're not going to see a GPU monitor. But let's just see if, this, if, if the slides work, if the evaluation works. Um, so uh, my talk is about using Julia, Jupyter, and uh, GPUs together to uh, do better science and to, and to have more fun coding. Um, uh, uh, a big thanks to people uh, whose code and, and work has contributed to this in some way or another, uh, Tim Bassard and the whole CUDA.jl uh, team, as well as just Julia open source contributors, Johannes and, and Rollin here uh, at NERSC. So uh, I'm a cosmologist. And uh, what I work on, the science I work on, is, uh, is about analyzing maps of the cosmic microwave background. Um, and in particular, these are the microwaves given off by the Big Bang. Uh, we make maps of them, of the temperature. And there's little distortions in them that uh, happen because the light has been gravitationally lensed as it's traveled to us. And, and we can use these little distortions to basically figure out 
where all the dark matter is in the universe that did this little gravitational lensing. Um, in practice, this is done by uh, solving um, these uh, potentially millions of dimensional Bayesian inference problems. This is a video, which is not playing right now. Um, so we'll see when we get to the code part. Um, and our basic building blocks of, of this analysis uh, are, are, it's actually fairly simple. It's broadcasting over arrays and FFTs, perfectly suited for GPU. Uh, we've been using uh, GPUs since uh, Cori testbed days. Um, but I wanted to give you this intro, but this talk is not actually about the science, it's more about the workflow that we've developed over the last uh, five years. And so the outline will be, uh, I'll just give you some motivation why we use Julia, Jupiter, and GPUs, um, and then uh, I'll take you through this live demo, of, uh, basically what's it like to install CUDA on Perlmutter, basic and advanced usage, and then also get into multi-GPU workflows, which is, uh, you know, really why I'm here, I think, and why uh, you guys are interested in this. So Julia, uh, interactive, fast, um, uh, it's, it's uh, a fairly popular language, as you'll see, you can do a lot of things you can't do in other languages. Um, there's less boilerplate, your code looks more like the science that you're trying to do. Um, Jupyter is extremely convenient for interactive work, um, and at least in, in the sort of stuff I do and the, you know, a lot of my colleagues do, this kind of interactive, fast, iterating development workflow is, is just really, you know, uh, happens a lot. And so this combo works really well for it. Um, and you're here, so I guess this is uh, the motivation for using GPUs. So uh, what does installing Julia Uda look like? Uh, it's, it's really simple. Um, this first line is it, from having nothing, uh, this curl of this, uh, this URL, install Julia, then you run Julia, uh, open up Julia's own package manager, uh, type in add CUDA, um, for about two minutes, it'll download and install some packages, um, and I found that it just works um, uh, on nearly every cluster I've tried. This is including MERSC. Um, uh, you can set if you want. This will just take the latest version. You can pick the CUDA version if you're, you're constrained to something. Um, and uh, so this is actually not using any of NERSC's, NERSC's built-in modules, or not for the CUDA toolkit. Um, uh, Julia installs its own. And... Um, uh, so to prove this to you, I was going to evaluate this to show you that I'm not using a CUDA module. So I think NERSC is, is, is truly dead. So let me switch to my pre-evaluated <laughs> slides. Somebody go Um, so, if uh, any of the potential speakers join from the room, make sure your speaker volume is off. Yours is off too. Um, oh, I actually un unmuted. Okay, okay, got it. Um, so, uh, so here, uh, you know, as you can see, this is, you know, this, I just ran this notebook before this talk. And uh, so you can see here, there's, there's no CUDA modules uh, that are loaded. So this is really Julia's own, own CUDA toolkit. Um, and, and this is sort of the most robust way that I've found that this works. So uh, let's check everything is installed. Uh, in Julia, you do using CUDA to load the package. Um, I can call this version info thing here. You'll see that it grabbed the 12.2 uh, CUDA toolkit version. Um, there's a bunch of other versions of things here that are installed. You can see the this is uh, running on one uh, one of the nodes, so you see your four GPUs there. So now let's do some uh, really basic CUDA stuff in Julia. Uh, so I'm going to make this array of 10 million random numbers. And uh, so that's a CPU array. If I want to move it to GPU, I call CU on the array, and now it's a, it's a GPU array. Um, living in GPU memory, and now I can do stuff to it. So for example, these array broadcasts that I was saying our, our code is basically made up of here, I'm taking the sign of every entry and, and adding one. 
And this, the syntax, if you're not familiar with these funny little dots, is basically loop fusion. So it's actually going element by element and doing sign plus one as opposed to doing one more like numpy thing of like sign of this, store that, then go and add one. So let's benchmark it. Um, this is using this benchmark tools package. So uh, this is a macro to do the benchmark. Uh, this uh, synchronizes the GPU. So I'm actually timing, not just the time it takes to uh, launch the kernel, but actually get the result back. And this is, uh, this was about 83 microseconds. Um, if you're curious for comparison, a single threaded CPU version is about a thousand times uh, slower than that. So, you know, this is not a fair benchmark, but just for comparison. And uh, with Julia, you also, in recent versions, get this cool profile macro that uh, digs into a bit of what was called under the hood. So here you can see when, when uh, the sign plus one is called, there's two uh, host side uh, API calls launching a kernel and allocating memory for the result. Um, and uh, basically, and then on the device side, here's this kernel with this big, long, mangled name I don't understand. Um, that is essentially the kernel that Julia wrote for you that corresponds to sign of, of an element plus one. Um, so that's basic stuff. A lot of packages can do this kind of thing. Uh, I want to show you a few things that Julia can do that, that uh, are actually quite powerful that other things can't necessarily do. So in Julia, you can put arbitrary objects inside of uh, CUDA arrays. Uh, so here's a structure I just made. It's a point with an X and a Y. And I can put this uh, in a CUDA array um, just by making the, the CPU array of points and then moving it to GPU memory. So this is now in line in this array and GPU memory are these points, which was this structure I just defined right there. Um, and in a lot of other sort of GPU high level uh, languages, things like Jax, PyTorch, TensorFlow, um, the only things you can stick inside of CUDA arrays are the stuff they already thought of, which are usually ints, floats, and complexes and stuff. And so with, with Julia, you have this, this uh, you know, greater flexibility. And then you can write functions on this point, which look like normal code you would write. Here I'm doing the distance from the origin, so x squared plus y squared, square root. And, uh, and then you can just broadcast these over this array, um, and it works just like how you'd think it would work. Um, there are some limitations to the code that goes into something that will eventually become a, uh, a, a CUDA kernel. So for example, say that I wrote this distance function in this uh, stupider way. Um, which was to actually make an array of x squared and y squared and then call sum on it. So this will fail because um, uh, of uh, this creation of this array, which is this sort of dynamically sized object and everything that goes in these kernels has to be a static thing. So this, for example, will throw an error. And uh, there's a few limitations, um, which are not really Julia limitations, they're just limitations of how kernels work. Um, no calls to CPU functions, such as creating arrays. Uh, you can get around this by using something called static arrays. Um, and no dynamic dispatch, uh, a code should be type stable, which is uh, this Julia concept that Julia has to be able to figure out the type of everything in your function to statically compile it to kernel code. Um, but this is how you would write good Julia code anyway. Um, you can also just directly write kernels, so you don't have to give up, you know, if you really like hacking CUDA kernels, you can just write them straight from Julia. Um, uh, and so here's an example of a custom kernel. Uh, here I'm doing some, uh, some, it's computing the same sign of element plus one, but I'm going to by hand write out sort of a grid stride loop to go through the array in efficient memory order. Um, and so that involves calls to these uh, kernel API functions, block index and block dimension and, and so forth. And um, so let's make this, uh, this array again of, of 10 million elements. And now to call my kernel on it, um, I use this macro called CUDA. And you can see it's it's uh, it's it's runs and it stores the the result in this CR out function, which is gives you the same thing as you had before. So you really get the high level sort of flexibility ease, but also are able to drop down to the low level uh, really quickly, if, you know, for for more complex stuff. So okay, so now let's get to multi GPU usage, um, which is the more exciting stuff. So here. Uh, I am on this node that has uh, four 100s, and by default, uh, I'm using the first GPU. Now I can switch to just using one of the other GPUs with this, this command that you see here. And now I can run uh, this same benchmark of this sine x plus one thing. Um, if I'd had the GPU monitor uh, 
uh, running. Um, you know, if this was a real thing, you could see sort of the GPU usage. You know, the, the first GPU would now be working, not the zero with one. Um, but basically, you can switch between GPUs in, in this way. This will be irrelevant. Um, so, okay, so you can manually switch between GPUs. How do you actually easily just use a lot of GPUs? And Julia gives you a couple of ways, processes, tasks, or threads. Um, and in my experience, just having been doing this for a while, the most robust and easy way um, uh, is per process. So you're gonna make one Julia process for each GPU. And to uh, create and spawn Julia processes, you use this distributed uh, library. And here I'm gonna add three workers. So I'll have the main one running this guy and then three workers for the four total GPUs. And you can see that by default when they're spawned. So here I, I've just evaluated the packages on each of the workers and then I'm gonna have each of the workers print their, their process ID basically and then the device they're currently using which by default starts off as that same GPU zero. Um, and so then I can just tell each of them to use an, in, uh, a unique GPU by just uh, setting it to the, their ID minus one in this case. And so now I look at this again, and now I see process one is using GPU zero, process two, one, and, and so on and so forth. So now I've kind of got this set up, you know, each process has its own GPU. And so now let's run that benchmark in parallel across, across a bunch of GPUs. Uh, so the code is going to look like this. Um, I uh, create this uh, array that's the input, the random 10 million numbers. Um, the reason it's in the slut block is for some uh, Julia scoping reasons. Um, and the function to map something over the different available workers is called pmap. And so I do this pmap uh, over four, uh, you know, four index, indexes basically, each one will go to one of the workers and I can run this benchmark. And you'll see here printed that, you know, there were four benchmarks run in parallel. They all took the same amount of time and uh, we get the result for arrays back here. And there's a couple of things happening here that maybe if on first glance you, you didn't notice, but this, uh, this array was defined on the master process, the first GPU, um, and somehow it's, it automatically got passed to the worker processes, which then you know, applied this operation to it. And so that is something that Julia does. It automatically sends, um, uh, it can automatically send the needed data back and forth between uh, the different GPUs, and then also send the result back to the master process, which is what you see displayed here. So this is quite convenient. Um, uh, in doing so, in the way that this is done here, it did actually pass through CPU memory. So this is not the most efficient, but as you can see here, it's, it's super easy. Uh, if you wanna go straight GPU to GPU, you can use uh, unified memory. Um, there's essentially a flag to this CU command that puts it on unified memory uh, and then it lets the CUDA backend take care of sort of the memory uh, dispersion to different nodes um, uh, or to different GPUs. Uh, or you can do CUDA MPI transport, which is an example later in the stock. So, okay, uh, that was four GPUs on one node. Say you want to do multiple GPUs on, you know, some number of nodes um, from a notebook. So there's this cluster managers package. Uh, and you instantiate this uh, cluster manager that um, uh, that essentially takes care of connecting workers to it. Um, there's a little bit of sort of NERSC specific boilerplate here, um, but you could just copy this from this talk. And then you get this, this uh, manager object, and then you can go and just submit a regular job. Um, so here's an example command. Um, uh, it's just submitting some job with, uh, with eight nodes, is, which is cut off from here. It, anyway, this was an, an eight node job. Uh, and from within this job, you can just run the command that's printed here. And that command will just connect a worker back to this notebook uh, and eventually print out all of these connected workers. So now you see this uh, 32 extra GPUs that are connected to this notebook. So it's, it goes up to 36 because we also have the four from the, just from the node itself. And now when you have these different GPUs across different nodes, it's a little more complex to like map each one to each process to each GPU. Uh, there's some functions in, in some packages that will do this for you. This one is uh, this call to assign GPU workers. And now you see all of your different processes, um, uh, each one having this unique GPU. And we can run this parallel benchmark again. Um, and you'll see 
uh, you know, all of them sort of doing this work in parallel. So uh, that was connecting stuff back to a, uh, a notebook. What if you want to do just some sort of batch MPI type jobs? Uh, you can do this with um, uh, you, using these libraries MPI, um, basically using this library MPI. And um, essentially you're just adding MPI and MPI preferences. Uh, and then there's some NERSC specific configuration right here, which works uh, thanks to, uh, among others, help from uh, Johannes here at NERSC. And then you can write these job scripts. This is a little cut off, uh, or I have to scroll through it so you can see it. But you can put essentially a Slurm script and a Julia script in one file, so it's more convenient. Uh, and with a little bit of boilerplate, now you can connect all of these MPI workers and then pmap over them or do whatever you'd like. Um, here, when you do this, actually the memory movement between the GPUs just automatically happens with CUDA MPI transport, and so it'll be, it'll be faster than uh, going through CPU like you saw before. And to round up my talk, coming back to notebooks, uh, you might think, well, that's a cop-out because there at the end, you know, we're just running batch scripts, but there's, there's nice ways that you can essentially use uh, code in a notebook from a script. Um, so imagine you had some section in a notebook, it had some code, like, again, this parallel uh, uh, call. There's a few packages, one of them is called parameterized notebooks that lets you just load up a notebook as, um, uh, load up the code in a notebook, select a section out of the notebook, such as the one that I just showed on the previous slide, and then run that, just almost like copy pasting that code. And you can do this from inside one of these scripts. So now instead of actually having your code here, sorry, it's just a call to whatever is the code in the notebook. And uh, so with a little bit of care, managing of your sections, you can really iterate on code in the notebook. You can test it in parallel on the fly using these elastic workers. Uh, and then if you want at the end, submit it as a MPI job for even larger scale or just more, uh, more batch type runs. And so that's a lot of what we've been doing and, and it's, this workflow has worked uh, fairly well. So to conclude, um, this Julia plus Jupyter plus GPU, I think, offers some of a very powerful scientific workflow. It's certainly not for everyone's problem, but um, for the kind of stuff we're working on, it's worked very well. Um, hopefully some of what I shared is useful. And um, a, a wish list of random th little things that could make this even better, uh, I list here, but I'll, I'll let you read it and say thank you. We have time for maybe one or two small questions. Under your wish list, could you elaborate on that second bullet there? Yeah, so um, the way to get Julia to, to uh, um, yeah, the, the way to get the sort of MPI aware, sorry, CUDA aware MPI functioning in, uh, in Julia, you have to launch the job with, uh, with SRUN. And so since there's not really a way to S run the kernel, or maybe you wouldn't know, I mean, you, you could probably hack the kernel JSON or something to make it do that instead, but then you're locked into a certain number of nodes. Um, so there's, uh, there's, not, there's not a super easy way to do it. You sort of, I think, need kind of like a controller type architecture where like the kernel actually connects to like one process within an actual running MPI pool or, or maybe something like that. Yeah, but, that, was, that was what I was going to say is that that's the kind of typical model for like IPI parallel or exactly. any of these that's sort of, I, I don't know of a flop. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. As far as I know, that doesn't exist, yeah. but it would be something that, that would be useful. Is there a Zoom question um, from specific to Marius? Okay. I was wondering, Asynchronous kernel execution, or is everything? Like how much support does that be? Transfers over and all that stuff. Yeah. So um, uh, I believe, as of recent CUDA versions, uh, memory operations are asynchronous. Um, and then the way the model works is that within a Julia task, um, all the kernel launches are synchronous. Um, but then you can use multiple tasks or different threads running different tasks, and and without using multiple processes, 
uh, you can you can still get you know overlap of kernels and, and stuff like this. And so I didn't get into that here at all. Um, it works. It's actually the it's actually this number one on my wish list, uh, which is that it uh, it's not quite as robust as this as this pro process thing that I was showing, but it's certainly workable if you're willing to to kind of go into it a bit. Hmm? Um, we're running a slightly bit of time, so thank you. But thanks, uh, Marius, thank you. and feel thank free you. to you know follow up offline. Next, we have Brandon Wood from Meta. Can I either steal one of these? Uh, are you low on? Oh, yeah. Sure. Is that okay? Actually, can I see my mouse on here quick? I guess I can. Okay. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. I'm Brandon Wood. I'm a scientist on the fundamental AI research team at Meta. Previously, I was a NESAP for learning postdoc at NERSC here at NERSC. So it's, it's really exciting to be back here and see a bunch of familiar faces. Also, some new faces. Um, today, my talk is going to be about accelerating molecular discovery with AI, kind of through the lens of the Open Catalyst project. So, the Open Catalyst project started as a collaboration between Carnegie Mellon University and FAIR. It's now expanded to include the University of Toronto and Georgia Tech. And for those of you that are not familiar with the project, the goal is to use AI to model uh, and discover new catalysts to address energy challenges posed by climate change. Our team is particularly focused on discovering catalysts for renewable energy storage through CO2 reduction or by producing green hydrogen. So I want to start by thinking about how, how we discover new materials or new catalysts. Traditionally, materials discovery has been done using researcher expertise and trial and error. The process can require a lot of iterations, which are usually slow and expensive. And kind of because of these constraints, we can only probe just a small number of the materials experimentally. And a problem with this approach is just that the chemical design space is huge. So there's just there's no way that we can experimentally test everything. So what we'd like to do is use computational methods to screen materials, just passing on the most promising co candidates for synthesis and testing. Um, this approach would enable us to explore much more of the total design space. And if we kind of zoom in and look at our computational toolkit, uh, there's methods that span different, um, different length scales, different time scales. Today, I'm gonna be focused on uh, density functional theory DFT for short. Uh, DFT scales is the number of electrons cubed, uh, so it's quite expensive. And to just kind of give you some perspective on this, um, this is the, the top algorithms um, among NERSC codes used in 2018. So about 30% of all scientific HPC resources are used um, to run DFT calculations like what I'm going to be talking about today. And um, just to kind of give you an idea, for, um, for those that are not familiar, uh, de um, the inputs to DFT are the atomic numbers and the 3D atomic positions, and the output um, is just an energy and usually the parameters forces. This is a bit simplified, but it'll work. Okay, so how can DFT be used to actually screen catalysts? 
Well, an important quantity for screening catalysts is the adsorption energy, or how strongly a molecule referred to as the adsorbate interacts with the catalyst surface. Um, we don't want it to be too strong. We also don't want it to be too weak. Uh, we need to find kind of that Goldilocks region, region where it's just right. Uh, and this is an example by Zong et al, where they use uh, CO and hydrogen adsorption energies to screen um, for CO2 reduction catalysts, and actually found a good candidate that was experimentally promising. So just what I want you to take away from this slide is that simple descriptors can be used to, to actually screen catalysts. Um, and next, I'm going to briefly describe how you would calculate the adsorption energy. Um, one of the challenges of computing the adsorption energy uh, of an adsorbate uh, on a given catalyst surface is that it's a global optimization problem. And so to illustrate this, this is kind of an idealized potential energy surface of an adsorbate on a catalyst. And what we usually do is we place an adsorbate on different sites on the surface, and you can see here one, two, and three, those are different, different ways of placing the adsorbate on top of the surface. And you can put on a different side or you can slightly rotate the adsorbate. Um, we usually do this using intuition and heuristics. Then we run DFT relaxations to find local energy minimums. And finally, we take the global minimum energy as the adsorption energy for this adsorbate surface combination. You can see it's marked with the, uh, the star. And one of the things you might notice is that if we take a brute force approach to just placing adsorbates, um, it requires a lot of relaxations, which, as I mentioned, DFT is expensive to run. So diving a little bit deeper into what a relaxation is, basically we start with an initial high energy structure. Uh, then using DFT, atoms are, are allowed to, um, they're allowed to exert forces on each other until they're near zero. And then our final state is our relaxed low energy structure. And for the systems that we're interested in, one relaxation takes about 24 hours. So one question we can ask to try and put numbers to it is, how many relaxations are needed to screen one material for um, CO2, CO2 reduction reaction, which is something we're interested in? So for one material, there's about 90 different ways to cut it, so 90 surfaces. Uh, for CO2RR, there's five adsorbates that we're interested in. And there's about, uh, for each adsorbate, we do about 100 placements per surface. So that's about 45,000 relaxations. And so if we were to use this using DFT alone, it would take 120 CPU years, which is, I mean, that's huge. And this is just for one material. So this is where machine learning comes in. Uh, we want to approximate DFT with machine learning models um, to greatly reduce the time it takes to perform a relaxation, going from 24 hours to around a second. Um, and this would greatly expand the, numbers, uh, the number of materials that we can actually explore. Towards our goal of reducing DFT, we created the Open Catalyst 2020 dataset. Um, it's the largest and most diverse catalyst dataset to date with around 1.3 million DFT relaxations. Um, this equates to about 130 million training examples, um, and it, it required a lot of compute to make this data set. But um, in addition to the, the actual data set, we defined tasks, we released baseline models, and we started a community challenge. Uh, similar, similarly, in 2022, um, we created an oxide electrocatalysis data set. Okay, I just want to quickly go through some of the tasks that we formulated, and the idea here is just to capture kind of day-to-day -day, um, catalyst applications. So the first one is, um, if you're given a structure, predict the energy and the forces of that structure. So um, for short, it's S2EF. And this is basically a surrogate to DFT. Um, there's a couple other tasks, but I think the only one that I want to focus on is just IS2RE. Uh, which is basically taking the initial structure and predicting the relaxed energy. So there's a couple ways to do this. You can just directly uh, predict the relaxed energy. What we, what we found to be more effective is you take the initial structure, 
you use your ML potential to compute the forces, and then iteratively, you update the atoms positions based on those forces. You end up with your relaxed structure, you use your model to predict the, the relaxed energy. So currently, all of our top performing models are graph neural networks. Um, and part of this is because graphs are just a natural fit for atomic systems. Um, in our graphs, nodes represent atoms and edges represent connections with neighboring atoms. Typically, we use both node and edge embeddings based on properties such as uh, atomic numbers and the distance between atoms. These embeddings are updated and refined through message passing um, and ultimately used to predict the energy and per atoms forces of the system. So next, I want to introduce some of our top performing models by talking about how they encode geometric information. So um, first is GemNet OC. The architecture, as you can see, looks kind of complicated, but the ideas behind it are relatively simple. Basically, it looks at um, pairs of atoms, the distance between pairs of atoms, the angle between triplets, and the dihedral angle between quadruplets. And for those of you familiar, this looks similar to like a classical potential. <clears throat> One of the challenges uh, of designing GNNs for atomic systems is just respecting the underlying symmetries of the physical, um, uh, the underlying symmetries and physical properties of the, of the problem. So some of my colleagues recently introduced the uh, Equivariant Spherical Channel Network, or ESCN. Uh, at the time, ESCN was state-of-the-art or on par for, for all of OC20 tasks. Um, ESCN introduced a new um, equivariant convolution that reduced the com uh, computational complexity, um, allowing for higher resolution representations, which led to uh, better performance. So this model Takes, takes advantage of um, spherical, uh, the, the special rotational properties of spherical harmonics, um, and they also provide a, a rich geometric representation of the system. Even more recently, in May, uh, we released a model called Equiformer V2 in collaboration with Yilun Lau and Tess Schmidt from MIT. It demonstrated uh, state-of-the-art performance on most of OC20 tasks, um, it, it leverages the ESCN convolution, and it's a transformer architecture similar to what's used in, in language models. OK, jumping to some results. Uh, there's been a lot of progress this far. So this is a plot of the IS2RE task, so taking the initial structure and predicting the relaxed energy. Um, since our initial baselines. So this is kind of over time. And in a couple of years, basically, we've seen about a 50% reduction in the energy ME. And even with all of this progress, uh, there's still work to be done. So you can see the, the dashed line on the bottom is the target accuracy that we'd like to achieve, which is 0 0.1 EV. So I think kind of a, a natural question would be, um, if you're if you're not at kind of the target accuracy for these systems or what would be considered um, chemically accurate how practically useful are these models so at the beginning of the talk i kind of walked through how um, the absorption energy is calculated um, with this kind of workflow and really the bottleneck here is dft relaxations so what we've done is we replace that with using ML relaxations followed by some amount of DFT, trying to really reduce the amount of DFT needed. And here are the results. So there's kind of a lot packed into this plot, but um, we can start with kind of looking at the, the upper left, that black star, that is the um, random plus heuristic DFT. So this is if we were to run DFT across everything that we tested, which is a thousand systems, a thousand adsorbate surface systems, um, what would the performance look like in terms of success rate and then also speed up? Um, let's see if I can. So I think what we can focus on first. Yeah. Um, I talked about ESCN, and so 
we look at that model and we first look at ML plus RX, which is machine learning plus a full DFT relaxation, um, you can see that we're about 90% success rate and the speed up is a little over 100x, which is good. But what we also realized in doing this is that actually our ML relaxed structures are, are quite good. Maybe the energy prediction needs a little help, but like the structures are good. And so what we did is instead of doing a full relaxation, we just ran single points. Um, and that reduces the compute that you need by a lot. And so um, kind of our best, most balanced result, I would say, is about 2000 X speed up at about 87% success rate, um, which really enables us to screen a lot more materials. Now that I've talked a little bit about how practically useful the models are, how can, how can you actually access some of our models? And there's a hierarchy here um, in terms of uh, difficulty, I guess. So the first is a web demo or web GUI. Um, and my, some of my colleagues, Kyle Michelle and Abhishek Das, have worked a lot on this. So I'm, I'm gonna quickly um, show a video of this. Okay, so what you do here is you first select the bulk using the MPID. Next, what you're gonna do is select, um, so you can cut that bulk different ways. So you're gonna select the surface or the Miller index you're interested in. Then you select the adsorbate. And currently we support two, two models on this. And so the next part is uh, which takes a little second here, but uh, it's selecting the model. So we have Gemnet OC or Equiformer V2. Um, you can also check to make sure the structure, structures look realistic. So we're doing a bunch of placements, maybe on average 60 per surface. Um, and then we, it returns the minimum energy structure. So this would be, this would be uh, the adsorption energy. You take the adsorption energy from this, but it also returns all the other structures you can visualize them and look at the relaxation trajectory. Also, you gotta remember, if you go and play with this, make sure to hit refresh, because sometimes it doesn't load the, the, what's already been done. Okay, the next way to, to access the models is using um, the Open Catalyst Python API. Um, and this is for folks who maybe like the demo, but they want to run it on more systems, they want to access it using programmatically. Um, so this is coming very soon, um, maybe even this week or, or early next week. So basically what you do here is uh, it's just a simple pip install um, and then with uh, basically one line of code, you can run the same thing that I just showed you. So you specify the adsorbate, you specify um, the, the bulk in your uh, materials project ID. And that, so that is coming very soon, which I think should be exciting. Uh, the last way to kind of access our models is if you have the resources and the know-how, all of our code is open source, all of our model checkpoints are open source. So you can go to our GitHub repository and um, and run, run the things uh, yourself. Okay, I'm pretty much out of time here, but just very quickly, you know, there's a number of future directions we're interested in. I think the one that, that I would point to is working more closely with experimentalists. Um, so I think we're, yeah, we're really excited about tying more closely with what we're doing with experimentalists and kind of getting into some feedback loop um, to improve upon these models. So with that, um, I would say that large open data sets for catalysis have enabled rapid progress on key benchmarks like the uh, IS2RE task. Um, next, ML potentials have progressed to the point where they're practically useful. And this is across a wide range of chemical space. So this is not a model just trained on a single um, system of interest. It's trained across many different systems 
and it performs well across, like I said, a large amount of chemical space. Um, a third, OCP models are open and available for anyone to use, so please try them out. Uh, with that, I'll leave, I'll put up the links to our website, the demo, the code. Feel free to connect with us, provide feedback on the discussion board, and then I know I zoomed through a bunch of stuff, so if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me uh, at my email. Thank you. All right. Uh, a couple of questions already. Can you say anything about the, is there something that's true about the ones that misses? Um, is there any general category they fit in, something that's... Yeah, I would say in OC20, uh, it doesn't do particularly well if sort of more organic type um, materials. And so it, it seems that there's just probably, there's probably less of that data in the training set. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, on one of your slides, you listed the so a full relaxation, and the metrics said that it had a 20,000 times speed up and an 87% success rate. Could you repeat the question for me? Sure, yeah. She was asking, uh, I can maybe pull up that slide quick. When I went over some results, uh, this slide, yeah. She's asking, like, what is success, um, which I didn't really define. So uh, basically, this is, so we run our ML model, and then we run DFT after that. We're either running a full relaxation or a single point. And what we do is we, we say, is that DFT energy within um, 0.01 EV of the, um, of the, the full DFT baseline for that given system. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's like a, it's a tolerance of 0 0.1 EV. Um, I mean, I would say, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I don't know. I don't think they're massively off, but like there's some distribution of, of how they, they yeah. fail. Have you tried relaxing any of those fatal points to see if they then fall back into the, into the middle? Uh, I mean like relaxing them. With full DFT. Well, I guess that's what we're doing here. Like basically this is taking the ML relaxation and then running a full DFT relaxation so after that. stopping, but still is away from the energy. Like yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there is some, like, if you had a perfect ML model, it would exactly reproduce these numbers, right? But there's some noise in these models, and so maybe it finds a slightly different minimum. Yeah. Is it okay to follow up during the school? Thank you. Uh, yeah, let's thank the speaker. Next, we have Sherry Lee from Berkeley Lab and talking about uh, the impact of ECP on math library. All right, ready to go? Thank you. Uh, so maybe you give me five minutes of warning. Uh, uh, yes, I will. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, uh, particularly GPU for, for today's uh, uh, audience, how the seven years investment of uh, ECP have impacted uh, the mathematical libraries in this uh, landscape. Uh, so ECP is a, a big project. It covers a lot of areas. So on the very top level, uh, you can see that there are applications, software technology, hardware, and integration. So three big uh, top areas. And then we are in this uh, software technology. Uh, even software technology has several aspects. Uh, for example, programming model, performance tools, etc. So the talk of today is the math libraries in the software technology. And uh, mathematical libraries have a um, in general have a lot of uh, functionalities. So it's not a single or several uh, small set of uh, packages that can cover a lot of uh, features. So if you look at the uh, landscape, the, uh, the portfolio in ECP math library, there are seven project teams. 
And within each team, there might be multiple uh, products. So altogether, there are 15 products, 15, 15 packages. And if you look at the description here, I'm not going to read all of them, but uh, it covers uh, pretty much uh, most of the uh, needs from uh, simulation modeling and even uh, machine learning. So for example, this uh, Tasman Tasmania, it has uh, uh, uncertainty quantification, surrogate modeling, very useful for uh, machine learning. And then linear solver, nonlinear solver, um, time integrator, uh, PDE uh, level of discretization, et cetera, it's all there. And a lot of these are for sparse uh, irregular uh, matrices. And then taking together the uh, uh, application codes on the left side here, a lot of them, and on the right side, uh, mathematical libraries. And you can see that when we started the, this ECP, and look at each application code, for example, XAM, it's not just using one library. So that's a bigger challenge, right? It's uh, all these libraries, somehow you need to be coordinated to work together instead of uh, just, uh, you know, function by yourself or doing installation yourself. So that's one of the first things we did is uh, to develop this uh, uh, XSDK um, collection. So this is actually a methodology, XSDK. It's not just uh, you know, putting together you know, all, all things you can just join. In order to be in XSDK, you need to satisfy this uh, community policy, which everyone agrees upon. So for example, I can just single out uh, uh, some uh, policy here. So for example, if you do MPI computation, then you need uh, your package needs to use the MPI communicator. You cannot use the MPI com world. Because when, if you use the com world, when you are used by other multiple packages, the messages will be confused, which, pa which, which library it belongs to. So that's one of the first thing we realize that this is very important. And also there's uh, the policy about uh, uh, open source license. We require every package in here is open source. And then we have uh, require every package has a test suite to be able to do uh, continue uh, uh, integration testing, et cetera. So there's a set of a mandatory one and a set of uh, recommended one. And then um, if you look at the before ECP and now after seven years, certainly this is growing, right? And also the uh, dependencies are growing. They are all interconnected in some way. So in the before ECP, there were original packages as only four. Now there are 26 math libraries plus a couple of other. And this diagram shows you where the math libraries. Are. So for example, MFAM is more like high level finite element packages. It's more like at the top uh, higher level and underneath it needs to call several lower level say linear algebra operation. Okay, so this uh, uh, table is interesting. It's uh, uh, mainly because uh, uh, for ECP machines, uh, they are uh, based on the AMD and the Intel GPU. It's not uh, the uh, NVIDIA GPU, the two ECP machines. So we always track this. Uh, uh, you can see the two columns, AMD and uh, uh, Intel. And in fact, all these uh, libraries, uh, they were already ready for NVIDIA before they were ready for AMD. So the NVIDIA column is not, not relevant here. So what we were tr uh, tracking over the years is the ECP early uh, access system readiness in terms of this several metric. And this was the snapshot uh, taken from uh, January of uh, this year. So you can see that these uh, 15 packages Aside, uh, except for lib ensemble, which is not uh, applicable for uh, computing, it's more like organized uh, computation. So it's not applicable. All of them, they, were, they are ready. They were ready even by January for AMD, and they were in progress for the Intel GPU. And then the installation method, they all renovated. Before was some single, you know, make file editing stuff. Now it's all renovated, automatic, mostly CMake. And most of them, they are uh, E4S uh, spec ready on the, at least on the uh, uh, AMD machine and the NVIDIA for sure. Yeah, so the, uh, for uh, Intel, it's uh, still in progress. So in the uh, rest, uh, how many minutes? Like uh, 10 minutes. I'll talk about uh, two aspects. One is uh, portability. 
uh, for different GPU, another one is the performance. I'll give you some highlights. So portability, one of the uh, good uh, mechanism for the bigger packages they take is to use the cocos and cocos kernels. This is uh, very natural for bigger packages. For smaller packages, single purpose package, you can do some uh, you know, manual. Say if it's AMD, do, do the, if it's NVIDIA, do the uh, NVIDIA CUDA thing, or AMD, do HIP and SQL. But for the large packages, usually they use the COCO, COCOs. So co this is the COCO entire the ecosystem. It gives you an abstract uh, layer for the GPU programming. And they provide uh, you know, the uh, parallel execution, et cetera, lower level interface with the multiple G types of uh, GPUs. And then COCOS kernels is the math library. So that has the linear algebra kernels and also have graph kernels. And they use the COCOS, the, this the COCOS ecosystem. And this COCOS kernel from math library point of view, it's just a kernel. So it, it, it's not a, you know, uh, it's used to build a higher level thing. So for example, Trilinos is a very big, uh, a package to do the uh, sparse linear algebra operation uh, and uh, many other uh, operations. So in the ECP uh, work, Chinese focuses on these uh, four packages, like iterative solver, multi-grid, and interface to direct solver, et cetera. And their underneath portable layer is using Cocos kernels. Okay, so at a higher level, these package developers, they actually just access Cocos kernels. They are, they can be automatically using all these different uh, um, uh, GPU. So this figure shows some performance uh, plot of using one to uh, 18 GPUs on three different uh, machine. One is Summit, one is Spark, and uh, or two, two are, and another one is uh, Crusher. So you can, and this is integrated into the uh, Naru Wind, is one of the uh, Exa Wind project, one of the uh, uh, application codes mm -hmm. in uh, Excel Win, and so you can see that the you know across different uh, GPUs you get a good performance uh, going down this. Uh... So then another pa big package is Pet C Tau. You probably heard of this. Uh, it's also a PDE uh, uh, related uh, uh, interface for for solving you know large scale PDE simulation problem. And Tau is a big application. Uh, uh, package. So what they do here, they also, they do have some of their system uh, vendor specific, say CUDA support, uh, HIP support, uh, OpenCL, etc. But the most portable layer, they still rely on Cocos kernels. And then they have uh, separate views from the user point of view on the top and on the bottom is their developers view. So they could have, uh, you know, matrices, uh, vectors packaged uh, using different uh, kind of for programming languages or uh, systems, the user can use those. But then internally, all these uh, matrices, uh, vectors, so they have their internal operations so with optimization. All right, so I'll spend some time, the rest of time talking about the uh, uh, two new activities, which is very uh, specific to GPU because of their, you know, these two aspects, uh, on CPU, you don't get any benefit. So one is uh, multi-precision. This started uh, uh, three years ago. And another one is batched uh, sparse linear algebra. This is started uh, uh, two years ago. And this is motivated from the GPU because uh, uh, for, for the multi-precision, a lot of uh, GPU hardware now can do lower precision much faster. But on CPU, single double, it's roughly the same speed. So that's why it's not so critical. And for the batch, it's really also coming from the applications. So we have a lot of applications which has a smaller matrices, linear systems, is a several hundred by several hundred. And if you just solve this one by one, suppose they have a hundred of them, you can loop them, solve them one by one, then your GPU is pretty much, you know, very much underutilized. But then if you do them as a batch, you can use, you know, on the batch level, you increase another axis of uh, parallelism. So this is the result from Ginkgo's uh, library. Ginkgo is the uh, new library, which uh, did not exist before ECP. And also Coco's kernel did not exist uh, before ECP. So then it's not, nothing. Now it's a big performance. 
And uh, so this is uh, uh, the result of Ginkgo's various uh, iterative solvers. It's integrated uh, in this uh, XGC code, and this is the uh, plasma uh, simulation code to model this uh, tokamak structure, and it's doing the edge modeling, uh, edge calculation, this particular application code. And they, they have a batch size, number of linear system can go up to 600, at least for this uh, usage pattern. And then each color here corresponds to one type of uh, GPU. So you can compare the performance you know, between the red, for example, of different uh, solvers. And then you can see that even for, for each uh, color, each one particular GPU, using the batch, when you increase the batch count, you can get uh, more than 10 to 10x uh, speed up. So it's order of magnitude uh, faster. And then the different colors and different this tick, they will mix. It's mainly because depending on the situation, your sparse format could be different. Which format would be uh, use more relevant? It's more faster. It's different. All right. So the next uh, couple of slides is about a mixed precision, and this is actually very well uh, illustrated in these two charts. On the left is the AMD GPU, and here you see that they have this FP32ME is their matrix core hardware, and the performance is a lot better, maybe twice as fast as single or double precision. Okay, so then you can see that putting this into the dense LU, you get more than 2x speed up. And on the right is the NVIDIA is even more pronounced the speed difference. So they have this uh, tensor uh, float, TF32. It's uh, almost uh, you know, eight times faster than the single or double precision on GPU. And then you get a huge speed up in dense LU. So that's the dense case. In sparse case, the performance gain is less pronounced, but you still get some benefit. So for example, here we use a, a for sparse direct solver, use a mixed precision iterative refinement. And for sparse iterative solver, GMRES, use mixed, uh, mixed precision. Even with uh, here with the 48 uh, uh, GPUs, you can still see some benefit with uh, using this uh, uh, algorithm. So the last slide I want to show is uh, two aspects here. One is uh, from uh, when you do the very uh, memory intensive operation, this particular case is a sparse triangular solve. The difficulty here is a very low arithmetic intensity, it's order one. So basically you, your arithmetic is each uh, element, you just do one operation. And the high task dependency, so that's the, uh, really the enemy for the parallel computing. So, so let's say uh, on the left, I'm showing you for the uh, traditional uh, 2D configuration of the processes uh, as a PXPY. And then we, to, in order to do multiple GPU, the traditional algorithm actually does not give much benefit. So what we did is using this NVHMEM, which is a direct uh, GPU to GPU communication. And also it provides one-sided communication. You do put and get instead of uh, send receive. So we are able, in this case, we are able on summit to get a roughly 12 uh, GPU get some uh, speed up. This is two nodes. On one node, it's relatively faster. It's uh, better, but uh, on, across nodes, it's already very difficult. So strong scaling can only, you know, for this problem on this machine, it's only 12 GPU. That's your limit. So the, the last aspect I want to show using this example is uh, during the ECP, we actually have to uh, redesign algorithm. So here, we developed a 3D process grid algorithm to replicate a little bit of uh, memory data to avoid communication. So that's the idea here. So this is a brand new algorithm. And then you can see that uh, with this algorithm, we are able to use the 256 GPU. This is on ProMatter. And the, the way to read this is uh, uh, each color corresponding the third dimension is different uh, uh, configuration. So let's focus on the last one, this uh, purple one. PZ direction is six, 64 CPU or 64 GPU. And then you can see that uh, if you, first the uh, PZ, if it's one two-dimensional case, you can only 
scale up to four, you can only use four. But with this PZ equals to 64, you can use all the GPU up to 256 going down. So that's the message here. I just stop here. Any questions? Yeah. All right. So when you talk about the SDK, one of the biggest values I see from the software technology applications is this work for interoperability and standardization. Have you thought about how one would uh, do testing to confirm that interoperability when you have GPU offload is still maintained? Because it seems like it'd be very easy to, as time goes on, for you know people to touch memory in such a way that it's a different code. So if there's a programming model, it might step on that. Yeah, so that, that's a, actually a very good question. So when we do the, for XSDK testing right now, we very often we don't enable GPU. For, for the testing to pass, uh, you know, to pass test before the release. And then when problem comes up, then we'll trace uh, which package got problem or something. So that's, that's a still a uh, very hard question. It's, uh, I think it's mainly because the uh, mechanism underneath each package using GPU, it's uh, still very non-uniform. You know, if everybody say use uh, Cocos kernels, it seems uh, simple, but it's, uh, you know, these large packages, they use Cocos kernel, but a lot of uh, smaller ones still has their hand in if that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Do we have any specific questions on Zoom or Shade? I have one more, Shade. Have you, are you aware of any speed up with mixed precision for geometric packages? So your smart solvers were yes, a lot yes. Less. I didn't put in the slides. They they do have uh, some speed up. I forgot it's uh, some. It's probably around two, not no more than two x maybe. Oh, but the people got two x. No, probably not. Yeah. So so the uh, for mixed precision, the dense ones uh, got very good speed right. up. But the uh, sparse one usually I would say in the range from twenty to fifty or something. Yeah, uh, twenty to fifty percent. Do you see a value or use in, in, in starting to add applications to something like this? That X SDK, I think a lot of apps are putting in stack packages now, right? Trying to make it easier to build and try to make sure that their application works across this whole automatically tested system. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, so if I understand your question, you are saying applications that link together with the XSDK. Yeah, I'm curious if there's if there's value in that, right? If, if, or, or or more code design uh, libraries, right? Like Yeah. So you know, XSDK itself is very big. Usually we consider the usage pattern is uh, maybe NERSC, for example, install XSDK and the application will access uh, the five packages you need instead of for you to install everything. It's uh, actually quite demanding to do the installation, testing, everything. Yeah. Do you think the application community would benefit from adopting community policies in the same way in terms of sort of standardization of development practices? But the application community is also a bunch of cats, so trying to get them all to do the exact same thing is something they don't really fit together. Right. Okay. And an app developer, I want that. No, and yeah, a user. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah. 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 Do you have a last question, Excel? Or? Sorry if I repeat the chorus, but we used XSDK as a preprint to try to get the same thing for our application at least. Because we have like people from and they're developing different parts of an accelerator and being actually able to use them together is, is not trivial. Right. But already the work you did, I just want to say, it's like tremendously helped us. I mean, it's more than just MPI communicators these days in the like GPU yeah. context, right? That's For example, right. who decides to spawn more, uh, more, more streams on the GPU is something that we totally interact with Slate and other people in, in XSDK to, to make sure we don't have, after calling to a math library, suddenly twice the resources allocated. Right. So yeah. that's, that's a tremendous effort. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah. And also, you know, mentally in the past, uh, application people try to get ownership of all these uh, math uh, functions. Uh, say we develop, uh, then we have ownership, we know how to maintain. But with this uh, mechanism, it's much easier. So you get high performance. And also a lot of these uh, algorithms are not easy to, to, to write anymore. You know, in the old days, CG, everyone can write CG, but not everyone can write a low rank of sparse direct solver. <laughs> All right, let's thank Sherry. <laughs> Next up, we have Anne Andrin and Weijin Zhang talking about all things AMRX. Yeah, I have your slides. Okay. 
So we decided because LBL is all about team science, we were going to do a team presentation. But, um, so the chair gave a great overview of the math library space in ECP. AMRX lived in that, that intermediate space where we were technically under the AD, the application development. So for another two and a half months, I get to call you one of our fearless leaders. Um, and then we will thank you for your service. Um, so, so, so AMRX was the name of a co-design center was the block structured AMR co-design center, um, also the name of the software product, which you know Sherry alluded to. AMRX did not exist before ECP did, so that was seven some years ago. And I remember us standing and filling a whiteboard, we say, "Oh my God, what's this going to look like?" And we got to run GPUs. How many? And you know, it was just it was kind of a pie in the sky, and it's amazing to look back now. Um, so what I just wanted to touch on, and then AMRX, uh, then Wei Chen's going to do the serious part, is so so. And it's AMRX or AMRX, depending on what you feel like saying. So AMRX is a software framework. That's what we decided. It's not a library, it's a framework. It enables people to build applications more quickly. Um, we're in the space of hierarchical structured meshes. So as long as there's some sense of a structured mesh discretization of typically physical space, then AMRX can provide a lot of the tools. Because it turns out there are a lot of things that every structured mesh code does. Things like filling Halo or Go cells, parallel communication between whether you call them subdomains or patches or grids or boxes. There are all these things. So this is a spell. Like I said, this is a selection. This is not complete. The blue ones here are ones that were part of ECP projects that have gone and met their KPPs. Um, we were part of six to seven, depending on how you count it, different ECP application projects. We're part of now going forward five. SIDAC 5 projects, three Brave projects, those are the DOE space, these are all funding mechanisms, three Brave projects, uh, a couple earth shots here and there. So AMRX doesn't do science, but AMRX enables science. One of the other things I want to show is there's the traditional, so there's a Warpex picture, a Castro and Nix. Um, then there's this map of the United States, which is not exactly a spatial uh, uniform discretization. That's actually one of the things that came out at, at the end was I was reminiscing, and in the beginning, we were all about meshes. Everything was data on meshes. And somebody said, well, can we have some particles flying around? Yeah, sure, we can add some particles. And they were really second-class citizens that we kind of added. And now, seven years later, particles are absolutely first-class citizens. And in fact, ExaEpi, which came about when somebody said, hey, could you use your particles to be an agent-based model for epidemiology? And if you know me well enough, you know my answer is, of course we can, sure. So now there's a code called ExaEpi that's the basis for three different uh, DOE modeling projects to be able to, you know, where, where one particle is typically one person, although you can aggregate. Uh, so we have a project, and that's, yes, that's map of the United States, and the people are all over the US. Um, a lot of these, there's an ExaWin project down there. Some of these, if you ask, what do, what do these all have in common? Underlying all of them, there's some sense of a hierarchical mesh. There may or may not be data on that mesh, but that is how we organize space, even if it's just particles. The other thing is we say every AMRX code is born GPU ready. So we don't make a CPU version and then say, oh my God, how do I put it on GPUs? The constructs, which Wei Chen's going to talk about, are basically GPU enabled, so that when you write the code once, it is CPU, it is GPU ready. Uh, but many of these have in common is there is field data on the meshes. A lot of them have particle data. Uh, adaptive mesh refinement is kind of our bread and butter so that you can have the, the discretization of space changing in time. And then additional things, which we will again allude to, are um, for complex geometries, we've embraced an embedded boundary or cut cell approach, which is great for some applications. It's not the right answer for others. Um, that's what it is. Um, we have our own geometric multigrid solvers, because if you can solve with geometric multigrid, it's a lot easier to call your own than to call another package, even though the packages are wonderful. Um, there are a bunch of other things. And Wei Chen, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, so I had already mentioned. So the uh, uh, the main thing we have is uh, LMX, you know, and this uh, mesh data. Can we get to it? No, uh, I see something on my screen that blocked. Okay, yeah, it's gone. Okay, so so basically, you know, most applications have mesh data of some kind of mesh data, and so we have those um, uh, data containers for storing those uh, mesh data, MPI processors. 
and uh, it's also on a like adaptive mesh, you know, hierarchy grid. And those mesh data can be like a cell-centered data, or face, or edge, or nodes, or different kind of things. Because, for example, like uh, in uh, ENM, you know, people like the stack the E grade because it can serve like divergence-free those things. You know. Which is a little louder. Hmm? A little louder. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so we also have uh, like tools for uh, parallel communication. So, you know, if we have the data stored in our own container, or if we need to do a go cell exchange, just say, you know, fill boundary, it will automatically do those go cell exchanges. And the, the mesh can be, you know, since it's adaptive mesh, for example, those, those, uh, it's, it's not trivial, for example, you know, the blue box, you have two boxes, how they connect to each other, in, especially in 3D, it can be a complicated thing, but we handle all those, you know, under the hood, so you just call that. And we also have like, a, for data copying from one layout to another. Let's see. Okay. So again, we, also, uh, we have particle data structures, and the particles are actually not like a first class data sense. It's very useful. And uh, so we support those common like uh, uh, particle stuff, like passive particles, charged particles, those kind of things, and the particle, uh, you know through the particle interactions, particle, particle interaction, those kind of stuff. And in the particle layout, we provide, give users the freedom to choose what kind of layout you want. You know, it can be like an array of structure, structural array, mixing of those things. And, uh, um, and also support some, provide functions for the, like a common things, like, a, you know, parallel communication of uh, sending particle from one processor to another, and we also have uh, like embedded boundary support. So we use a cut cell approach. And uh, if you look at this uh, uh, picture here, uh, that's uh, a, a chemical looping reactor from the Amphix uh, Excel project. So, uh, so it's kind of like a quite complex uh, uh, geometry. So we uh, provide those function that's common for like uh, uh, embedded boundary, you know, codes. Uh, let's see. And uh, we also have our own geometric <coughs> multigrade solver, and that they support um, like uh, different types of data, like cell-centered data, nodal data, and uh, uh, for solving equations like uh, you know variable coefficient Poisson's equation or Helmholtz equation, or the tensor solve in like uh, um, Livingstock's equations, and uh, uh, some of those solve support like EB, so and also support some. For example, this uh, uh, the over this picture is uh, like a overset uh, method. So that's actually uh, a feature requested by uh, the AML Wind project because they have this in the middle. You have a, a mesh. They they do the simulation with Nanlu wing, and then they have a, a like a big domain that solve problem uh, using uh, AML Wind, and so that's uh, uh, using AMX to solve this problem. But the uh, they have an overset mesh, you know, in the middle of the domain. And we can also call like a hyper or patsy. So sometimes the problem is actually too hard for geometric multigrid to, to be able to you know, handle it. So then we can call hyper or patsy to call their uh, algebraic multigrid. And that, uh, the so agglomeration or consolidation is basically, you know, at the multigrid, at the course multigrid level, there's not that much like work to do. So, so, so it's, it's beneficial that if you start with, say, a southern processor, you know, at the bottom, you might want to use like a, only one processor to solve your bottom problem because it's so small. And uh, so in addition to what uh, you have seen, uh, we support, you know, like I said, a dual grade approach, like particles can live on a different uh, grade than the fruit. And uh, um, we support MPI plus OpenMP and uh, uh, MPI plus like a CUDA, hip sickle stuff for GPU. Um, and uh, 
would also have function to support like load balancing. And uh, even though LMRX is like there's LMR in the name, but even if your application is, you know, not uh, using LMR algorithm, you can still use it because, you know, it also supports that. It doesn't have to be LMR. And we actually have a, a Fortune interface. So they are actually Fortune code using LMRX. And uh, recently we also have a Python uh, interface made by Excel, you know, with, uh, so uh, yeah, I think it could be really useful for machine learning kind of stuff, and uh, and it's also very user friendly. So they, you can you can write you know a script language start to oh I build me a multi dimensional array as distributed across multiple MPI processors. You know, um, we also have like a native async I/O, but we also support other kind of like format like now. Uh, 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 HDL5, CDF, or OpenPMD, that kind of thing. And uh, so, when like an AMX application, they call AMX functions, there are a lot of things happen under the hood. So, like, you know, we handle like memory allocation stuff, handle like kernel launching, sometimes we use the kernel to, you know, uh, reduce the launch latency and uh, uh, parallel communication and uh, a bunch of other uh, stuff. So I'm going to go five, five. And we have, um, there are like a common visualization packages like Vidit, YT, and AMRVIS is our own visualization package. So we can, uh, and we also support in situ visualization. And now I want to talk about the, how, how do we handle the performance portability thing. So we build our own like, uh, uh, portability layer based on vendors uh, C++ solutions, like it's, it's basically CUDA, HIP, and, uh, and the SQL. So we made that decision after exploring uh, you know, a number of those options and decided you know, that's the best thing to do because also one thing is uh, we have, you know, uh, like at the time, like say six ECP applications, we have to we have to act fast enough so that they can have something. And at that moment, some application, you know, also explore their own stuff, like, uh, you know, open ACC or CUDA Fortune. They actually, you know, for example, Castro already got to, uh, code to run with CUDA Fortune, uh, like uh, uh, Summit, Summit uh, Titan, I forgot what was exact at that time. But anyway, once we have the, so we build a, a C++ based solution quickly and the Castro convert to, and uh, C++. So, so there, yeah, so there are, there are a number of advantages. So I think the main thing is it's much more flexible for us. Um, so we have a lot of like common data containers, like 1D vector, multi-dimensional arrays on like a, you know, AMR grid that support distributed data. And, um, okay, I'm just going to go over this quickly. The one thing I want to mention is, is so if you start with a, a existing C++ code, you have those like a complex, like a, like a data, and you have those class, and you think about, oh, how do, how do I get this onto GPUs, all right? So, so, so eventually after exploring uh, some options, for example, initially we used like managed memory, things in manual memory so that once you are GPU automatically get those things, but those are actually slow and eventually figure out the best way to handle this is basically separate the data ownership and the data access. So then you have a simple data structure that contain your like a data, can, like metadata and the data pointers, then you just copy it onto GPU and everything works great. Okay, okay. so. So this is just a simple example, uh, like a, launching a parallel for some simple calculation. And one thing I want to emphasize is, in the beginning of the uh, MX and a lot of MX code, and a lot of Fortune code. So when we try to put it, we want to make it like, a, you can basically copy paste your Fortune code into C++ and it just works. So you can see this one line of code, that, that's just a Fortune code, right? So. There's no, uh, so we're trying to make the syntax uh, similar to Fortune. And we also um, provide things to do to fuse like a small kernel. And those are actually really important for MPI communications because we have like adaptive mesh 
and for like big adaptive mesh refinement simulations to packing and unpacking MPI buffers, if we do it in a simple way, we end up with like hundreds of small GPU kernels. And that's actually, we, we actually explored both this our own fusing option and the CUDA graph. It's actually faster than CUDA graph. And we also have some, uh, let's see, I probably should just skip this. I just want to show uh, one more important thing. I think it's here. We actually, uh, we provide our own uh, memory arena that, uh, so that you, the, the thing is the CUDA malloc or hip malloc, those things are actually quite expensive. So we actually just allocated a big chunk of memory, we keep it. And uh, so that to speed up the memory allocation a lot. And uh, so I probably should just stop here and- uh, You have a minute if you want to conclude. Okay, so, so um, we also provide like a common things like a reduction functions mm -hmm. and the reduction function we provide is actually quite flexible. So, you know, it's, for example, in this example, you, you, you do a reduction, two types of reductions. You do a, a stop and the max and on two different data types. So, and the user, and then also the input of the data is you can compute it on the fly, it doesn't matter. So you just, because you just provide a lambda function and lambda function, they could have, a, you know, 100 lines of code to, to compute what need to be, you know, provide for the input for the, for the reduction. And uh, yeah, so, and also you can have your own data type, like, uh, you know, here basically I have a pair of uh, uh, numbers. And so the max is only computed on the first number, but the second one tells me actually which element in the vector is the max. So it's kind of similar to C++ libraries, like max element, but the C++ libraries uh, that uh, API is return an iterator. That's not suitable for GPU. You, you, you return a pointer to some GPU memory, what do you want to do on the host, right? So, <clears throat> and we have other things like, anyway, so finally I want to, you know, want to thank ECP for the uh, uh, support and thank you. If, uh... Any questions in the room? Uh, have you tried does the AMRX compile with uh, MDC++ compiler, which is maybe a C++ library? Oh, um, uh, we use the MVC++. We actually have a, a CI job running, but we're not using it to compile for device code. Like, uh, and they, they made some breaking changes, so we have to handle those things. Like. Uh, you know, you can no longer have like a, like a underscore underscore CUDA arch, that's kind of micro. So they, they, they want you to use like a if, like a target. So, so basically, uh, the code provides some changes for you to actually compile it as device code. But we can use MVC++ as like a host compiler for MVCC. Uh, okay, there's a Zoom question, it seems, before I come to Jack. Okay. You can, you can uh, say loudly. For domain decomposition, AMRX is doing the composition for each level separately. Will this cause an issue with increased communication because it can't be guaranteed that the communication happens locally? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question. The the issue is um, um, so so sometimes it's act, it's really you may have so suppose you only have two levels at the cost level, say basically cover this whole room, and then you find level mesh is only this like a podium this so so it's really hard when you talk about oh you want the locality say so the fine level data it's kind of easy you know when you copy from fine to to cause you don't need to you know it's all like a local communication but if in this case it's really hard to do because uh, you you will end up with like suppose this is like a one course MPI you know one MPI process for the course box and then your fine level all have to stay in that same process for it to be able to have that kind of locality. So it's so sometimes it's, a, it's really hard. For special cases, you can do that. Like for, you know, WorkX, we have some special optimization for the, they call the like PML thing. We, yeah, so it will depend on, in, in general, that's a hard problem because the fine mesh may be really non-local compared to the coarse mesh. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, so I have a question about like the maintenance of the three different kind of GPU branches. So in particular, like going forward, when somebody wants to add like a new feature to AMRX, do you have policies that like enforce that they have to write it for all three GPU implementations, for example? And, like how do you guarantee that they don't like it would like somebody like me comes in and half asses one of them makes one of them good. And <laughs> so <laughs> we don't let you do that. <laughs> so the good thing is, uh, so we have our own uh, like performance portability layer. So if you're writing using that layer, and you don't have the issue. So a normal contributor should never have to touch that layer. Right. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. The normal contributor, you know, you write some parallel four function or parallel reduce function, those kind of things, they are all portable, so you don't have to. Worry about it, but if you start say, oh, thread idx dot x, you know, is equal to three, I do something, then you, you start to have to worry about it. Yeah, but otherwise, but those things, you, no matter what you write, you write in cocos. If you start say thread idx, the code is not going to be fun. Right. Okay. Uh, maybe one last question. Yeah. I'm just curious, how much better is the performance of the MRX kernel fusion why do you think it's better? Oh, I've got exactly how much. Uh, it's like a, uh, maybe 20, 30%. Oh. The, the thing is that the, the CUDA, the uh, graph that Fusion is saying, they still launch multiple kernels. It's just, and also you have a one-time cost to build. That's actually very significant. And the thing is, uh, um, we have like a dynamic uh, like a memory allocation for those arrays. So, so the, the kernel parameters are actually different. So the thing is that, you know, the kernel graph, you want to reuse it, all the parameters have to be same, same, right? So what we end up have to do is, we actually have to add extra layer of indirection. So we have a stable pointer, and those pointers can point to our in norm. So that even those norm points might change, so the, the kernel graph approach could still work, but you know, some extra, you know, cost to, to be able to achieve that. Okay. Um, thank you, Vijin and Anne. <laughs> now we have a short break, and since we are running already a bit late, maybe I'll say five minutes uh, <laughs> to grab some nice coffee uh, quickly, and then we'll reconvene in five minutes. We have some snacks remaining too from the lunch. Um, and I'll request the speaker in the, for the next sessions, so all we will just uh, come to us and just make sure we have everything in order. Thank you. Okay. Okay.
Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, so, previous sessions we have uh, heard about like impressive hardware and uh, and applications that use that hardware to do very impressive science. So, um, in this session, we'll cover uh, some of the programming and performance models, and uh, we'll start with Dian Lundin from University of Wisconsin at Medicine. So, let's hear from him. Thanks for attending this talk. I'm a fourth year PhD student at the University of Wisconsin Madison. So in this talk, I'm gonna talk about our recent two research projects, CUDA Flow and Taro. They are test graph based programming system for CPU, GPU, heterogeneous computing. Here's the agenda. We have two parts. The first part is CUDA Flow. We'll start off the motivation behind the CUDA Flow. Then we will present the CUDA Flow C++ programming model. The second part is Taro. We'll talk about the motivation behind Taro and dive into Taro's C++ programming model. And finally, we will present the real use case of Taro and give the conclusion. Right. CUDA Flow. CUDA was first introduced in 2007, and that is 15 years ago. Things have changed a lot with more demands on GPUs. Applications have become more and more complex. Here, I'm showing you a test graph of GPU accelerated circuit simulation workload. The test graph models a GPU operation in the node and a dependency between GPU operations in an edge. The GPU test graph can be very large, as you can see in this example where we simulate a NVIDIA design. It has more than 100 kernels and dependencies, and it requires 500 seconds to finish. Additionally, we need to repetitively execute this GPU test graph for each clock cycle, and there can be millions of cycles. To solve this problem, to solve this challenge, CUDA introduced a new execution model, CUDA graph. CUDA graph allows you to specify a complex GPU workload directly in the test graph, rather than aggregated streams and event insertions. And you can directly offload the entire test graph to GPU using just one CPU code. Also, when launching the CUDA graph, the CUDA runtime will perform automatically, automatic scheduling optimization. Compared to stream based execution, CUDA graph removes quite a amount of stream launch overhead, and the result can boost the performance of many iterative GPU algorithms. However, implementing a CUDA graph is complicated. Consider a test graph of only seven GPU tasks. The resulting CUDA graph code can have up to 100 lines of code. You need to specify all the parameter details, Mac CUDA point, uh, pitch pointer, CUDA graph node create, CUDA graph node destroy, and many more. On the other hand, CUDA flow interface is in fact very expressive and requires little understand about CUDA graph. Um, the corresponding code with CUDA flow has only 10 lines of code. More importantly, our C++ interface hides the implementation details and can extend to other GPU programming models when they can begin to support uh, GPU test graph parallelism, such as SQL or OpenCL. Uh, so here, let's take a look at the Hollow World 6P example using CUDA flow. Here, I have a written 6P kernel, and the GPU test graph has five tasks. Two memory copy tasks that copy S and Y to GPU, and we have one kernel task that launches a 6P kernel. And we also have two memory copy tasks that copy S and Y back to CPU. In terms of CUDA flow, there are only eight lines of code. You create a CUDA flow that manage the dependency graph. And you create four copy nodes to copy data between CPU and GPU. And then create a kernel task to compute the SP function. And finally, you define a dependency using succeed and precede to define a, a edge. And then you offload the CUDA flow to launch 
the CUDA graph. The second reason of using CUDA4 is that we have our own graph transformation algorithm. If you use CUDA string to create a CUDA graph, you need to manually manage all these events and strings. CUDA4 manage all these strings for you, so you don't need to. We have our transformation algorithm to automatically manage all these CUDA streams for you. Some of you may know the test for project developed by our research group. Test for is a heterogeneous test graph programming system that allows you to express your parallel algorithm using test graph model. We have integrated CUDA4 into test for. Um, the key idea here is that uh, you can create a CUDA4 task and glue it with other CPU tasks to build a heterogeneous test graph. They can take the most of heterogeneous parallelism. And that's CUDA flow. Now the second part is Taro. After build CUDA flow and integrate to test flow, the result is great. We're able to build CUDA growth within test flow. However, we found a challenge. To further improve performance, as you can imagine, most applications start to support or start to utilize a heterogeneous set of operations, such as CPU, GPU, or uh, custom accelerated operations. And that's what we call heterogeneous test graph. For example, we have this test graph. And in test B, we have some uh, CPU operation, BC, and we have GPU operation, BG. So in this test B, we have some CPU code, and we also have some GPU code. When a CPU set executes this task, it will execute CPU code and then offload GPU code to GPU. The problem is the CPU set will block until the GPU finish this GPU code. Because actually, most existing test graph programming systems assume a timing execution per task. The CPU set needs to wait until GPU code inside this task is finished. And that's really bad. Here's the runtime example. The X axis is runtime. As soon as we have one CPU and we have one GPU, so we will execute test A first, and then we execute BC, and then BG. After finishing BG, we will execute C and D. Most existing TGPS do this, and you can see there's uh, idle time between BC and C which is totally unnecessary. What we want is like this. We executing test A and BC, BG. And after offloading BG, we can sort of multitask to test C and then D. So we can overlap test C and BG to reduce the runtime to achieve the best result. So how can we solve this challenge? Turns out C++ coroutine is the solution. So let me brief talk about what is C++ coroutine. A coroutine is a function that can suspend itself and resume by the coder. A typical function we all know is actually a subset of coroutine. So say we have a function, what we do is that code the whole function, and we execute the function, and at the end, we go back to the coder. On the other hand, if we have coroutine, what we do is like code coroutine, and coroutine will execute some code and then suspend itself. Return back to the coder, and then coder, after a while, can resume the coroutine, and so on and so forth. A coroutine is a function that can suspend itself and resume by the coder. So, why coroutine? Well, by using C++ coroutine, we are able to enable multitasking within the task within a test graph. And that's the powerfulness of using C++ coroutine. So if we can enable multitasking, we can suspend test BG after offload it to GPU, and then multitask to test C to over C and BG to reduce the runtime. However, C++ coroutine is challenging because um, it is very flexible. 
to define a coroutine, a single coroutine, you need to define a coroutine function, you need to define a coroutine class, and inside this coroutine class, you need to define promise type, define a weather ball. Um, also, you need to understand a weather suspend, understand promise awaitable, the difference, and then you, know, you need to know the compiler's view. Of course, you need to implement a scheduler, and that's just too complicated <laughs> as users. So, can we have a heterogeneous TGPS using C++ coroutine? And this TGPS should allow users to enable multitasking within the test graph while abstract, abstracting away all the low-level details, all the low-level C++ coroutine details. And that's where Taro comes into play. So I'm going to dive into Taro's program model. But before diving into the model, we need to understand asynchronous and synchronous mechanism. It's like when you are boiling the water, when you are heating the water, how do you know whether the water is boiling? Well, there are two mechanisms. The first one is synchronous. It's like you just wait. You just stay in the kitchen and wait until the water is boiling. The second one is asynchronous. What you can do is, for example, you go to a kitchen and check whether the water is boiling. If not, you go back and then do your own things. And then after a while, you go to the kitchen again and check the status of the water. You keep pulling the status of the water. Another method is called callback. Um, it's like you pay extra money to buy a water kettle. When the water is boiling, it will notify you. So this asynchronous mechanism is where we can enable multitasking to reduce the runtime. Right, so here I'm gonna use Taro to define this test graph that consists of different synchronous and asynchronous mechanisms. Here we have test B, it is a callback task, and we have test C, it is a polling task. Test A and D are wait tasks. And these two tasks is where we want to enable multitasking using C++ coroutine. Right, so first, what we're gonna do is to include these two files, taro.hpp and cuda.hpp. It's a header-only library. And here you specify, declare um, taro, specify how many CPU threads you want to use, and declare cuda, specify how many cuda string you want to use. Okay, now I'm gonna create our very first own task. Here you create task by using in place just like test flow's interface. And then you use cuda.wait because it is a wait task. And the wait function tests a lambda, C++ lambda, as an argument. Inside lambda, you can offload whatever GPU kernels you want. So here the lambda offers a stream for you to offload GPU kernels. Our CUDA scheduler will handle streams for you. And this is the kernel you want to offload. And this way is not multitasking, meaning that the CPU server needs to wait until offloaded GPU kernels finish. Okay, and here as B, it is a callback task. So I want to use coroutine to enable multitasking. And inside this task, I have some CPU work to do. After that, I want to offload some GPU kernels. All you need to do is to just replace wait to suspend callback and you can offload whatever GPU kernels you want inside this lambda. After CPU start offload all the GPU kernels, it will suspend this coroutine and then multitask. So here is the wrong example. When you offload a GPU a BG, it's like you offload kernel B1 and kernel B2. You can suspend the coroutine and then multitask to other available tests, for example, test C. So you don't need to synchronize on this task. Test C, uh, again, it is a polling task. We use coroutine. All you need to do is to use uh, request name from suspend callback to suspend polling. Again, after CPU thread offload GPU kernels, it can multitask to another task if there is any. And then test D, it is a wait task. 
So I use wait function and then a CPU so I need to wait until this offloaded kernel finished. Finally, I use precede to define the dependencies of this test graph and schedule it, wait until the, all the tasks in this test graph finished. And that's Taro's program model. Inside Taro, we have an efficient coding aware or stealing scheduling algorithm to support our program model. This is a, a scheduling example for this test graph. Um, it's a bit complicated, but you don't need to worry about it. Write code, Taro will handle others for you. All you need to do is to write 14 lines of code to express this test graph. So here are some experimental results on the circuit simulation workload. We compare Taro with a state-of-art RTO simulator. Uh, we compare Taro with RTO flows test graph scheduler. And the test, uh, the figure here shows the test graph of the circuit simulation workload. Here, the test graph consists of multiple parallel lines. And each task consists of two CPU operations and two GPU operations, depend on each other. So because RTO4 scheduler does not support multitasking, the CPU thread needs to wait until, say, this GPU operation finish. Okay. So here we show the achieved speed up by Taro over RTO flow at different test graph sizes on two benchmarks on two circuits. The X axis is a graph size, and the Y axis is a speed up. When the graph size is very small, like here and here, RTO flow is faster due to limited parallelism available. Because there's almost no chance to multitask. However, as the test graph become larger, where parallelism become more abundant, Taro start to outperform RTO flow because Taro is able to multitask to other jobs. In such case, Taro achieves 1.7 times speed up over, Taro, uh, over RTO flow. All right, conclusion. Here we have presented motivation behind CUDA flow and Taro. We also presented CUDA flow and Taro's C++ programming model. Finally, we show the performance of Taro. For the future work, um, we want to extend to different accelerators or say different programming languages like uh, OpenCL or SQL. And also we are working on async IO. And that's all I have today. Thanks for listening. Excellent. That's really cool. Um, I wouldn't lose it, but Stan, how does this work together with like the second BI as a CPU call that you want to draw? Because usually that's what I want to know when I'm writing computing for implementation. Okay, so the question is how do I support MBI? Okay, so the question is how do I support MBI? Okay, um, so one sort of philosophy of Taro is that uh, extendability. Uh, here, actually we separate Taro with CUDA. So in the future, I can very easily to extend to other uh, Korean ground models, like just writing npi.hvp, and you just call, say, taro.npi underscore scheduler. Yeah, so. So if our say our workload are all on GPUs and CPUs are not doing uh, not much work uh, because GPUs are way powerful than CPU. In this case, does the Taro program models help with that? Uh, the answer is no, because uh, the whole point of using coroutine is to overlap CPU tests and GPU tests. If your CPU test is very lightweight, there's no benefit. I mean, how, uh, how much time you need to compile this Taro? Uh, Taro only comes in with like 300 lines of code, so it's roughly within one minute. Yeah.
Uh, your, can you repeat your question? So you mean like the scheduling? Scheduling uh, is non-deterministic because we use what's needed. Sometimes the software will steal other work, other workers' work. So it's not non-deterministic. Yeah. Anchor speaker. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Gregor Days. Uh, from LSU. Uh, yeah. Let's take it. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Gregor Dais. Uh, I'm actually a PhD student from Germany and I'm currently spending a semester at LSU. And today I would like to talk about our astrophysics code of the Tiger and its performance on Perlmutter. So, to start with, of course, what is OctoTiger? Tiger is a code to simulate binary star systems and stellar mergers. So we previously used it to simulate like double white dwarf mergers or uh, study the contact binary V1309. Of course, all of this takes a lot of computational power. So uh, previously we ran it on computers like Cori, Pittstain, Summer. Currently we are targeting uh, both Perlmutter and So beyond the astrophysical properties of OctoTiger, um, it's actually an interesting benchmark. For once, we are not using MPI, at least not directly. Instead, OctoTiger is completely built on HBX, which is a distributed task-based runtime system. So you won't see any MPI code directly in the uh, user code. Secondly, I've recently ported OctoTiger to Cocos. Like it started its life as a completely CPU-only code, so I ported part and part and part of it. Uh, to GPU with Cocos, and now we have like all major compute kernels ported to Cocos and can use it on GPUs. Um, also, it's, there exists like a HBX Cocos integration, which allows us to treat um, Cocos kernels as tasks. So it like neatly integrates in the HBX task graph, uh, which is kind of similar to what we just heard. So we basically launch a kernel and the CPU thread isn't blocked when we wait on the results. Instead, we can interleave everything. So, and us as usual with these uh, adaptive mesh refinement codes, we have like uh, lots of small tree nodes. We have like millions of fine grained compute kernels that they use time step. So it makes for quite an interesting benchmark whether like this paradigm really works with HBX. And that's basically the topic of the talk. So we will start off with like OctoTiger in a nutshell, just a short explanation of what's in here. So, we have like our adaptive data structure. I have sketched that here on the right. So you can see like, okay, we have a usual OC tree. The OC tree has like uh, subgrids in each tree node for like efficiency. We usually use like eight by eight by eight subgrids. So 512 cells per uh, tree node. And the subgrids are basically the unit that we distribute onto the compute nodes. So like we uh, distribute the entire tree that way and each compute node has like multiple subgrids available. Uh, we have interleaved solver, so we have like a gravity solver, we have a hydrodynamic solver, since we model the stars basically as the self-gravitating astrophysical fluid. And uh, this comes with a lot of performance challenges, actually. So the tree traversals during the solver iterations are like a primary one. So basically, when we have the tree, uh, tree traversals during the fast multiple method, for example, it's easy to just run out of work because at a certain point we need to, for example, execute some work here in the uh, root tree node, and that's obviously a bottleneck. So really our parallel efficiency depends on how well we can overlay that kind of work with the rest of the work available to hide that. And of course, um, other issues are like the small workloads per compute kernel, but each compute kernel is working on one subgrid at a time and we just launch them in parallel. But for example, on a GPU, as you can imagine, like 512 uh, cells is not a lot of work to uh, actually saturate the GPU at all. So we have to do something here. And lastly, of course, performance portability, always uh, of interest. So we actually want to address that uh, with existing frameworks as best we can. So as mentioned, OctoTiger is built on HBX, which helps us a lot during the tree traversals. 
So HPX is a distributed task-based runtime system. That means like task-based, so we just use futures uh, chained together to build a task graph like sketched here. So we can start a task with HPX async. We can then add a continuation with dot then, or for example here with when all, if we have multiple conditions. Uh, the whole runtime uh, has like a thread pool of worker threads. So that means we can like easily suspend one HPX task and uh, the worker thread won't be blocked. Instead, it will just work on another task. So that's also using coroutines under the hood. And distributor means we have like a unified C++ syntax for both local and remote operations. So for example, if I do a tree traversal, I don't actually need to worry whether a child uh, subgrid is on the same compute node or not. Instead, I just call the function and HPX will send the function call to the correct node. So this is actually kind of nice. And for that, we use uh, active global address space. And there are multiple communication backends available as well. So for example, we have a TCP backend, we have an MPI backend, and there's like a new LCI backend. And yes, basically, we have then a task graph that can span multiple compute nodes as like sketched here on the right. Then we also use Cocos. I think Cocos doesn't really need much of an introduction around here. So we have our multiple execution spaces. We have multiple memory spaces to target different devices. Uh, what is notable is the HPX Cocos integration I mentioned. So there are actually two integrations. There is a HPX execution space within Cocos. That means we can launch a Cocos kernel and it will use the HPX worker threads for execution. Basically, uh, internally, it will just be split into multiple small HPX tasks. So this is nice for CPU execution. And for GPU execution, what is really um, important for us is like the HPX futures for asynchronous uh, calls. So this is basically uh, what I sketched here. So we can treat HPX kernel, uh, Cocos kernels as HPX tasks. So we launch the kernel completely asynchronously. We have a HPX future for it. And at the point where we need the results of the kernels, we can just call future.get. And that will suspend the current HPX task if the kernel isn't done yet. But as I said, that doesn't block the CPU thread. The CPU thread can, for example, just launch different uh, Cocos kernels for other subgrids. So this helps us to uh, have like lots of parallel kernels in flight. And this can really help performance, especially with the small uh, workload we have per GPU kernel. So I have sketched the entire execution model that we used here. So basically, if we start here on the left, we have our HPX application, OctaTiger in that case. We launch a Cocos kernel from like an arbitrary uh, HPX worker thread. And we, use the, we do that with an HPX Cocos executor. And there are already multiple um, optimizations in this layer. So we also want to avoid any kind of device malloc calls. So I think a previous call, uh, talk also mentioned that like CUDA malloc is extremely expensive. So we want to, want to do that on the fly. So we have like a buffer pool allocator, which is just an allocator we plop into a Cocos and say, okay, if there's like a previous buffer from like a previous time step in OctoTiger, just reuse that one. Don't allocate a new one. And in turn, if the buffer is done with, uh, it goes back into that buffer pool. So it's like an on-demand buffer memory that keeps on growing until you have enough of the uh, buffers to basically keep all kernels in flight that the system can handle. And as we also have like dynamic kernel fusion in the same layer here, which basically means we have a special executor. And if multiple tasks hit the same executor, they can actually aggregate their kernel together. So we launch it as one large GPU kernel instead of, for example, eight small ones. There are multiple launch conditions for this to um, avoid deadlocks. Most importantly, we only um, start the uh, kernel fusion if the underlying GPU stream is currently busy. So that means we couldn't launch it currently anyway. So if the GPU stream is already busy, for example, with a smaller kernel, and eight threads are simultaneously trying to launch the same kernel for different subgrids, we just plug them together and launch them as one kernel. So this actually really helps uh, with performance. And of course, we also have like an executor pool because we don't want to create the executors um, on the fly because they're similar to CUDA malloc, it's rather expensive. And then it's just basically normal uh, Cocos, so we have multiple execution spaces. We usually, for Perlmutter, of course, use the CUDA execution space. And on the last level here, SIMD types, because our Cocos kernels, uh, we use uh, explicit SIMD vectorization. That means on the CPU, we can instantiate that at compile time with the appropriate SIMD types. And of course, for the GPU, we just use scalar types. 
So basically, octotyper is that all kernels have been ported to exactly that scheme. And basically, now we want to have a look at the performance um, in, uh, with Perlmutter. So for that, I basically want to test the current snapshot of octotyper, that's version 0 0.10. And I want to primarily test the node level performance first of the new Hydro compute kernels, that, because that was the last module I ported. And I want to test the scalability with like all recent HPX and Octotiger changes. And for that, I use different benchmark problem sizes. So I have one benchmark, uh, which is actually just the Hydro solver. And I scale like, a small version of that from like one core to multiple uh, complete Perlmutter nodes and see how that scales. And I have a few larger scenarios that use uh, both the uh, Hydro and the gravity solver to really try to hit uh, the bottlenecks, for example, in the fast multiple method. The hardware I use is, of course, primarily Perlmutter, but when I wanted to collect the node level results, uh, there was currently maintenance going on, so I used a similar machine at LSU, but it also has like a Sen3 uh, processor and uh, it had the A100, so it's similar. The scenario, that's the set of blast wave, and for uh, Hydrobrush Gravity, I'm using the rotated, uh, rotating star. And uh, the performance metric I'm primarily interested in is the uh, runtime per time step. Because if we run a production run of Octotiger, we of course have like tens of thousands of time steps. But the nice thing is I can do like uh, scaling runs at just a few time steps, see how much runtime I need and get like a gist of how the actual production runs would do in the similar setup. So first I want to have a look at the um, uh, node level so this is uh, basically a scenario with 4,000 subgrids. And here in gray you can see the CPU run, down here the GPU run in orange. On the y-axis you can see the runtime per time steps in logarithmic scale. So basically a single core would need like, uh, oh, sorry, would need like 90 seconds per time step. And if I look at the GPU version, 16 cores with one A100, I'm looking at about 1.8 seconds. So I specifically only scaled to 16 cores and one A100 because uh, on Perlmutter, I in the end use like four processes per compute node, and that's exactly the setup I would get there. So overall, the porting of our uh, Hydro server gave us like a roughly five times speed up here at when using the 16 cores. And it's worth keeping in mind that this is like a GPU accelerated um, version, not GPU resident. So basically all the data still lives on the CPU and I put it on the GPU for the uh, actual calculation and the results get communicated back. I mostly did that because I ported Octotiger like uh, part after part after part. So this way I had like multiple uh, stable versions where uh, users already had some benefits. So. Let's see how that same scenario does on Perlmutter. So here we now start in the first uh, data point uh, at the 16 cores with one A100. And exactly the same scenario. So we are still at roughly uh, 1.8 seconds. And we can see it scales up here to the full node uh, rather well. So we are at about, what is this? Yeah, 83% parallel efficiency compared to just using one process if you use like all four. And in the end, we can see like it actually also quite nicely scales to two nodes, but later on we see the parallel efficiency is taking a bit of a nose dive here. We get down to like 47 milliseconds per time step, but of course there's not enough work. I mean, this was just a single core scenario really. For that we get surprisingly far. Uh, if we continue on, I basically have the same scenario here just with more subgrids, so it's like more uh, better refined. So this time we have like eight times as many subgrids. And here in the first data point, we actually start at the full node. So we have 64 cores and four A100s. And then we can see like the parallel efficiency is a lot better at uh, the 256 A100s, which is the point where we sort of uh, um, stopped executing for the first test. So let's see here, if we can even continue on and we are at roughly 42% parallel efficiency when using 512 uh, GPUs. And honestly, this is still a lot smaller than uh, any production scenario would, we would use. And of course, this is still Hydro only. So next up, I actually want to have a look at the Hydro plus gravity scenarios. So now we are seeing the rotating star scenario, also still at 32,000 subgrids. Also starting here at one node, you can see 
yes, the parallel efficiency is slightly worse than when we're using just the height resolver, but that's mostly because with the fast multiple method for the gravity solver, there's a lot more like bottlenecks to hit during the tree traversals. That being said, we are able to scale uh, rather well up to like 256 here. So we are still roughly at 50% parallel efficiency, which is usually the point where I otherwise stop. Uh, to get like more fuel water production scenario would look like this is uh, if we get up to like a quarter million subgrids. This is usually what we would roughly use. And here I basically couldn't fit it into one Perlmutter node, so I basically started off with eight of them. And yeah, at that point, if we can we scale up to 256 uh, Perlmutter nodes, so basically a thousand GPUs, and are still like over 60% parallel efficiency uh, with respect to the smallest amount of nodes I could fit the problem into. So overall, the whole um, HBX plus Cocos paradigm works really well here, like especially considering that we get down to rather low um, run times per time step. Right. And well, as a conclusion, so yes, the porting is complete. The GPU accelerated version of uh, like our Cocos kernels gives us already quite a nice uh, speed up on a single node. Uh, what is currently costing us a lot of performance is actually the data structure conversions between old and new parts of OctoTiger. So one problem I have, for example, is, uh, yes, I've ported the major compute kernels, but there's like tons of smaller methods that are still using the old data structure. So I have the issue where I'm basically taking data, putting data into Cocos, kernel, uh, uh, Cocos uh, views, still on the CPU before I even get to the GPU. So I have this data conversion going on on the CPU. And I have basically run the same scenario we have seen earlier uh, on an internal node at LSU with like two sockets and four A100s and just to get like more memory bandwidth and I could already see the speed up there. So basically the data structure conversions are hurting us quite a bit on the node level part here. But luckily that's a problem that will basically fix itself as I port more and more parts like even the smaller uh, methods to use the Cocos views because then the data structure conversions will uh, part after part like go away. Then other than that, we were able to like scale up to a thousand GPUs. I actually wanted to scale up to 2000, but I couldn't get the job done <laughs> before like this talk here. So now you only get like 1000. And yeah, the execution model I showed like with HPX, Cocos and CPP puddle for the dynamic work aggregation and buffer pools also works quite well. So in the future, we what we really want to do is we are looking into new production scenarios, like we recently had an astrophysics paper, so that one is now done, so now we are looking at what we will do next and are currently deciding on where will we hand in our like uh, allocation requests for the next production run. We also want to try out different HPX communication backend. I mentioned there are multiple ones. The runs I showed use the MPI communication backend, and I really want to test it with the LCI one as well. And of course, since we are using Cocos, it would be rather nice for to uh, run on the Intel and AMD GPUs. I tested it node level on an MI100, that worked fine, but uh, Intel GPUs, I haven't run anything yet. So that would be very interesting. And of course, work continues to get from CPU accelerator to GPU resident in the end. And that's it, I think. Thank you very much. Oh, I think that's lightweight communication interface. Like, that's not done by me. That's um, a, a team member of ours did like a HPX backend for uh, this communication paradigm. Like, I would need to look it up actually on GitHub. Like, I haven't really done any runs with it yet. Yeah, exactly. Like, for me, it's. Yeah, exactly. For me, it's basically just uh, I need to flip a switch during building of HPX saying, okay, don't use the MPI backend, use the LCI backend, and then let's see what happens. But yes, it's, it should be directly in LibFabric then. So for profiler support, um, 
luckily HBX has a few flags that profilers really work. So that is basically possible. Useful information, for example, from VTune and all that. So that's actually helpful. Uh, for debugging, debugging was mostly a nightmare for the dynamic kernel aggregation, like the GPU kernel fusion I showed. It's so easy to get like a racing condition in there. And since I basically wrote my own mechanism for that, um, that took me some time. Yes. Just to quickly clarify, I'm, I'm, I'm most familiar with um, the HBX packet in tokens. Yes. Uh, but is this a different um, HBX on top of Cocos um, inside of Octo Tiger, or am I missing the, the, the stack oh. diagram here? So the stack diagram is basically you have Cocos. Mm -hmm. Cocos with the execution space uh, uses HBX underneath, so it's still the same runtime though. And on top of it is HBX Cocos. So Mikhail Simberg developed that one, so it's the same. So Everywhere. Yes, exactly. Perfect. Like he called it once the HBX sandwich. It's cockers in the middle. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So I was going to ask a similar question. So is there, is there a like an official partnership here at, at like the at all levels of this HBX Cocos integration? So kinda yes. Like we work together a lot. I wouldn't exactly call it official really at that point. Like we use uh, HBX Cocos a lot. We use the HBX execution space a lot. Yeah. So I'm actually very thankful that was developed primarily at CSCS in Switzerland yeah. actually. So basically I uh, mostly worked on the uh, work aggregation, porting Octo Tiger to Cocos and so on. So for the backend work regarding HBX and Cocos, I didn't do that much actually. Like I was quite lucky here. So for next step we have Nan and she'll be talking about her message roofline model. Okay, so I'm Nan. I'm going to talk about the uh, our work of evaluating the performance of one-sided communications on CPU and GPUs. And but first, I want to take a few minutes to thank my wonderful collaborators, which is Mohammed sitting here, and then Taylor, who is uh, working at NERS, but now he's had to industry to make a fortune. And then <laughs> Sam Williams is my wonderful mentor when I was a postdoc here. So. Today, I'm going to first of all to talk about some benefits and challenges using one-sided MPI. And then I will talk about the message roofline model, which can help to provide a tight upper bound of communication performance of applications. And then I will show some results. First, let's see what is one-sided MPI. I'm sure you are familiar with two-sided. You go uh, do an MPI send, and then the receiver post MPI receive, or I send, I receive, wait all. But one said MPI aims to decouple this data movement with process synchronization. Usually this kind of communication uh, follows the PCAS model, which means the process can directly access the remote process memory. You can either read or write. So when you move data or when you write or read from the data from the remote process memory, you don't have to let the remote process actively in this message um, event. So you can directly write or read. So example is like you can do MPI put or MPI get. But let's think about how we usually do the do this communication on let's say here let's uh, make an uh, make an example on GPUs. You still let the CPU do the control flow, which means you will write a kernel that tell GPU say hey do this computation and then you come back to CPU. And then CPU do some kind of synchronization, then do the communication. Do the com uh, communication. So this actually increases the algorithm complexity and decreases the problem pr uh, productivity because you have to think separately. What I put on GPU, what I do on CPU, and then it also makes it hard to scale the dike like computations because it has a relatively uh, complex communication pattern. It's not like stencil, right? That is have a very simple communica communication pattern. You do every process doing computation and then have a straight barrier and do communication, do this iterative things. But that communications means 
point-to-point -point communication can happen between any two processes at any time. You don't have that control. So the GPU initiated communication, which is also one-sided communication, actually allow us to program like just like the traditional distribu uh, distributed memory CPU. You let the GPU take the control flow, which means you can write a giant CUDA kernel on CPU and tell G GPU, say, do those stuff. So you can do all the computation, do all the communication inside one giant CUDA kernel. Um, that just make that computation make scaling that computation on multiple GPUs feasible. And also, I have to mention, this GPU initiated communication preserved the possibility by using a common mem interface, which could be applied to CPU and GPU. Okay, and but you still have ch uh, some challenges to using one sided MPI, because let's recall when you do the communication using two sided MPI, uh, when the MPI receive returns, actually that buffer can be, you know your data is ready, you can use it, and that buffer can also be reusable. But in one side communication, we don't have that support, which means it's user's effort to manage your data placement and also do the remote process notification. Because in one side communication, remote process are not actively in messaging. So you have to figure out a way to let the remote process know the data is ready, you can use it now. So now, after you know what is one-sided communication, I think the main question is what is the achieved communication performance? Or say, my application now are using two-sided MPI. Does it worse to program to do the engineer again to change it to one-sided MPI, right? So I'm going to introduce this massive roof line model which can tell you whether it worse to do it. So let's think about when you want to characterize an communication performance, what we'll do. So I'm sure this figure you're all very familiar with. This is a log linear plot. The axis is the message size. The y axis is the bandwidth you can get. Actually, you will immediately find you cannot interpret small message performance because you got a flat constant latency there. And then you say, OK, I can you know, plot it in a different way. I can plot it in log log scale. And now actually interpret small message performance because you got a slope for bandwidth for small messages and which is good and in this case you it basically tells you you achieved communication bandwidth is a function of message size but what's the issue here is in this log log scale you have latency band for small messages and then as your message size grows bigger enough, you saturate the bandwidth. But in this case, this, this bandwidth gives you a very loose bond for applications because it's doing a flat send or put. But in real applications, you always do some kind of synchronizations which makes you far away from these ceilings. So that's why we introduced this message roofline. We propose a new matrix. It's called, I call it number of messages per synchronization. It basically tells you if you have one message per synchronization, which is the right line, right diagonal sitting here, actually you could be far away from what you just see from, let's say the OSU benchmark or IB right benchmark, whatever benchmark right, right now you, you, can, you can do because it's like, it send maybe a million message number of message per synchronization. So you have four, you've got slightly higher um, bandwidth, lower latency, because you can overlap more messages per synchronization. So by number of message per synchronization is in terms of algorithm level. So you can directly know from your application's algorithm. So let's see some real numbers. This is the communication performance that I use GPU initiated communication to do the messaging between two GPUs directly using NVHMAP uh, on the on same node. So here I'm using a put with signal and NVHMAP quiet to ensure the data transfer is completed at the receiver side. So you can see if you have one message per synchronization, you are in the black diagonal line. If you have a million message per synchronization, which is usually what benchmark tells you, you are in the right line. That's that's just like um that the difference is about one order of magnitude, that's, kind of, that's quite big. So this is for GPU. Similarly on GPU, we observe the same thing. So in this plot, all the right plots are for two-sided MPI and the blue dot are for one-sided MPI. So you can see the gap is even larger on CPU, but what I want to tell you is in this case, 
for two-sided MPI, I only have two operations, send and receive. But for one-sided MPI, I have two, uh, sorry, I have four MPI operations. I put the data and then I do a flush to keep the memory order and then I send the data, I send the signal again. But this signal is just to notify the receiver, the data is ready there. And then I do another MPI window flush to avoid a delayed signal. So you can see, even though MPI, one-sided MPI has four MPI operations, which is number of, op uh, number of operations double than two-sided, but it still can achieve a slightly better latency than, than two-sided MPI. So this result is basically tell us the CPU one-sided MPI can definitely have the potential to outperform the two-sided by supporting like put with signal and the receiver notification operations. I mean, that's mainly like we can push what we can push for the MPI vendors to do that. Um, so now let's see how this message model, message roofline model help us to know the application performance. So we, we evaluate this model three different benchmarks. One is the 2D stencil. In this stencil, uh, in this table, I basically uh, list all the characters of these um, and communication patterns of this workload. The 2D stencil, which we know is like a box, synchroniz box synchronization, and the P2P pair is very, is determined. I mean, once you you, you process the compensation is determined, and also message size is also determined. So uh, because it's 2D, uh, you, you, you have four messages per synchronization. And the second one is Bertrand Glossov, which is a Dyke asynchronization computation. Uh, we also need a a notify the receiver for the data completion. But in this part, the P2P pair is determined, but it can be varied. It's not always fixed. It means if I send a message to you, probably next time I will send message to others. There's no fixed uh, pair there. And the message number of message per synchronization is pretty low. It's only one message per synchronization. And for distributed memory hash table, it's a random async uh, benchmark. You don't have, because it's doing the atomic uh, random cert, so you don't have to re re notify the receiver. But the P2P pair is in uh, deepernistic because it's pretty random. It totally depends on the input. OK, so let's see. For this ray, benchmarks, you can actually achieve very different communication performance. So that's the three part is stencil. Um, because you have four message per synchronization, you can you achieve latency about 1.6 microsecond, but compared to, to the sparse trunk of saw, which in the gray region, because you only have one message per synchronization, the latency you got per message is four microsecond, which is like three times higher. And for the hash table, even though you do atomic, but you don't have any, I mean, extra synchronization, but you can achieve like a 0 0.8 microsecond per message. So you can see compared to the right line, right diagonal seating here, which is the, uh, usually what the benchmark tells us the peak network performance. These applications are kind of far away from the peak. So now let's see a showcase is the spark triangle solve, which is very latency dominate. So uh, I have to apologize why when I, I uh, turn this uh, point, point to PDF, I lost the animation here, but let me <laughs> walk you through this very complex uh, results figure. So first I want you to focus on this GPU part. So on the GPU part for this proper, uh, spark triangle solve, you can see it can scale very well on parameter GPU, but it cannot scale on summit GPU. The reason you can immediately, immediately know from this message roofline because GPU, you have four uh, microsecond latency, but some of you have higher, five microsecond. And then I want you to move to the CPU part. I still use parameter CPU as an example. The one-sided in general is like have a lower performance than two-sided. It's because you have a higher latency here. But maybe some of you maybe ask another question and say, hey, I see the GPU one's latency four microsecond is, is larger than the two-sided CPU ones. Why I still have a shorter runtime? So the shorter runtime could also be achieved by the parallelism, of, uh, achieved by the massive, uh, massive parallelism because it's spur triangle solve. You can have many, many ex parallelism explore there. Okay, so the conclusion is that we propose this message roofline using a new metrics, the number of message per synchronization to provide a tight 
upper bound of communication performance and help reason performance. And then uh, we also demonstrate the potential of one-sided MPI if put with signal and loose weight can be supported on CPUs. Questions? So is most of the benefit, most of the benefits coming in the latency dominated case? Um, no, no, you can still benefit by the uh, aggregated memory, uh, sorry, not aggregated network bandwidth. So which was means, for example, stencil, you can still get benefit from one sided. If you, you mentioned rock shaman in, in one of your slides, did you ever get that working? In, in over slingshot on a on an AMD system or or is all the work just with uh... um that's a very good question. We are working on it. <laughs> right. What uh, what ultimately limits the bandwidth as you add more messages per sync? Is that some property of the NIC that you can only have so many in flight? Uh, yeah because you always have that system limitation how much injection bandwidth you can get. Is that your well, question? Well, I mean, at, even at very small message sizes, if you went to basically, it seems like if you went to infinite messages per sync, you're still only getting about 10x the bandwidth. Um, oh, I think that's just the, 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 the latency you must have paid that uh, when you do the message. So if you think it, it's, it's something like the speed, you cannot be faster than speed of light. There's so some other yeah, so if you think it as a log GP model, your, a, a message can be, I mean, the time of a message can be divided in several parts, but there's always some processor occupant time. You cannot overlap. So you're hiding one latency, but there's yes. the next Yeah, there's a little bit, yes. I have a question regarding the last slide that you did. Yeah, so why does the, uh, I, I'm way too concerned about the last two uh, columns. Uh, why does the, the latency from four to five will impact the signal in two different systems? Uh, actually, it's because the spectrum itself is inherently latency bound. Um, because it's always, uh, it's very memory intensive. If you distribute this to multiple GPUs, it's gonna, it, it will dominate by the communication. And it's latency dominant, uh, latency bound. It's probably a good question, but isn't there like a maximum concentration limit on the network to your, so how is your message size broken down into packets? Or how does that affect the... Um, so actually this is, uh, after this is not, we're not considering that lower level. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I can, I can elaborate on this question. Uh, so in, uh, when you do MPHM messages, they're broken down in buffers of 16. So if you have a message size that is not a multiple of 16, you see much higher cost than you would for a 16. Any other questions? No. Then in that case, let's thanks speaker. We'll do a 10 minutes break here. Um, feel free to grab any snacks or, you know, uh, and we'll reconvene at 3.35. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. We have the vendor panel next. So, yeah. All right, next.
Okay, for our online audience, uh, I hope you can hear me and feel free to drop a message in the chat in case if you are having issues and we'll get we'll be getting started in just a minute for the next session. Yes, the day goes by, make it louder. <laughs> So, we're very excited to have this next session with our esteemed panel of representatives from industry vendors. Um, and what uh, the way we are arranged this is that first uh, we have three representatives, and first each of them will go by and uh, present their um, own version of uh, how they look at the roadmap for GPUs for around 15 minutes. Um, we won't do a Q&A during this portion. We'll reserve the questions for the actual panel discussion after that. So after the 15 minutes each uh, of presentation, we'll have uh, Brandon Cook, who is our Programming Environments Lead, uh, who will be moderating the vendor panel among the three representatives. First up, we have Scott Helverson from NVIDIA. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Scott Halverson. I'm at NVIDIA. I just want to like mention some context for me. So I've uh, been at NVIDIA for about a year and a half, but I spent uh, 10 years at Los Alamos National Laboratory. I've been in part of the DOE. I think I understand your guys' um, problems at a, at a pretty large scale, and so hopefully you know, I can lend some credence to that. Um, uh, anyway, so my talk today is on NVIDIA's accelerated ecosystem, accelerated computing ecosystem. Um, so my motivation here is to you know, tell you a little bit about you know, what we're considering as the, the context for, for GPUs or, or accelerated computing more generally. And so accelerating, accelerated computing is, is kind of, uh, you know, it has a, a lot of different contexts to it, right? Um, it, uh, it's not just you know, the hardware um, that, that we use to accelerate codes. Um, it's the software stack around it. It's the tools that we use to ensure that we're doing the right, um, that we're getting the best performance out of the hardware that we have. Um, it's a, the mechanism by which we can scale that out to, uh, to larger and larger compute uh, resources. And so you know, what I'm showing you here is um, you know, kind of the, the set of topics that I want to talk about. Got um, you know seamless acceleration. This is you know mostly on the hardware side within a GPU. Um, scaling up, what does it look like to run uh, run these systems at, at many GPUs or uh, you know many nodes of GPUs? Um, I also want to talk about uh, what we're doing in the context of domain specific science uh, libraries, um, uh, mechanisms for you to to leverage the GPUs. Um, with the expertise that we've we've already baked into some of our libraries, um, and then I want to talk more about um, you know our compilers, uh, a broader ecosystem, and I'll briefly touch on uh, AI augmentation. All right, so oh, sorry, um, so I really want to focus on compilers because you know, I think that's where. A lot of us are going to spend our time um, working on uh, accelerated computing, right? So, um, and more broadly, I want to talk about the programming environment. Um, we really want to, to enable you guys to be uh, productive in the environment that you're comfortable in programming in. So, the spectrum of environments that we are targeting for you is constantly expanding. Um, so, we started off with CUDA. Many of you worked. In CUDA, um, you realize you know that um, you know CUDA can be a little bit painful to, um, to get good performance in. Um, you know if it's if it's a application critical, you know people will do it. Um, but what we're trying to do is expand the scope of how you get to, how you get to an accelerator, um, and so um, we're we've expanded the scope of things that we are. Um, we've extended uh, to different languages. We've extended to different parallelism mechanisms. 
And so I just want to talk briefly about the ecosystem that we provide here. Um, so languages and programming models, you know, we're heavily invested in C++, Fortran, Python. Um, that enables a broad spectrum of additional languages, additional capabilities for you to leverage. Um, in addition to that, within a language like Fortran or C++, uh, we're, we've, we broadly support OpenACC, OpenMP, um, and if you really want to be, you know, on the bleeding edge, if you want to take advantage of our GPUs uh, to the fullest extent possible, use the newest features that we provide. We obviously still have uh, CUDA for C++, Fortran, use it from Python, um, and this all builds upon an ecosystem that we've been developing for the last 15 years. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say about this is that the one of the main thrusts that uh, NVIDIA is targeted is to be able or enable you to run this wherever you want. So you can run it on your desktop. You can run it on your on a, a beefy workstation. You can do it on Perlmutter. You can do it on the cloud. You can do it on the edge. All of this works with the same code base. Um, and so uh, you can leverage this wherever you're coming from. Um, so a little bit more on programming models. So the, the approach that NVIDIA is trying to take, um, and I think we've done a pretty effective job of this, is to uh, create a spectrum where you can jump into uh, programming for GPUs. Um, on the far left, you have you know, uh, enhanced programmer productivity. You just call a library. Uh, on the far right, you have you're developing your algorithm in CUDA, um, and there's options in between as well, standard languages. Um, we've got quite a bit of work uh, on that that I'll touch on in a second, compiler directives. And I think one of the, the core themes of this slide that I want to convey is that you don't have to just choose one. You can compose these with our compilers. You can compose our compilers, MVCC, MVC++, MV Fortran. Um, you can compose the uh, acceleration model um, within that space. So you can use libraries and you can use CUDA. You can use libraries and you can use uh, standard language parallelism, uh, you can use OpenMP, OpenACC, you can put all of these together and we put a lot of effort into making sure that that is possible uh, so that you can spend the time where you need it and use an easier method when you don't. Um, so, so next slide is just to show, you know, from the, from the language perspectives, you know, the three that I've called out is you know where we have our main thrusts um, i want to show you, you know, what this actually looks like so um, we're working heavily to make uh, iso c++ parallelism um, a viable option and uh, we're there mvc++ is, is uh, a compiler that can use this today um, uh, in terms of fortran you know i there's some conversation earlier today about you know the the, the future of fortran i i want to point out that we're very much supporting Fortran. Um, we're committing quite a bit of effort to uh, uh, flying on the LLVM front. Um, we have our own uh, Fortran compiler that uh, you know, supports CUDA Fortran. Um, so as far as we're concerned, Fortran's not dead. Um, we're, we're going full ahead with Fortran, um, and we want to support users who uh, want to program there. Um, we also you know, support uh, Python uh, pretty heavily. So we've, uh, I'm showing here something that we call Kunameric. I can touch a little bit on that uh, more, but um, this is meant to be a, a set of um, Python libraries that are drop in replacements for standard, effectively standard um, Python libraries um, that allow us to scale. Uh, so Kunameric, in this case, I'm showing off a case where we're treating it as a drop in replacement for NumPy. Um, so this allows you to, you know, you can program um, your CUDA applic or sorry, your uh, Python application in NumPy, uh, and once you've got something that you like, you replace it can be a single character change uh, um, to uh, to do this. Actually, single line change is what I meant um, to uh, to use <laughs> um, Kunameric. Uh, in some cases, and what that'll allow you to do, so you can now execute your code on GPU, but it also scales, right? So we can use this to distribute. This is built on top of something called Legion um, that uh, um, that we're pretty fond of, uh, open source project that allows us to, you know, distribute. Uh, it's a task-based parallelism uh, framework um, 
that'll allow you to uh, to distribute tasks. And Kunumeric is built on top of that. So you you can write your NumPy code, um, replace this one line of code, and scale it to you know Perlmutter, for example. Um, so C++ is obviously something that we focus quite a bit on. Um, yeah, so um, you know we've we've been working with uh, with accelerating C++ for quite a while. Um, you know C++ 17 support uh, has been in our compiler for for a number of years. Uh, we support C++ 20 now, and that, those were kind of the start of you know where we got parallelism within the standard. Um, but we've worked closely to enable new capabilities uh, in the in the future of C++. So we work closely with the Cocos team uh, to to put together a reference implementation of MDSpan. Uh, that is now part of the standard. Um, we're working on range-based uh, parallel algorithms, extended floating point types, and uh, you know, longer term, we're talking uh, about some pretty interesting things, senders and receivers. I, I don't know if that's actually been ratified or not yet, but uh, um, we have an implementation in MVC++ that uses that. That's actually really cool. So we have a, an example implementation of senders and receivers that also uses Legion. So you effectively have a standard-based mechanism of distributing your task um, with one framework uh, across multiple GPUs and multiple nodes. Um, the, we have examples of this online uh, that are, I think, pretty impressive. Um, so I want to talk briefly about where we're going. So I'm, I'm thinking that this is likely where a lot of the conversation later will spur, um, but I want to talk uh, about a few things. So unified addressing. So we have an architecture that is just now released called Grace Hopper. Um, and the, the idea behind this is that it's a, a CPU and a GPU that are interconnected and share an address space. That means that we can program, um, we can access memories from either space. Um, so I can access CPU memory from GPU, I can access GPU memory from CPU, uh, and it's a, through a high speed interconnect um, that's cache coherent. Um, that enables you to do some pretty neat things, and I'm happy to talk about that later, um, but uh, uh, the idea is that, you know, it fundamentally changes the programming model for GPUs. We no longer need to do CUDA malloc necessary, necessarily. Um, and, uh, and we can get some pretty interesting uh, performance characteristics as a result of that. Um, along the same lines, we've been working uh, uh, with, uh, to develop um, capabilities in the Linux kernel to expose the same capability, uh, but for existing GPUs, for um, PCIe interconnected GPUs, for example. This is through heterogeneous memory model, HMM, um, and this is now officially supported in CUDA 12.2. Uh, you need a fairly recent Linux kernel to support this, but um, you know it, it means that you have the same programming model that you would have on Grace Hopper um, on any NVIDIA GPU, as long as your software supports it. Um, you know we heard a little bit about MVSHMEM earlier, so I won't touch too much on that. Um, but the comms from GPU, I think, is really important for us as well. This is something that we're we realize for a lot of applications is a source of bottlenecks. Um, so if we can do comms from GPU, um, as mentioned earlier, we can do uh, one large kernel. Uh, uh, I don't have to break out of my kernel to go do communications. I can do it from the GPU. So we have that in MVSHMEM, but one of the things that we're working on uh, is a proposal in MPI to implement this. Uh, we have a working example of this um, uh, on our hardware, uh, but we're trying to ratify it as part of the standard. And then I'll just mention um, some uh, scalable libraries that we're working on. So uh, our goal is to not just enable you to use one GPU effectively, but to use an entire system of GPUs effectively. So we've got several libraries, QFFT MP, QSolver MP, QBLAS MP, that implement common interfaces but are distributed across many nodes. Um, I also want to mention HPCX, which is you know, our modifications to OpenMP. OpenMPI, sorry, um, to enable GPU communications. Um, and I talked briefly about Kunumeric, so I won't uh, languish on that. Um, so this is our uh, HPC SDK, and uh, I won't talk uh, much about 
um, you know, this entire set. I do want to call a couple things that we're working on, though. So I mentioned the Grace Hopper architecture. Um, so Grace is a, 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 it's our first CPU design for HPC. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that we're targeting there is a set of libraries that work well on that CPU as well. So I want to call out MVPL, NVIDIA Performance Library. This is something that we're in alpha stages right now. Um, we have customers testing it out, but the idea is that it's a, a set of uh, common performance libraries targeted towards our Grace CPU. Um, so you get things like uh, BLOSS implementation, for example. Um, that's coming soon, and uh, I think by the time um, most entities that have Grace hoppers coming will have them, um, that will be at least in beta release for the public. Um, and then with the last minute or so, I want to talk about uh, what we're doing in the context of AI. Uh, so we've got you know, a lot going on. I, I think you know, probably uh, a lot of people uh, associate NVIDIA and AI, so I don't want to languish on this too much, but I do want to call it uh, a couple things that are interesting for this community. So um, Modulus, uh, this is our AI framework for physics-informed neural networks. Uh, I think actually there's a training next week here uh, that involves Modulus, and I just want to uh, uh, shout out for that, that uh, this is something that I think um, may be really interesting, um, and some examples of using it. So uh, down at the bottom here, I have a, a simulation from ForecastNet. Um, this is comparing a real simulation to an AI simulation um, 96 hours into the future. They look nearly identical. Um, this is a, the point of this is to show that you know we can do something uh, from a physics standpoint. Uh, Tau toolkit, um, you know, uh, image classification uh, identification. Um, and lastly, Holoscan. Uh, Holoscan is not so much AI focused as it is meant to be a framework for developing um, real time pipelines for data processing. Uh, AI could be a component of this, but it's not a necessary component. Uh, so it's a, you know, mechanisms for building a pipeline of processing data on a GPU. Finally, I just think this is cool. This is something that Bill Daly um, recently shared. Um, this is why GPUs are so phenomenal, or at least part of the story. Um, this is, you know, just showing the, the evolution of our GPUs, in particular for AI inference. Admittedly, for HPC communities, this is not necessarily, you know, the, the bread and butter of what you care about. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of performance that are coming from GPUs, especially when you get into low precision. Um, I won't uh, touch too much on this. You'll be able to view these slides later at some point. But um, this is just showing that, you know, over 10 years, we've gotten a thousand X improvement on inference on GPUs. Um, so I'll leave it there uh, and uh, take questions when we're done, I guess. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. So next we have Michael Rowan from EMD. Okay, so while Michael is uh, starting, I'll just encourage all of you to think of the questions uh, to ask during the vendor panel, and also the online audience to actively uh, encourage them to send their questions via the, via the Q&A feature. Brandon has promised that he won't let the speakers go without uh, getting satisfactory answers, but yeah, but uh, do, do make sure to send in your questions. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, I, my name is Michael Rowan. Um, I want to say it was a, a postdoc at Berkeley Lab a couple of years ago, and I was on the uh, organizing panel for uh, GPUs for Science. So it's really totally a privilege to be back here to um, you know, be, be giving this talk. Um, and, and, and obviously, thank you to the organizers a bunch of work. Um, so the uh, what we're going to talk about is a little bit of a roadmap uh, from the AMD perspective about um, some of the data center GPU offerings and um, what um, how the sort of are, are run on these. Systems that, that are using these GPUs. So, 
this is, this is what I sort of consider a software and hardware co-design for Exascale scientific computing. Um, yeah, this is a quick outline. Um, we'll sort of start what the current state of the art is, again, AMD perspective. Um, for, so MI250X is the current, um, this is the GPU that's used in Frontier. Um, and you know, Frontier, of course, being the um, first HPC system to reach like 1.1 exaflops um, in November 2022. Um, we'll talk a little bit um, you know, supported frameworks and then you know, applications that are actually like running on say Frontier or um, similar sort of leadership class uh, computing facilities. Um, and then we'll take a little, little look in the future. Um, what are the uh, AMD GPU that's coming uh, after MI250X, the successor, this MI300A. Um, the supercomputer that, we're, that we'll be employing the MI300A, this is El Capitan um, at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and this is where my uh, work has been focused, um, so I can say a little bit more about that later. Um, and, you know, uh, we'll look at like one application that's particularly interesting, um, plan to be run on El Capitan, um, called IceCap. So, just jumping into this, um, this we're starting with uh, this nice picture of, uh, on the left, and then do note this is actual, actually a picture of an MI250X. This is not a um, artist uh, depiction. I think it's nice to just look what does the actual hardware look like. Um, you know, there are these two um, sort of rectangles with this pinkish outline. And each one of these is uh, what's called a GCD, so graphics compute die. Um, from the application perspective, this is what, what um, you know, this means you have like two ranks that, that you could run for a single MI250X GPU. Um, this is where the compute units live. You see these um, squares, uh, these, yeah, these gray squares that are scattered around the, uh, the GCDs. There are, um, these are the HBM, the high, high bandwidth memory uh, banks, and, and in total you have 128 gigabytes um, you know, of, of uh, HBM that are shared uh, between these two GCDs. Um, there are a lot of transistors, you know, it's a mind-boggling number, and um, you know, one focus of the MI250X has been to uh, improve the, the capability of the sort of math operations that are needed in um, a lot of AI applications. So uh, this is uh, what the, the matrix cores are meant to enable. Um, and to you know, have, have at this point a little bit more, um, you, know, you can see uh, uh, certain design choices that were made with the MI250 axis compared to the MI100. Um, and, and the rows that I would point out here are the last two. Um, you can see there's like a factor of two increase in the, the matrix core. Um, computational throughputs um, comparing MI250X to MI100, um, you know, for brain, brain float 16 data format and integer eight um, you know, uh, data format, the uh, matrix operations um, were, you know, improved by like factor of two. So um, yeah, there's certainly been a focus on MI250X you know, and in some ways MI300 uh, you know, is pushing more in this direction. Um, I, th I think any uh, discussion of exascale science um, um, needs to you know, include the uh, frontier supercomputer. Um, this, of course, reached an historic uh, 1.1 exaflops um, you know, result on the HPL benchmark in November 2022. Um, and there's several other um, you know, AMD systems that are shown with the top 500 um, list. So you have Lumi in Finland and the, the Genki system as well. So, um, yeah, so these systems, I would say they're all in their um, early stage of their life cycle. So kind of we, we have to see how um, these are used to you know, achieve you know, scientific results. So it's, I'd say that's a really exciting time from that perspective. Um, you know, these applications rely on uh, kind of deep, deep software sets. Um, on, on AMD GPUs, we're supporting, uh, you know, fully supporting OpenMP. Um, we have, you know, sort of the equivalent to those of you familiar with, with uh, CUDA, CUDA software. Um, HIP is sort of the, the equivalent to uh, NVIDIA's CUDA. Um, and it, it said that if you know how to program CUDA, you know how to program, program HIP. Um, so, you know, if you want to, there are plenty, plenty of uh, porting tools that will allow you to um, you know, take CUDA code and, and say, like, convert this to something you could run on AMD GPUs. Um, and lastly, um, the support for a lot of these machine learning frameworks has been uh, improving, especially after the, the last few years. Um, I'd say, uh, you know, so you can point out TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, JAX, these are a few that are supported. Um, and, and from my own experience, uh, just trying to, you know, just, just run PyTorch on like a, a desktop GPU, um, uh, you know, desktop AMD GPU. Um, I was surprised that it actually just kind of worked out of the box and it wasn't too difficult now. So you can actually go to the PyTorch website and you know, look for your specific specific version of Rockham and um, find some, you know, bunch of compatible versions to download everything and, and it should work out of the box. So um, that, that's much improved um, within the last couple of years as opposed to prior to that. Um, now I want to do point out a few applications that I think are interesting. Um, these are um, applications that are being worked on by groups at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, doing kind of early work on Frontier. And uh, so this, this one is called Mosaic Challenge. Um, this is 
uh, meant to. It's a, sort of like a, a, a large language model project that is looking at um, pathology reports in cancer cancer research and then trying to classify type of cancer based on like a pathology report. Um, so, you know, this is pretty interesting. Um, there are interesting computational constraints here about um, I think some of the transformer models require like very large memory and you know, so they're looking at um, various memory optimizations, maybe like using, you know, bird, bird models with um, sparse attention to maybe like decrease the memory requirements and you know, increase what they could you know, fit on a, a single um, within single GPU memory. Um, and anyway, so this, this is a one interesting project um, so from uh, this is from John Gunley at uh, Oak Ridge. Um, I want to point out a, another sort of AI HPC project. Um, this is uh, trying to un understand um, which mutations are allowed in, in going from one molecule to a different molecule. Um, and this is thought of in, in uh, sort of a, a sequence model. Um, so if you understand like which which mutations are sort of allowed to go from step to step, you could you know transition from one molecule, say like this one over on the left, all, all the way to the right. Um, so th this is another interesting um, project. It's uh, to be in sort of early stages. Um, so that's that's a little bit of a statement about um, what, we, what we can call current state of the art. So the MI two fifty X you know frontier at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, and then we can look a little bit in the future about um, the, the successor to the MI250X. Uh, That's what we will say here. Um, there's not a whole lot I, I can say about this because it's sort of right around the corner and you have to be a little bit um, careful. Um, but uh, this is the list of approved things that I can say about MI300A. Uh, MI uh, it, it is an APU. Um, so what does that mean? I mean, this, this is a little bit uh, similar to what um, Scott was saying about the having this unified address space that's enabled at the hardware level. Um, and this, this enables a lot of really um, exciting possibilities um, from sort of the performance perspective and also from the, uh, you know, the software um, perspective, like the way you, you're going to write your, uh, your HIP code or your CUDA code. Um, so this, I would also say the APU is not necessarily like a new um, idea. I think it's been around for you know, actually like decades and it's used in systems um, to have like a hardware enabled unified address space between CPU and GPU. Um, but I think this, it's novel to start using this in data center um, GPUs and see how this can be used for uh, exascale science. Um, so it's, it's um, pretty exciting. Um, another uh, feature of the MI300A um, where you know, AMD has seen success in using this sort of chiplet design on the, the CPU side and now it's kind of applying the same idea to um, you know, the, the GPU side. Um, so that, that you know, provides a number of um, advantages for sort of from like the manufacturing cost of, of, of producing these chiplet designs. Um, you know, it's harder, obviously, to make like very large sort of wafers. Um, so you, you start stacking them on top of each other to kind of like increase the yields. Um, so th this is um, sort of like a little bit of motivation about using this, this chiplet design. Um, and the APU is also, it's designed to um, you know, have good, good like power savings. And we all know like electricity is very uh, expensive, especially in California. Uh, it's, you know, it's in uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory um, you know, this is, uh, you know, in California, so they want to um, you know, the, the more efficient you can be with uh, your usage of electricity, the, the better. Um, uh, another point that I sort of alluded to earlier was this increased focus on um, sort of AI capabilities of MI300A. Um, so compared to MI250X, it's projected to have like a, you know, 8X um, you know, increase in AI training performance. Um, and this is, uh, well, you know, there will be more to say about this in kind of next uh, month, so I will sort of leave it at that. Um, but you know, one one thing I will kind of leave you to think about um, is is uh, how do, how is your you know HIP code or CUDA code going to change um, when you have like this unified memory address space? You you know with, with this you don't have these uh, you know, memory transfers between the host memory space device space, so these things are going to sort of disappear. Um, and yeah, so there, there might be like slightly different uh, patterns that you're going to use. Um, yeah, so the computer where we'll see the usage of the MI three hundred A is uh, called El Capitan. Um, again, coming to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the near future. Um, this is, you know, where, where I'm working on site. So we're we're um, working very hard to make sure that all the you know, applications there are um, you know, staying staying in lost lockstep with the most recent versions of uh, Rockham that are coming out. And we're really trying to make sure that the uh, software is uh, you know, meeting all the needs of the applications. Um, this is projected to have more than two exaflops of performance. So that's uh, quite you know almost, almost factor. Yeah, this, thank you. Um, more than two exaflops. Um, two, two other interesting features of Al Capitan. It will have rabbit neural storage. Um, so you know, each, each 
cabin is going to have sort of a local memory that you, know, you can imagine some useful ways to use this. Um, and uh, lastly, it can be gray uh, slingshot interconnect. Um, yeah, so we've talked about MI300A. Um, it was a supercomputer where this would be used, Al Capitan. And now, um, the, what are all these things enabling? You know, at the end, you want to be able to use, do some kind of science and run applications on these systems. Um, one um, that is uh, you know, intense focus and should be able to stress the capabilities of El Capitan is a project called IceCap. Um, this is uh, connected to initial confinement experiments being done at uh, uh, the National Initiative Facility in Livermore. Um, so this, uh, you know, the NIF, basically the you know, type of experiments they, they run, they have like a laser and then they'll fire this at a target and then like, try to induce fusion and then like measure the, the yield that comes out of these experiments. Um, so um, they had a very successful shot in, uh, in 2021. Um, it's, it's indicated by this, this uh, very tall spike over on the, the far right of the plot. Um, you know, this is like 1.35 uh, megajoules, much larger than any of the you know, many shots they've, they've done before. Um, and the, the question with this is, you know, how, how could, could you have like a repeatable uh, test? Could you get this repeatably, reliably? Um, and so the idea is that they, they're going to try and throw a lot of compute at this. Um, and, like AI machine learning to, to get a better control over these parameters that, that could you know, produce good yields in these experiments. Um, so th this is a little bit, uh, again, a picture of the experiment. Um, you know, there are lasers, these sort of blue beams that go into um, it's a container you got by like the yellow walls. It's called a hull ROM. Um, and there's a target there. And so this radiation is, is sort of comes off the walls and then um, you know, will we'll interact with the target. Um, you know, fusion, fusion can take place. Um, you kind of measure the amount of uh, energy this output. Um, so th this is really meant to study, you know, so it's like a research the process of fusion, um, not necessarily, it's not imagined really that this is meant to be a, a fusion reactor, any, anything like that, it's, you know, it's, you can have each person build the biggest laser in the world and say like, you know, generate a little bit of fusion out of, out of uh, this, these very large facilities. Um, but and anyways, you can see from, from here that there are a lot of parameters to these experiments. There's, you know, say the uh, shape um, of the target, um, the shape of the HALRAM, any of the laser parameters, the you know, size of the beam, et, et cetera. Um, so it's like a very high dimensional um, space to explore when you're trying to imagine like what controls the yield there. And so this, uh, you know, purpose of the ISCAP project is to try and you know, understand what are the um, you know, parameters that are going to uh, improve the yield. And um, they're incorporating machine learning at a lot of different levels, a, a little bit in um, choosing which direction to vary parameters to um, sort of control which simulations are, are, are Launched and kind of exploring parts of the um, parameter space. Which the, the parameter space is kind of indicated in a cartoonish form, and the, this, this plot up, up at the top, you can see like a kind of black trajectory. And this is just, um, you know, in a cartoonish way, this is sort of like exploring the parameter space, finding some place that like you know, maximizes the yield. Um, but, you know, there's also uh, planned to be uh, some of the more expensive physics functions that are used within individual simulations might be able to be uh, replaced with. Uh, machine learning type of models um, to you know, reduce the amount of computation that's needed, um, performance of the, um, all the simulations that are run. Um, and this is uh, getting us uh, right to the end. Um, so I'll, I'll you know, end with this quick summary. Um, there are several uh, exascale machines that are, have just come online recently, including like Frontier, um, the um, flagship, and then uh, Lumi and Alcantara in the near future. Um, these are in very early stages. I think it's really exciting to see how these are going to be used for um, to get real interesting scientific results. Um, and you know, last one is I think ISCAP is a really interesting project. Um, this will you know, hopefully stress the capabilities of El Capitan. Uh, and I will stop there. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, very interesting in, indeed in terms of the upcoming chip design. Uh, Next, we have John Pennycook from Intel. And I'll again encourage the online audience to send in their questions. All right, so I'm going to be talking about future-proofing your science uh, with open standards. And, uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about Intel GPUs specifically, but I do want to touch on them briefly, um, specifically just to talk very quickly about Aurora. Um, 
So I've had the privilege of working with scientists at Argonne to tune their codes for Intel GPUs in preparation uh, of the delivery of Aurora. And I'm really proud of what we've achieved as part of the ECP and, and ESP projects. Um, if you want to see results from those efforts, then you should refer back to Jay Hook's presentation this morning. He had uh, several, uh, several updates from key applications. And I know that there will also be performance results shared at SC23 uh, very shortly and SC23 workshops as well. So keep an eye out for those. Okay, so what will I be talking about? Well, I want to take a, a brief look back at how uh, the architectural changes uh, that we've seen as we've moved to GPUs have actually affected the way that we program things, right? The software that we write and, uh, and the algorithms that we write. And lots of other people have touched on this uh, already today, Belent and Eric um, and others, but I think this is important enough to just go over it again very quickly. So, one sort of change that we've seen is this uh, this move to reduced precision. Okay, so on CPUs, a lot of codes traditionally were very happy with using FP64, and it wasn't until uh, some GPUs came along where there was like an order of magnitude difference between FP32 and FP64 that people really took a serious look at adopting some some reduced precision. And now we're starting to see similar things happen with FP16 and BF16 because of the introduction of these matrix accelerators that many GPUs have. Massive parallelism is kind of similar. So uh, there was parallelism existing on CPUs. Some people had tried to put some OpenMP into their applications, but usually had kind of bolted it onto some serial code, hadn't really rethought their algorithms. And it wasn't until there was actually some motivation to, uh, to really take advantage of a significant amount of additional parallelism, more cores, more threads, wider SIMD, that people sat down and really did the, uh, the redesign of the algorithms that they needed to do to leverage these systems properly. Uh, Eric mentioned this idea of free flops earlier today, and uh, what this graph sketch is supposed to show is just how, uh, how quickly uh, the gap between uh, flops and bytes has increased over time. Um, and this is just looking at FP32. So if you actually then start to factor in some of the matrix and tensor accelerators, you're looking at maybe another order of magnitude here. Um, so you get all of those additional flops, but you obviously don't get any additional bandwidth. So the FP32 line, is, uh, as steep as it is, it's kind of like a rosy picture. Um, and so some of the algorithmic changes that we're seeing here, uh, these are things like higher order methods, or just taking advantage of the fact that um, you have these free flops to compute some additional quantities that you didn't compute before. And then the thing that everybody wants to talk about is this uh, idea of using AI for science. Right, whether that is uh, using AI for a preconditioner or swapping out your solver for some AI model. Um, this is you know, a very hot topic. And what ties all of these things together for me is that uh, a lot of these changes were originally motivated by a single architecture, but really they, they do actually apply to multiple architectures, not just the one architecture um, where this initial uh, significant performance gain could be realized. Um, and so, we need to make sure that when these algorithmic changes are introduced, we don't accidentally lock those to one specific hardware architecture through the use of some proprietary programming model. Okay, so the vision that Intel laid out a couple of years ago with the introduction of this one API initiative was to uh, introduce this multi vendor and multi architecture ecosystem and to support that through an open source software stack that's one API in the middle here uh, that was built on industry standards. And really what we wanted to do was give developers the freedom to move their applications between different architectures, right? So to be able to run their, uh, their applications on whichever architecture happened to deliver the best performance. And I said this was our vision. Um, I would say if you look at the diagram here on the right hand side, this is actually something that we've more or less realized today. So one API is available. There are lots of uh, middleware and frameworks enabled through one API. We can target CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, and other accelerators. And because we're talking about GPUs specifically today, I've kind of drilled down there, you can see that we can actually support Intel GPUs, NVIDIA GPUs, and AMD GPUs all through this single software stack. Um, so if you want to do this with open source compilers, you can just go and grab the one API uh, DPC++ compiler. If you download the uh, compiler from Intel's website, then you need to go and get a plugin from the CodePlay website in order to enable the NVIDIA and AMD GPU support, but it is there. Okay, so um, going forward, you'll start to hear us talk about this UXL foundation, if you haven't already heard us talk about this, and this is kind of the, the next evolution of the One API uh, initiative. 
So what it is, it's something that was announced by the Linux Foundation um, very recently, so on September 19th. Um, and as I said, it's kind of like an evolution of the One API Foundation. So you can see there are a number of other companies involved in this. Um, and uh, so if you think of like Sickle, the programming language being something that the Kronos group defines, uh, the role of UXL is going to be to define uh, the broader uh, set of libraries and things like that that we need in order to develop a, an open ecosystem for accelerators. Um, so things like libraries for data, analy uh, data analytics, uh, libraries for deep neural nets, BLAST libraries, that kind of stuff. And that's all expected to come from UXL alongside uh, open source implementations of those libraries. Okay, so open standards are clearly portable, uh, but what about performance portability. So I'm not going to read all these quotes, but what I wanted to highlight was that um, if you look in the literature, then there are quite a few studies external to Intel that have reported success, uh, performance portable uh, codes being developed with um, standards like Sickle. And if this is something that you're interested in, performance portability, then I highly recommend you check out workshops like P3HPC, which will be running again at the C, um, and also workshops like iWockle and SickleCon. And we've also been doing our own internal studies with uh, benchmarks like Velocity Bench, and I'm going to talk about those over the next couple of slides. So what this slide is showing is uh, CUDA results compared to SICA results, so taking the same benchmarks written in the two languages and then running them on the same NVIDIA GPU. And as you can see, some of the bars are higher and some of the bars are lower, and I don't really want you to focus too much on how much everything is higher or lower. Um, really, the takeaway from this slide is that the numbers are, with one or two exceptions, comparable. So, Sickle is a high-performance programming language for NVIDIA GPUs. Um, and some people ask when I show stuff like this, like, why aren't the bars exactly the same? Right? Why is there some difference? Um, and this is because we're not just comparing languages here. We're also comparing compiler technology. So, the CUDA code here is compiled with MVCC, NVIDIA's proprietary CUDA compiler, whereas the Sickle code uh, is compiled with the open source Clang compiler and the community CUDA support that exists there. Okay, now this slide is basically showing the same thing, but now with an AMD GPU. So, again, some of the bars are higher, some of them are lower, uh, but with the same one or two exceptions, um, you can see that things are comparable. And so Sickle is a high performance language for AMD GPUs as well. Okay, so that's performance and portability. What are some of the other benefits of open standards and specifically for scientists? Well, the first one I think is programmer productivity. And this has been mentioned uh, earlier today as well. If you have one code base, then you only have to write your science once. Right? You don't have to write a CUDA version and a HIP version and a Sickle version and an OpenMP version. Um, you can just focus on getting the science right. You also have a single set of tools and a single language to teach people. And that helps with getting other people involved in your project, right? It's much easier to onboard people. Uh, and I think that can, that can be really very useful. Uh, from a reproducibility and collaboration perspective, the fact that your, work, uh, your code works across lots of different machines means lots of different scientists can use it, right? So they can try and reproduce your results on different types of machines. Uh, you can collaborate with people who are at different sites, who have different GPUs to you. You can even collaborate with people who don't have access to GPUs at all, right? And so this really does help to, uh, to kind of broaden uh, the, the number of people um, that you can work with uh, as part of your projects. Um, and because your code works everywhere, you can also uh, take advantage of this for rapid prototyping, right? So I think we've all been there waiting for some node in a queue to, to free up so that you can do a little bit of prototyping or a little bit of debugging. With open standards, uh, you can do that prototyping on something like a laptop or something like a local desktop uh, and then take it to uh, a production system uh, when you're ready to do those production runs. I've already mentioned debugging, but uh, to drill down into that a bit, um, because you have multiple implementations and multiple architectures uh, supported by this standard, it makes it much easier then for you to find out where the problem is in your code, right? Is it a problem with the implementation you're using? Is it a problem in your code? Have you made an assumption about different architectures? Right? Maybe your code only works on one architecture because you've assumed that all other architectures behave like that one. Right. Being able to run across multiple architectures helps you identify that. A nice additional benefit here is that because all of these standards are open, 
typically many of the implementations are also open source. And that means that you can then go, you can poke around inside of the implementation, right? Maybe you can find the problem if the problem is inside the implementation. You can help to pinpoint where the bug is when you report it to the vendor, um, or maybe even fix it yourself if, if that's something that you know how to do. Perhaps the most important one uh, is to protect your investment, right? So I think it was uh, Mark Taylor's talk earlier showing a timeline of porting one of the codes uh, from Fortran to Cocos. It's like a six or seven year timeline, right? So in order to just get things running on GPUs, we're already investing a significant amount of time and, and as a result, a significant amount of money in these codes. And I think it was Berlin who said that you know, we don't know what we're gonna be running on 10, 20 years from now, right? Although we're all talking about GPUs today. And so coding to an open standard is, is probably the best way, uh, the best chance you have of future-proofing your science, at least a bit, right? Um, because your code will then continue to run on any future system that implements that future standard. Um, and then finally, I wanna talk about the community and ecosystem aspects. Um, so I wanna highlight that when you're working with an open standard, it's not controlled by one vendor. But more importantly than that, it, it's not even just controlled by vendors, right? It's controlled by vendors and developers. Uh, and that's really important. And even if you don't realize it, your organization may already be a member of some of these standards organizations. So you may already be able to get involved uh, with actually shaping some of these standards that I'm talking about, things like Sickle. Okay, so in summary, um, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody here in the room, um, but using GPUs for science has had a really significant impact uh, on our software, the way we write software and the algorithms that we use. Um, but I really believe that developing with open standards is the best way to uh, maximize developer freedom, the ability to run everywhere. Uh, it's a good way to get high levels of performance across very diverse hardware architectures, so different types of GPUs, but also other types of architectures that aren't GPUs. Um, and then ultimately, it's, it's the best way to protect your investment in scientific software. But if you take one thing away from this talk, um, I want it to be that you can and should contribute to the ecosystem. Because although I work for a hardware vendor, you really shouldn't trust vendors to design programming models for you. Um, you know, we, we want to help you do your science, but we really need your input and feedback to make sure that we're building the right tools and designing the right programming languages uh, to make sure that you can write software the way that you want to. Okay, so I'm gonna end with some disclaimers. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, so I'm really, uh, really excited about the UXL. So uh, for the next session, I'll ask at least one of my co-organizers to help raise the chair. I'll ask one of them to stop the recording. So we are not recording the upcoming panel discussion, so the speakers can be a little bit more free in case they were not uh,